There's a lot of seats over here, guys. A lot of seats. And uh, please text your buddies. We're about to start.
All right, all right. I'm going to invite Basil up to the stage. He's got some important announcements. So, Basil. Hello. All right, this thing works. So for all those people that are not here and on the live stream, you guys are missing out on a lot of things that are going on at Cosmoverse. I guess everybody also had a really good time last night, but they're going to come in. Staking, it's the staking of the whole, you know, like the first half of the day is going to be staking. Everything that has to do about staking. We got all the different projects here. Um, the other thing is the one I want to talk about. Yesterday we got too excited when we got on stage where we didn't like know how to explain to everybody how the venue is. So I want everybody to know that we have workshops all day today. So we have workshops that will be in the main lobby upstairs. And then we also have a Juno Hacker Lounge for people to go downstairs, which is right next to these booths. And you go downstairs. And everybody who's a dev who wants to go and hack away and do whatever they want to do, um, don't hack into my wallet, please. But you can go down there. You can hack. If you want to do a presentation, there's an open mic. So anybody who has the balls, do it. Grab the mic. Share your projects. So get some feedback. Upstairs, we got the Persistence Networking Lounge. So go up there, get some brewed coffee. And then also, tomorrow, we have a Cosmoverse Awards. So we're going to give out awards to all of the best projects, I guess, best so, so forth that you guys are going to vote for. Um, so we're going to have the QR code on the live stream. We're going to have the QR codes around. So look for the banners that says Cosmoverse Awards. Have your people vote and enjoy. That's about it. Let's start the day. Okay, good morning again. So, do you guys know already how to say good morning in Spanish? Buenos dias. Buenos dias. So, buenos dias, everyone. Buenos dias, buenos dias. Ah, good, buenos dias. Okay, so we're going to start the day two, but before we want to know what happened last night, because there's a lot of empty where's chairs. All, where's everybody at? Yeah, like what happened? And what happened with you guys? You didn't go to the party, how was that? I mean, I went to the osmosis one and it was great. So thank you to osmosis and to Mars for that. And you went to? I went to the Flick Fest. That was freaking <laughs> lit. I mean, Cicela was out there dancing. It was, it was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah. Uh, before that, I did go to the uh, Quicksilver party, and that was nice. Nice little chill vibe. A lot of food. I, I was just like eating my, uh, my plate, and then after another and after another, I just kept getting fed. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> my gosh. No, like I miss those ones because the Osmosis one was a little bit far, but it seems that it was great. So welcome everyone and let's start this. So let's keep some energy and the timer then. Woo! <laughs> okay, so our first speaker is Joe Bowman, co-founder of Quicksilver. So please, Joe, the stage is yours. And buenos dias. Buenos dias, Medellin. That, that's the limit of my Spanish, that's all you're getting, I'm afraid. Um, I could have chosen a, a better photo, I think. Um, sorry, I've, I've skipped, skipped through it already. <clears throat> so, yeah, my name is Joe Bowman. I'm the co-founder of Quicksilver, the CEO of Ingenuity. And I wanted to come here today, and, and obviously thanks to the team for inviting me, um, to speak to you about liquid staking in the cosmos, um, and specifically some of the features that uh, liquid staking in the cosmos uh, brings to the fore that haven't necessarily uh, been needed to be considered previously. So, before we start, uh, what is liquid staking? I mean, this is a, a term that has been bandied around in the cosmos quite a lot recently. Uh, a year ago, it was something that wasn't really considered so much. Um, before, I think, Cosmoverse last year, it, was, it wasn't really spoken about much at all. 
And it's a liquid staking for those of you that don't know, which I suspect would be very few of you. And, and thank you for the guys that have turned up this morning and, and those that are nursing hangovers, uh, double thanks for that. Um, but liquid staking is essentially the ability for a user uh, who holds staking tokens, who's invested in a, a proof of stake network to be able to, in addition to staking, utilize the rest of their assets as well. So essentially what's at stake? So the, there's a, a concept called the staker's dilemma that I mentioned in a previous talk back in, in Prague earlier this year. And the staker's dilemma is the one of a staking to token holder has invested in, in the network and they have two choices. And presently they have to make this choice. They have to either choose to stake their staking token, earn their APR on their staking, no, earn their AP, their staking token rewards, um, and in doing so, they secure the network. So it's quite altruistic in its, in its nature. Um, and, but the, obviously, they, they don't, <clears throat> they're not able to otherwise use those tokens. They're, they're locked and they're staked, and they can't do anything with it. The, the second side to this decision uh, is that they can take their tokens off chain, they can take it to their favorite DEX or DeFi protocol, and they can earn their juicy DeFi uh, yields on those tokens. Uh, and those, those APRs, especially as the, the DeFi economy proliferates, uh, those APRs are uh, quite uh, exciting to users, they're quite high, and they're competing with each other, so they're only going to grow. Now, that obviously is, is a difficult decision for some people. Uh, some people will choose to carry on and, uh, and, and stake their tokens, and some people will choose to chase rewards. Um, the second problem that we face is one of capital efficiency. So staking by its very nature, is capital inefficient. You have your tokens locked up, and those tokens, um, by, by the nature of the protocol, those tokens can be slashed in the event of your validator misbehaving. The, the downside to this, of course, is that staking, uh, those staking tokens can be slashed, but only up to a maximum of 5% in most networks. So 95% of that capital is sat there, and it's not utilized. It's completely untouchable, it's locked up, and you can't use it. But liquid staking kind of solves this problem. Uh, liquid staking solves the problem of the staker's dilemma because you can both stake and you can take your, uh, your tokenized assets off-chain and use them in DeFi, use them in DEXs, use them in liquidity pools, whatever. Um, so you can earn your, your staking rewards and also your LP rewards, your DeFi rewards at the same time. And it also solves the problem of capital efficiency because um, you know, by virtue of the fact you can, you can utilize these tokens in addition to staking, you can unlock that 95% of capital that's uh, not at risk and not being utilized, um, and you can take those, uh, those tokens off chain and use them. Now, the upshot to this and kind of side effect of, of liquid staking is that the current bonded uh, ratio of Cosmos networks is around 60% on average. Um, You've got uh, about, about $5.3 billion of stake tokens across Cosmos networks currently. About $5 billion of that is, is, is locked and not usable. Now that gets unlocked by uh, liquid staking. But the, the, say the flip side of this is that um, liquid staking allows for the, the bonded ratio, which is currently around 60%, to actually converge on 100%. So by virtue of liquid staking protocols existing and being used, um, we're actually able to better secure the networks going forwards because we're able to essentially put more capital uh, staked on networks rather than being held liquid uh, waiting for users to use them in DeFi. So what do we want to achieve at Quicksilver? Well, Quicksilver obviously wants to satisfy these, these uh, problems that we mentioned previously, so high yields for stakers, that's uh, a given. Uh, increased liquidity for supporting the Cosmo De DeFi ecosystem, as we said, we can unlock up to $5 billion at today's conservative prices of capital that's currently locked and staked. And as a byproduct, we increase security for Cosmos chains. But actually, a quick step, we want to do this without compromising sovereignty. So what does this mean? What, what, what does comp compromising sovereignty mean? Well, in my mind, there are three facets to respecting this sovereignty. The first one is validator selection. So as a validator staking on a, oh, sorry, as a, a delegator staking on a Cosmos chain, uh, you can, staking natively, you can select any validator you want. Quicksilver validator selection works on the principle that the user must be equipped to make choices over validator selection. And everything else we do comes second to this principle. 
uh, is a, a strong belief of ours at Quicksilver that the, um, the protocol must not be opinionated around what users can and can't do. They shouldn't be opinionated around what validators should be selectable. Uh, and we should try and mirror, insofar as possible, um, the user's native choices on the Quicksilver chain. So this allows, you, allow, allows, this means allowing users to essentially choose any validator that they otherwise could choose natively. And there is one small caveat to this, that for reasons of whether it's security or for economic reasons, um, Quicksilver token holders are able to essentially deny or vote to deny validators, certain validators uh, access to be delegated to, but the default position should be that the protocol doesn't have an opinion. The second of these uh, concepts of respecting sovereignty is that the protocol should also not have an opinion and not dictate how this locked capital is distributed amongst the validators. So as it stands, we, you kind of have three different ways of, that this can go. <clears throat> Some protocols would choose to split stake equally across the validators that they've chosen. Uh, some protocols will choose to you know, weight certain validators differently to others. Um, and, and the way Quicksilver wants to handle it is delegators should be able to choose what portion of their capital gets delegated to which validators. So the way we do this at Quicksilver is what we call intent signaling. Intent signaling uh, is essentially allowing a user for any given chain to say I want to vote or I want my, my proportion of the voting power controlled by Quicksilver to go 50% to one validator, 20% to one validator, 30% to one validator. And uh, you, they're able to do this either explicitly by sending a uh, message signal intent transaction uh, or, it can, or alternatively it's done implicitly at the time of delegation. You select which validators and which proportions you want to delegate to. At the end of every epoch, these intents across the network are uh, weighted by the, validators, uh, the delegators' voting power, by the queue atoms they hold, um, whether that's on-chain or off-chain. And we use off-chain proofs to be able to uh, determine what atoms or what queue at assets are held off-chain. Um, and these weighted uh, intents are then aggregated. And we use that as the kind of the plan to dictate how we distribute future delegations, uh, or how we uh, distribute redelegations amongst the protocol. And the third and most important facet of uh, these respecting sovereignty argument is governance. So governance in Cosmos is the absolute backbone of the ecosystem. It's what sets Cosmos apart, I think, more than anything else from many of the other chains and, and, and ecosystems. So, and, and it does it really well, and, and I think the participation rates we see, especially on the chains like Juno and Osmosis, and the Cosmos Hub as well, to, to a certain degree, um, shows how highly regarded governance is amongst cosmonauts. Um, and, and cosmonauts you know, genu genuinely do use this facility to make the most of it. Now, it's critical that any liquid staking provider uh, doesn't, doesn't negate this governance process. It's, it's incredibly powerful in its design, um, and we need to be careful that uh, no steps are taken by, by staking providers that essentially counteracts the strength of this, or indeed subverts it. So governance by proxy was uh, coined by us in our white paper in February, and it's going to be one of the key features of Quicksilver. So why is it critical then that uh, users are able to vote with their queue assets. Well, in Cosmos, in Cosmos governance, when you choose not to vote, your validator assumes your voting power for that, for that proposal. And that situation is, is fine and dandy when you're able to choose that validator. Now, the problem comes, and it's, a, it's a twofold problem, but the problem comes when Firstly, you're not able to make that choice. Now, you, at the moment, you can choose to either vote or you can choose not to vote. And if you choose not to vote, you know that your, your validator will vote on your behalf. Um, and generally, you, know, you may have chosen that validator because of their voting record, because you know what they stand for, because you know what they believe in. If you choose not to vote, you're happy that your validator will vote on your behalf. However, if that choice is taken away from you, uh, you cannot vote through protocol to uh, to choose 
to vote or not to vote, then you de facto surrender that vote to the validator that your voting power is allocated to. Now, as we said in the previous slides, you may not have choice over who that validator is or what proportion of your voting power goes to that validator. So you, by, no, by onboarding to a protocol that doesn't support uh, proxying your governance rights to you via protocol, you essentially surrender your voting power to what may be a handful of already very disproportionate, uh, disproportionately powered validators who have a lot of power in this ecosystem. And that somewhat subverts, um, somewhat subverts the power of governance. So that for us is why governance by proxy is such a massively important feature of Quicksilver, and one that uh, will be on the, uh, well, on the mainnet very, very soon, one would hope, um, without giving anything away at all. <coughs> uh, and then the, the final point I wanted to speak to you about today is airdrops and liquid staking. It's one of the biggest questions we've been asked, or most frequent questions we're asked, um, currently is how does Quicksilver support airdrops on onboarded chains? So this can be broken down into two separate sections. We have standard airdrops, and standard airdrops, by, by which I mean no, uh, the airdrop drops uh, an airdrop of tokens into a user's account. Now, these are reasonably, trivi reasonably trivially handled by protocols, uh, and this isn't, this isn't a Quicksilver specific thing, this is liquid staking in general. But when there is no, no action to be taken by the user, um, now the distribution of those tokens to the, the main delegate account, um, that can be handled by the protocol reasonably easily. The problem comes when you come to what we call gamified airdrops. And gamified airdrops is, by which I mean airdrops like Osmosis and Stargaze and the ones that Quicksilver will undertake, um, whereby you have to complete some action, some task, some transaction to be able to unlock the tokens that you've been airdropped. Now, when it comes to this, each of the, each of the solutions, there is, there is no standard solution. Osmosis had their own module. Stargaze had their own module. We have our own module. I don't believe there is a standard one. Um, and therefore, for the protocol to support gamified airdrops, there would have to be some uh, form of a custom logic for every airdrop um, or a standardized solution. One of those two would, uh, would work. The, the simple solution to this, and, and the one that I believe will become the de facto standard, is that actually uh, zones wanting to perform airdrops, zones wanting to perform an airdrop to atom holders, for example, will not only consider atom holders, they will disregard the, the sort of delegate accounts from liquid staking protocols, and they will distribute tokens in addition to atom holders to Q atom holders, to ST atom holders, to state atom holders, that any of the liquid staking atom holder token holders will essentially be airdropped to in addition. I think this is the, the simplest and most elegant method of handling these gamified airdrops, and it's something that absolutely we will work with development teams to support um, their airdrops going forwards. <coughs> so, in a nutshell, and I appreciate I've raced through this super fast, um, but well, we've covered, covered today why liquid staking is important, and these are the three, um, the, the three facets of uh, the staker's dilemma. So do we stake or do we, uh, do we DeFi? Uh, why not both? <clears throat> and it's the, the, the problem of uh, capital efficiency. So how do we unlock that 95%, that $5 billion, uh, so that the, the DeFi ecosystem can have a, a massive deluge of liquidity? Um, we've covered why respecting sovereignty is important um, and how we go about it. So you know, we, we, liquid staking providers have a, an obligation to empower users um, and give them options, give them choice, and not take their choice away. And specifically around validator selection and voting distribution, how Quicksilver you know, uh, will allow users to delegate to any validator and not just a predefined subset um, defined by governance, defined by core dev teams, whoever. Um, and again, the voting power distribution with signaling intent, how, again, the user is given the absolute choice to determine where their voting power goes rather than um, have that option taken away from them. We've covered why liquid staking must facilitate true representation in governance. That is, the user should have, again, the, abs the absolute same options, rights, and power that they have uh, natively. 
and we've discussed how liquid staking protocols might uh, approach handling airdrops. So that is it uh, for my presentation. Thank you very much for um, having me and enjoy Cosmoverse. Enjoy Medellin. Well, buenos dias for the people that are arriving. Welcome. Uh, our next speaker is Yurun from Persistence. Welcome, Yurun. Is this loud? Okay, here we are. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Jeroen de Welter, and I'm responsible for ecosystem development at Persistence. Before I start talking about the liquid staking hub that we are building with Persistence, I want to give a huge shout out to the organizers of the Cosmoverse event. It's been an incredible event. Everyone is enjoying it massively. Come on, let's put our hands together for the Cosmoverse team. Nice. You know, believe it or not, but last year's Cosmoverse in Lisbon was actually my very first day with Persistence. It was my very first day in crypto, and I was overwhelmed. Who here is new in the industry? Can I see some hands? Who's new into the industry or into the Cosmos ecosystem? All right. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Yes? I must admit, I was super overwhelmed on my first day. First presentation I saw was Zaki, talking about the future of interchain composability. Then there was Sunny talking about superfluid staking. And then there was my colleague Abitesh talking about liquid staking. And I was like, what is all of this? I was so confused. Now, that was less than one year ago. So now, one year later, I'm standing here in front of you. And it feels like I'm talking to a group of friends. That's the power of the Cosmos ecosystem. And I'm incredibly grateful to be a part of it. So, if you're new to the Cosmos ecosystem, and you feel overwhelmed, don't be. It's all gonna be fine. 
the ecosystem is super welcoming and we're all here to help and contribute. Now, I bet you guys are here to learn more about persistence and pea stake. Maybe you want to learn some more about liquid staking. Maybe you want to hear the latest alpha on SDK Atom. Or maybe you're here for the drama and the liquid staking war. Now, I'll have to disappoint you because that's exactly what I'm not going to talk about today. If you want to listen about or you want to hear about these things, you can look it up, website, Twitter, YouTube interviews we've done, it's all there, or most of it at least. Today, I'm going to talk about something completely different. It's something we haven't talked about before. It's what makes us different at Persistence. It's what motivates us. It's what drives us. It's what wakes us up in the morning and what keeps us awake at night. I'll bring you the story of humility, integrity, patience, and persistence. Do you know what all big successful companies in the world have in common? There's three things. They're very good at three things. Firstly, community. Second, technology. And third, execution. Think about it. Any big successful company in the world is good at these three things. Community, technology, and execution. Think about Apple without community. Think about Tesla or Google without technology. Think about Amazon without execution. These companies wouldn't be there where they are today if it wasn't for this. They know that if you build a team that knows community, technology, and execution, you can do everything you want. And that's exactly what we've been doing at Persistence. We've been building a team, 35 people strong now, spread across the world, different in locations, all building towards understanding these three things. And we do it with, one, with four core values in mind. Humility, integrity, patience, and persistence. I say humility because sometimes we fail, often we fail, but it's never the goal, but we love to fail actually. We love to fail because it makes us learn. We learn from these things because we improve. We can build a stronger community. We can build better technology and we can get more flawless at execution. I say integrity because sometimes we make the wrong decisions, but we own up to them and we promise to do better and we fulfill on those promises. I say patience because we are in this for the long run. The long run, because that's what matters. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the power of compound interest. And it's the exact same thing when it comes to building an ecosystem. Small, small things we do today can have a huge impact down the line. And lastly, persistence, because that's what we do. We wake up in the morning, we go to work, day in, day out. We build, we ship, we iterate with persistence keeping in mind that we're working towards three things, community, technology, and execution. Now, have we figured it all out yet? No, of course not. But we've learned a lot. We've come a long way. On the technology side, we're very grateful to be early in proof of stake and in the Cosmos ecosystem. With our validator and research arm, Audit1, we, we were one of the Genesis validators of the Cosmos Hub, and we learned a lot. We also participated in plenty of test nets, and we helped to launch a couple of chains. On the community side, we launched Cosmos India. We hosted plenty of events. We've shared our knowledge, and we contributed to user education. But we wanted more. We wanted to bring real-world assets on chain, which is why we launched the Persistence Chain, to facilitate that. Now, this wasn't all smooth sailings, no. We ran into a lot of difficulties, and we actually even ended up pivoting. But we've learned so much. One of the main important learnings that we got was the stake drop campaign. As far as I know, it was the first airdrop targeted to stakers. We learned a lot from that, and 
We build a community of stakers along the way. Stakers who are now at the center of the persistence ecosystem. It's one of the reasons persistence has one of the highest staking ratios in the industry, standing about 80%, because we built a community of people who know staking. Another learning we had is that those stakers, they were looking for more yield, who wouldn't? And that's how we thought of liquid staking, to make sure that you could stake your assets and get additional yield from using them in DeFi. That's how the idea of liquid staking came to us, and we knew we wanted to build something in that. But at that time, there was no IBC. There was no DEX. There was no DeFi in the Cosmos ecosystem. But we are persistent, so no problem. We did bring a solution, and instead, because there was no DeFi on the Cosmos, we brought liquid staking to an ecosystem where, where DeFi already existed. Ethereum. And you can say one of your core values is persistence, so why didn't you wait? Why didn't you wait until these DeFi things were there? It's because we don't want to use patience as an excuse not to try, not to experiment with things. We want to keep on trying and learning because that's how we progress. So with persistence we continued and we built liquid staking on Ethereum with a bridge and it worked. We brought interchain liquid staking about a year ago, but we faced a lot of critique for doing so. People said it was too expensive. People said it was too complicated. People said it was insecure. And with a lot of humility, we accepted those critiques and we worked towards solutions. We provided by economy gasless, so you could trade gasless on Ethereum for free. It was complicated, but we spent hours and hours, days, on user education, guiding them through the complicated processes we created. And on the security side, we made sure things were secure. We had multiple audits, because that's something we'll never compromise on. With that, we managed to build up up to 40 million in TVL. We brought more than 6,000 users into liquid staking for the first time. And we didn't get hacked. Now, don't want to dwell too much on the past, but we learned so much from this. We learned how to build TVL. We learned how to attract users. We learned about security. We even learned how to integrate. At peak times, we were integrated with one of the bigger protocols in the space at that time, Anchor and Terra. But there again, we faced some, some um, issues, some adversity. But we learned from it, and we continued. Now, don't want to dwell on the past too much, and let's look at the future. Now that so many chains have IBC enabled, with all the beautiful things that are coming out of the Cosmos Hub, such as interchain accounts, interchain queries, what do you think a team that knows community, technology, and execution can achieve? I'll tell you, we can continue to build on our vision towards becoming a true liquid staking hub and making liquid staking the backbone of a fixed income market that we are creating in crypto. How do we do this? For starters, we'll bring SDK Atom home to the persistence chain, where together with SDK XPRT, our native token in a liquid form, we'll make it the core building block of more DeFi use cases. Later on, PSTEC will also bring other assets, SDK Osmo, SDK Gino, things like that can easily be brought with PSTEC. And we wouldn't be a true liquid staking hub if we were not looking at other big proof of stake networks. It's why we've built SDK EAT, SDK BNB, both of these products are live. And we have SDK Sol, and SDK AVAX in the pipeline. Now, these assets are maybe not our core because our true core, that's the Cosmos side, but we started to learn these assets and we're patient. We're patient, we're learning these assets in their ecosystems. And when the time is right and when the technology is there, we'll connect the ecosystems to the one we are working in, the Cosmos. To do so, we already partnered with Axelar 
and we're starting to explore a lot of cross-chain opportunities. With XLR, cross-chain messaging becomes, becomes possible. Sending assets or staked assets, cross-chain, possible. Think about executing a transaction on the persistence chain initiated from an EVM chain, possible. All of these things will allow us to build things with such a smooth user experience that a user will not even have to know which chain he is using. He wouldn't even have to know he is using a chain. That's how easy it should be. And all of these things are made possible with that first partnership with Axelar. We also recently enabled Cosmosm so that we can have developers come in and build on top of the persistence chain. With Cosmosm, developers can now deploy smart contracts um, on top of persistence and you can call the liquid staking functions from pstake. Think about it, it's incredibly powerful what you can do with that. We know that our documentation is not top notch yet, but we are working on that. And we are incredibly grateful to work together with the Cosmosm team on things like this. We also recently enabled Cosmovisor to facilitate the upgrade process for further chain upgrades. Now, the last chain upgrade, we had a bit of an issue and we failed. There was an issue and we had to halt the chain for a bit. But we had the humility to reach out to our validators to come and help us to solve the problem. We had the persistence to stay awake and to find the issue. We didn't go to sleep until we found a bug and we fixed it. That's the persistence that we have. We also have a test networking. So we cleaned up our repos as well to make it easier, to make a better developer experience possible. We have dev devnets available for devs who want to come in and try and build things in the persistence ecosystem. All these things, we're really trying to enhance developer experience and documentation. Doc <laughs> documentation is one of these things that we'll be working on. Lastly, we also have taken further steps towards further decentralization. We have increased our validator set from 75 to 100. We've put in place a new foundation delegation program aim, aiming to help smaller validators to get into the active set. We're also committed to spinning down our foundation nodes and we started thinking about creating DAOs and sub-DAOs to put more power in the hands of our community. Now, with all these building blocks, I'm confident that with persistence, we're truly set up to do amazing things and build the liquid staking hub that we want to build. All these building blocks are there. The technology is there. The community is here. And the execution, we started on it already. With some very promising teams, we started to build on an interchain DEX focused on liquid staked assets. There's another, another team that started building on money markets on top of persistence. Money markets focused around liquid staked assets so you can use them as collateral. These things are just the beginning because once you have those, you can start thinking a lot about so many other DeFi primitives. You can think about leveraged liquid staking, liquid yield farming, and there's plenty of other things to be built, options, perpetuals, yield strategies, and so on. As you can see, there are many things to be built, but we can't all build it alone. We don't want to build it alone. We want to build it with you. We have bounties, we have grants, and we have delegations to support. If you're interested, if you're passionate about DeFi, if you're passionate about fixed income like we are, and you want to build it on top of crypto on the backing, with the backing of liquid staked assets, come join us. Come find us. We'll be at the Persistence Lounge most of the day. It's just upstairs. We have great coffee. Tonight, we'll have a happy hour with some beers. Come find us. Come talk to us. And come join us. All you need are four core values. Humility, integrity, patience, and persistence. Thank you very much.
The liquid staking talks continue, and up next, we will learn about Stride. Speaking, Vishal, co-founder of Stride. Welcome to the stage. Hey everyone, I am unfortunately not Aiden, but I will be here today. I'm Vishal, one of the co-founders of Stride. Um, oh, oh, let's go. So I'm here to tell you today about the minimal, secure, liquid staking zone that is the Stride blockchain. Now, you've already heard from some other liquid staking providers about why liquid staking is important, how it works at a high level, and some other, uh, some other details about the nitty gritty of liquid staking chains. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how Stride differentiates ourselves today, but before we get into that, let's just cover a little bit of the similarities between Stride and most of the other liquid staking blockchains. For simplicity, we're gonna talk about Quicksilver here, just because they're pretty close to launch, but the similarities are pretty similar across all of the chains. So for one, Stride and most other liquid staking zones operate as a sovereign blockchain, and they get all of the security properties that you'd expect by being your own sovereign zone. Next, Stride and most of the other liquid staking providers use ICA, interchain accounts, and ICQ, interchain queries, in order to operate liquid staking effectively for consumers. Next, for Stride and most other liquid staking providers like Quicksilver, all validators are eligible to be in the validator set. So let's take Atom as an example. All 150 Atom validators are eligible to be delegated to from Stride or Quicksilver. Next, the community is ultimately the one that is going to decide the set of weights for validators for both Stride and Quicksilver and likely most other liquid staking providers. I'll beat through slightly different mechanisms, but at the end of the day, it's the community. Next, governance by proxy. This is a really highly anticipated feature and one that most liquid staking zones are going to enable shortly after launch, Strad and Quicksilver included. So what this means is you can take your liquid staking derivatives like ST Atom and use them to go vote on governance proposals on Atom, on the hub. Next, what is ultimately controlling your delegations? When you call liquid stake, how is your Atom going and being staked on the hub? And ultimately, it's through interchain accounts. This is true for pretty much all liquid staking zones that you can think of. Um, lastly, do you have to unbond your tokens to liquid stake? Unfortunately for now, with all liquid staking providers, the answer is yes. Um, until the liquid staking module, built and designed by Zaki, is integrated into these chains. For the hub, this is going to happen in January. But for other chains, it might be slightly before or slightly after. So now that we've covered a little bit of the similarities, what distinguishes Stride? What unique value does Stride bring to the vibrant Cosmos ecosystem? So we think there are two things we really want to focus on and want you to think about when you think of Stride. First is that we're a minimal blockchain. That means is that we do one thing and we do it very well. Second is security. We spent a lot of time focusing on security to try to make our chain as safe as possible. Let's talk about minimalism first. So when you think about minimalism on Stride, what this means is that we're a true app chain and we do one thing, we do that really well, that's liquid staking. We don't have a lot of these other bells and whistles, we're mostly are trying to use other uh, DeFi product, pro protocols to integrate Stride into them. So three key benefits, you get neutrality in that you can trust that Stride is actually neutral, doesn't have a, a, a dog in the fight. Second is integration, we focused a lot on making it really easy to integrate Stride into other DeFi protocols. And lastly, security. When you have a smaller set of features, we think it's easier to be more secure. Let's get into all of these. So first, on neutrality. Because Stride does one thing, liquid staking, and does it well, and doesn't have competing products like DEXs, or money markets, or uh, stable coins, you can trust that it is credibly neutral, like the Cosmos Hub. There's no other incentives here. That's not to say that this model is always the best, but there's trade-offs, and this is the niche that we're trying to occupy. We think it brings a lot of value to the table. So because Stride is a true app chain, uh, you can really be confident that we've spent a lot of time working on the core liquid staking functionality. But more importantly, when we, when we talk to other app chains like Osmosis or Crescent or wherever it may be, they can trust that we ultimately have what's best for both protocols at heart. 
as a result, also, we don't view stride as being kind of uh, uh, zero sum. Rather, stride wins when the DeFi protocols that we're able to integrate into, when those protocols do well, stride does well. And so we're really focused on growing the pie all throughout Cosmos DeFi. The second really big thing that we care about, we think about minimalism though, is integrations. So because Stride is its own app chain, we can operate in this collaborative and not competitive environment. When we think about all the really innovative DeFi happening, we're really all throughout Cosmos, we're super excited to bring Stride to integrate into all of these amazing protocols like Osmosis. So since we've launched three weeks ago, we've already talked to dozens of teams about potentially integrating Stride. We're excited to announce we've already locked down four really key partnerships. So the teams from Membrane, Margin, Silk, and Composite have already worked on starting to integrate ST Atom and the other ST tokens into their protocol. And we're only going to see more pro protocols come in, hopefully integrate with Stride. If anyone in the audience is integrated, interested in integrating with Stride, please reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you. So the last thing I really want to focus on, on minimalism, is security. So when your protocol does a few set of things, and only those set of things, it makes the potential attack surface, or the set of kind of ways attackers can penetrate your system, it makes those fewer and farther in between. So when you think of a potential hacker trying to attack Stride, there's very few things they can do on our blockchain, and it makes it hard to think of really kind of critical vulnerabilities. For example, Stride doesn't enable cosmosm on our chain. Cosmosm is a really cool, innovative technology, but given that we're really dedicated to being a app, liquid staking app chain, we don't need this kind of functionality that it provides. And as a result, there's fewer kind of entry points for attackers. The next thing that we really care about, though, on minimalism and security is that there's fewer moving parts. So let's say we work on a code update to liquid staking, and we're thinking about how we can test that. We don't have to think about how that interacts with Stride's DEX and Stride's stablecoin and Stride's other XYZ product. Rather, we only have to think about how that change interacts with its staking. This makes it easier to think about deploying future product releases or roadmap items uh, because there's fewer ways things can go wrong. But not only do we think we get a lot of security from being a minimal blockchain, but security is honestly one of the things we focused on the most at Stride. Something we, since day one that we've given our, as our true top priority. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what things, what steps we've taken to make Stride as secure as possible. So four things let's get into today. First is testing. We've done a lot of really rigorous, robust testing of our code base. We're excited to tell you about it. Second is rate limiting. So we've worked on this kind of novel set of features on Stride where we check these core variables and make sure they don't move too much to try to reduce the potential attack surface that Stride offers. Third, I'm really excited to unveil today that we're partnering with ImmuneFi to launch one of the biggest bug bounties in all of Cosmos for the Stride blockchain. Super excited about this. Last, and I know you're all excited about this, is that Stride is going to use ICS in order to secure its chain to further secure the Cosmos. Let's talk about more of these, all of these a little bit more in depth. First, testing. So we've done a lot of work to try to test our entire code base before rolling out into production. This starts off with unit test. So Stride is one of the heaviest users of ICA today, and we built out one of the first really full featured ICA unit test cases. So anytime you make a code update, our, these tests will automatically run through the entire suite of Stride functionality to make sure everything is okay. But it doesn't just stop there. After Stride, uh, you know, when we want to go deploy to new chain, let's think, take Osmosis as an example. When we think about deploying to Osmosis, we have a very standardized and rigorous process for how Stride is going to deploy onto this chain. So this starts off with first, we spin up an internal testnet for Stride and internal testnet for Osmosis. We then run through the full suite of Stride tests on this connection. After that's done, we spin up another Stride internal testnet and connect that to the Osmosis main testnet. The, again, we run through the full suite of Stride tests here to make sure everything is functioning as expected. After that passes, then we connect Stride mainnet to Osmosis mainnet and again run through a full suite of integration tests to make sure every core piece of functionality is working properly. Only after all of those things pass do we then count the product as launched and unveil it to the Cosmos ecosystem. But it doesn't just stop with integration tests. We care a lot about how our chain will ha uh, function under stress tests. So what happens if you have hundreds or thousands of users interacting with Stride in kind of unpredictable ways? 
to think to like unravel this problem, we've built this custom testing framework called Firehose. And what Firehose does is connect to two test nets and simulate thousands of users running through all the standard functionality on the chain. So this lets us, for example, we're trying to deploy to Osmosis, simulate thousands of users on both the Stride and Osmosis chains and have them all liquid stake, IBC transfer, transfer around, uh, redeem, et cetera, and make sure that everything's functioning exactly like we expect, no money is unaccounted for, et cetera. So it gives us a lot of confidence on our chain. But our testing doesn't just stop there either. We've also finished two audits before launching from Certic and Oak Security. And both of those audits included really heavy duty testing of the Stride protocol. We also just kicked off a third audit from informal systems that's going to further help us test Stride. It doesn't just stop there. Our plan is to keep ongoing audits for Stride to make sure our chain remains secure as we scale all throughout the cosmos. Lastly, we're currently on the market for a full time security researcher. We're looking for someone who's really qualified and, and interested in security, focused full time on just testing the stride chain, focused on thinking about more innovative security measures that we can implement. So if you or anyone you know is interested, please reach out to us. We're really excited to hire for this role. So beyond testing, we've done some other pretty interesting things I think on the stride chain. So the first one to talk about is rate limiting. And what this is, is basically we, have this philosophy at Stride that we care more about safety than liveness. What this means is if there's anything that might go wrong where the chain is potentially unsafe or there's potential bug, we always err on the side of stopping our chain until we can make sure nothing goes wrong and then resume the chain. Instead of favoring liveness where we care about the chain persisting always, uh, even when some things might go wrong. So this philosophy kind of guides a lot of Stride. And the idea here is that liquid staking is, uh, can grow to be a really meaningful part, uh, have custody of a really meaningful amount of assets. We really care about the security, inf uh, f uh, con security considerations here. We want to minimize any potential kind of attacks that occur. So what do we do? We run these suite of what we call invariant checks. Not every six hours, not every hour, but rather every single block. So the start of every single block in the stride chain, we check a bunch of variables on stride to make sure there are what we expect. And if any of them seem a little bit funny, it either means that there's a bug or an attack. And so we immediately halt our chain and all chain functionality is paused. The idea being that then developers can come in and take a look and see what's wrong and either fix the bug if there is one or kick out the attacker if there is one. And only after everything is safe do we then resume chain functionality. The idea being that in case of an attack, we want to really minimize any funds being lost at all. We don't just check this every block though. Even when core chain functionality like staking or redeeming is called, we run through a subset of these checks as well to make sure everything looks normal and all right and only after those checks pass do we allow the stake or redeem call to go through. But the kind of suite of threat detection that we have right now isn't done. We're always adding more tests to the suite so we can increase the kind of coverage that Stride provides to help detect if we're ever under attack. This is only going to keep getting better as Stride continues to grow. Next thing that we're really excited to announce is we've been talking to MuneFi and we want to unveil our partnership with them. So Stride is launching one of the largest bug bounties in all of Cosmos, a $500,000 bug bounty to try to find and fix any critical flaws with the Stride chain. We just kicked off this onboarding process last week and we expect to be done in the next few weeks. We can be fully onboarded onto MuneFi's platform. Um, as a quick reminder, ImmuneFi is the leading bug bounty platform all throughout uh, crypto and has thousands of security researchers who are on it actively looking for bugs on any of the chains. So we welcome all of you to take a look at Stride's code base and uh, try to find any bugs so we can collectively help make Stride the most secure chain all of Cosmos. But I want to keep in mind, this $500,000 bug bounty doesn't just stop there. As Stride grows and the total value unlocked on Stride continues to grow, this bug bounty is going to grow as well. The idea being as Stride gets more and more uh, total value unlocked, the value of fixing any bugs also keeps going up. So next, I know you're all pretty excited about this. Stride is going to consume interchain security when it's live. Really excited to announce this. I think it's going to help secure Stride and help secure the cosmos overall. So we're currently onboarding onto the industry and security testnet and I'm really excited to be there from testnet all the way to mainnet to help collaborate any way and contribute any way that we can. 
We're hoping that as Stride's total value unlocked grows, that we continue to use ICS to leverage the over $3 billion of economic security that the Cosmos Hub offers. And through this, we can make sure that the funds on Stride remain safe. Moreover, we're really excited about mesh security, and we think that this is ultimately could be the future of Stride and what we hope is going to happen. We hope that as Stride grows, every chain that we onboard, we provide security to that chain, and we also rent security from that chain. The idea being, as we start growing to more and more chains, we can keep continually increasing the amount of security on the Stride chain. Really excited about this. So, told you a little bit about what we think differentiates Stride. So, right now we're running into right around three weeks after the Stride mainnet has launched. Around September 5th, Stride first launched ST Atom, allows you to liquid stake your Atom on Stride. So since then, we've unlocked $5 million of value. This means that users have liquid staked $5 million with Stride and now have unlocked that liquidity to go use all throughout the cosmos, wherever their favorite DeFi protocol lives. We have $10 million of liquidity on Stride's, on the DEXs that support ST tokens. So if you have ST Atom or ST Stars, you can go very quickly sell it in this AMM and receive your staking yield while also remaining liquid. Really excited about this. We're already one of the number five most liquid uh, AMMs in Osmosis and hoping to keep contributing to add liquidity to the Stride chain. We've onboarded not just one chain, but two chains in the last three weeks. So we started with ST Atom, and now we also have support for ST Stars. We have 5,000 users who've already interacted with the Stride platform, and it continues to grow. So we want you all to start using Stride and see what we built. Lastly, we've had dozens of projects reach out to us about potentially integrating, and we're really excited to unveil these over the next few weeks as they start coming out. But we're just in the beginning. We're not done yet. We're just at the very start of Stride's journey. Here's just a little bit of upcoming alpha we want to share with you about where the future of Stride could go. First, we're really excited to announce integration with Kujira and their upcoming USK stablecoin. So the Kujira team was really excited about what we built at Stride and the technology and the security stack that we have. And we were really excited about everything Kujira is building. And we're excited to say that SE tokens will be able to be used as collateral on the USK stablecoin. Um, this means that you can now go continue to collect your staking yield, but also go mint stablecoins so you can help contribute to the decentralization of fiat. This is really exciting. We think makes the opportunity cost of contributing to a over collateralized stablecoin much less severe because you can continue to collect your uh, staking yield. Next, we're going to start onboarding ICS when it rolls out to B3 onto our chain. We've already started our testing process for this and are really excited about potentially being one of the first chains to use ICS on mainnet. Third, we're started developing to integrate the liquid staking module onto Stride. So this means is when we start onboarding chains like the hub that have the LSM enabled, we can allow you to liquid stake on Stride without unbonding your assets. Lastly, really excited to announce a bunch of upcoming integrations where we are going to deploy Stride on different chains. We've already deployed on Atom and Stars, and the community has told us really positive things and is really excited about Juno, Osmosis, Secret, Evmos, and Injective. If there's any other chain that you're excited to bring liquid staking to, please reach out to us and we'll add it to this roadmap. So, if you get just one or two takeaways from this talk, I want you to think about Stride and think about how it is the minimal and secure liquid staking blockchain. We're a true app chain that we only want to do one thing, liquid staking, and do that very, very well. We focus on that quite a bit. And then we also have focused a ton on security on trying to make our chain as secure as possible. So liquid staking, we're really excited. We think it's going to ultimately unlock a lot of the value in DeFi. There's no, users no longer have this trade-off between DeFi yields and liquid staking, or, or, or in staking yields. You can participate in both. And lastly, we're really excited to announce that we're going to use ICS to secure our chain as we continue to scale throughout the cosmos. And lastly, I just want to thank all of our partners who have helped us get here. Really excited to see where the future of Stride grows and want all of you to come partner with us as well. Thank you so much for listening to our talk.
how the next light box light um light like, kind of yeah. magnifying yeah. gas yeah. with the Okay, so now, as we told you before, we're going to have the Cosmoverse Awards tomorrow. So we are going to give you the QR code here so that you can scan it and you can start voting from now. There you go. Choose wisely, please. <laughs> Okay, so now our next speakers are going to be Sergey and Kay from P2P. Welcome, guys. So yeah, hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, so yeah, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to meet you these days on the Cosmoverse. Uh, today our talk is about uh, liquid staking that is so hot right now, right? And the, like, in the Cosmos ecosystem, uh, you can hear like this term again and again on the, all of these talks and like panels and stuff like that. And today, basically, we are not going to talk about like any specific liquid staking implementation, but we want to address the question of what is like actually make the liquid staking good or bad solution for the like ecosystem, right? Uh, and I want to talk to you that we want to raise a discussion, right? So we don't want to give you an answers. We just want to raise a discussion because who we are to give actually the answers for the like, whole ecosystem. Uh, basically, who we are. Uh, so my name is Kai Turin. Uh, like, this is my photo like, before the terror crash. Uh, I look pretty different these days. Uh, yeah, and my name is Sergey, and that's my photo when uh, 72 proposal passed. So, yeah, and we are from the P2P. Uh, P2P is a long-term Cosmos partner. We are validated in Cosmos Hub since the very genesis. Uh, we are the winners of like previous Game of Zones, and we made it, like several other contributions in the different parts of the ecosystem, so we're bullish on Cosmos. Uh, we're really interested in its success, and I think we really understand what this Cosmos is all about. Uh, and besides that, we are a big contributor to LIDADAO. So uh, P2P right now maintains the LIDA on Solana main solution. Uh, we previously maintain the LIDA on Terra solution. Uh, that was like pretty huge DeFi protocol on the Cosmos chain. So I think that we actually have a pretty good experience in liquid staking, and that is why we are talking about that. Uh, but before switching to the liquid staking topic, uh, Let's take a look on the state of the vanilla native staking uh, in the Cosmos. Uh, let's take a look at the example of the Cosmos Hub. Uh, if we will take a look of how the stake is distributed on the Cosmos Hub, we will see like the 51% the, the of stake is actually distributed among the 12 validators. That might be not perfect, right? But like the most important uh, um, problem that we have actually is uh, and that is what actually makes the Cosmos kind of unique, is that Cosmos is not, uh, in, in Cosmos validation is not only about like the sign and block, it's not like only about block producing, right? Uh, it's about governance, right? Because uh, in Cosmos we have like a representative democracy and validators have the voting power to like actually develop the ecosystem. And if, if we will take a look at the like distribution of those 51% uh, of stake, we will see that 17% of voting power is actually never used. So we kind of have a room for improvement. Uh, and oh, the question is why? 
right? Because uh, why we came up like with this kind of situation? Uh, the thing here is that vanilla st native staking uh, it actually tends towards the centralization. And when we're talking about centralization, first of all, we are talking about centralized solutions. Uh, why? Centralized solutions are so attractive for users because have, they have a perfect UX for users, right? So you buy, it, buy your tokens, you stake them, enjoy your pair. And actually, on centralized solution, uh, you have like your tokens, basically, your tokens, your staked tokens, basically liquid because like centralized solutions often like use the buffer for to like make the withdrawals available. So that slightly reduce the error, but provides a very good user experience. And with a, like vanilla native staking, uh, you should do like the whole process of like installing your wallet, creating your seed phrase, backing it up, and stuff like that. And the most important uh, point here is pick. So you should pick a validator. You should do a research. You should uh, like understand basically which validator you should delegate your assets to, right? Uh, and a lot of users obviously don't want to make it like with this choice. Uh, they just want their repair to be high. Uh, so they either choose like one of the top validators or they choose like the validators with the zero commission. Hello, proposal 76. Uh, so yeah, uh, what we can do about it? Uh, we see that liquid staking as an alternative here, right? Because for the users, it's still the um, kind of attractive user experience, right? Because you can stake your assets, uh, like the DeFi possibilities like, are open for you. Uh, like, it's pretty straightforward. You don't need to choose validators or stuff like this. And it's actually pretty important for the ecosystem because liquid staking has an ability to manage the validator set, right? And what we think about is that while Liquid staking actually have an ability uh, to manage the validator set and kind of fix the problem of like fix the problem of native staking. We think that liquid staking solution must solve this problem because liquid staking is not like one more DeFi protocol on the ecosystem, right? It's pretty close to the heart of the ecosystem, to the staking, to the things that make blockchain secure and security. It's what it's all about, right? Uh, so, when we are building the liquid staking solution, uh, we actually face two main problems. Uh, because liquid staking is two-sided thing. Uh, and the first side is for the users, right? So we need to provide the uh, good liquidity for users so they could actually unstake their assets instantly uh, by selling it on the DEXs and stuff like that. And the other side is to the ecosystem where we are doing actual validator management. And for now, because we're talking about like the ecosystem health, we will focus on the second part. So there are like different approaches to handle the uh, validator set management, uh, like an opinionated one uh, based on the on-chain data only, and like fully created by the protocol created, uh, fully created by the protocol sets. Uh, let's go, uh, for example, by one, one by one. Uh, First approach is unopinionated management. Uh, it's basically when we allow for users to choose the validators that they want their assets to be staked to. Uh, this approach has benefits, right? Because it's still liquid staking. It still pushes the DeFi ecosystem forward. Uh, it still makes your token liquids. Uh, but it has nothing to do with the centralization issue, right? Because uh, we still like pretty really the same issue uh, that we have on the vanilla staking. And this is like what we faced uh, when we developed the light down terror thing. So uh, the ability to choose the validator uh, leads like our stake to be hugely imbalanced. So we fixed it in, in the first versions, but like we have a real experience of what is it all about. So it, it's, at best, like this approach can be neutral to the ecosystem, so it just doesn't make it worse, right? And the second approach, on-chain data only. So uh, this approach is when we, like, our protocol just uh, gathers the data from, chain, from the chain that is available, chain that is trustless, and uh, manage the validator set based on this data. So like, first of all, it manages the actual list of our data, right? So it can let add validators there or remove there. And it actually make the distribution of stake based on this data. Uh, this approach is like, looks pretty, right? Because uh, uh, code, is 
got, got the skin here, right? So it's very trustless and so on. But it has like really huge drawbacks. And those drawbacks are that not everything that we want to measure can be measured in a quantitative way. Uh, like the pretty obvious example is governance once again, because we cannot make a metric of for a validator if like it's good in governance or not. We can like understand that it's like bad in governance, it just if it just doesn't work at all. But we cannot understand if like a uh, validator makes wise choices and stuff like this in, in only quantitative manner, right? And also the on-chain data that we have is very limited. We have no information about like how the monitoring works, how the key management works, where is it like validators allocated and stuff like that. Uh, so in the end of the day, this approach uh, tends to centralization once again, but not in, uh, in centralization in terms of like using the centralized solutions, but in terms of optimizing for performance, because when validators are trying to optimize for, for, for the performance, they tend to use like the pretty same like client providers and stuff like that, and it actually, actually like increases the performance, but it makes a huge risk for blockchain to be halted because of like uh, the uh, censorship risk and stuff like that, and also it addresses like the risk of the like CPL attacks because uh, based on the on-chain data, we cannot understand like for those two validators to be the same entity or not. So yeah, this approach has pretty obvious drawbacks. Uh, so and I said enough about the problems, and Sergey will try to uh, tell you about like what we can do better here. So uh, what? is a good validator set. So the approach is pretty intuitive. Uh, like uh, the stake should be distributed well, so we don't have this balance. Um, validators should uh, perform well and be active in governance. But uh, if we look at the drawbacks of uh, naive approach, uh, we can see that that's not as easy as it is. Um, so let's say we have uh, all validators uh, hosted on some one particular cloud uh, hosting and what if it goes down? Or even if we kind of okay with white list, white label uh, validators, what if solution provider just decide that they don't like uh, Cosmos anymore. Uh, or even if we have uh, all the validators uh, hosted on the same jurisdiction and they got regulated. Um, so that is really complex. Um, we can utilize like curated set solution. So uh, it may uh, give us a better picture of network. So because it uses off-chain data, but to retrieve uh, off-chain data, you need people. And that's uh, really expensive. Because if we talk about uh, especially interchain liquid staking, uh, you have to um, analyze all the networks, all the uh, validator sets, and retrieve this data. So more networks, more data, uh, more people. Uh, how we can improve it? We can um, mix. Uh, we can use blended sets, uh, which combine uh, benefits from uh, some approach, and uh, we can use, we can learn from other solutions, um, and make uh, Cosmos uh, liquid staking <coughs> uh, even better. So, uh, what is blended sets? Uh, it's uh, just mix of uh, approaches. Uh, 
So uh, we can use permissionless list uh, and curated li curated set on top of each other. Like we have a permissionless application, uh, so any validator can uh, apply, and if it fits some defined criteria, uh, he goes to the list. So uh, when uh, a validate, particular validator uh, performs well, uh, it goes to the curated list uh, by governance decision. Um, so uh, also uh, there is a scoring system uh, for validators. So uh, we can analyze uh, on-chain data and combine this data into one particular score or number and this way we can like onboard more validators uh, without uh, like uh, doing this manually. Uh, this way also uh, network security preserved uh, because uh, we have uh, because we have a uh, scoring system which uh, distributes stakes on only to well performed uh, validators yeah uh, even if we have really performant validator uh, it can have like a very, very weird decision on governance. So in vanilla staking, it's really easy. So a user can redefine validators vote and that's it. In uh, liquid staking, in, in Cosmos liquid staking model, uh, it's not directly possible. So a particular uh, liquid staking protocol can do it by its own. So uh, <coughs> uh, but it but the solution would be really complex or even doesn't exist anymore. Um, so uh, it's really important to have this uh, feature in Cosmos SDK. Uh, yeah, uh, usually in Cosmos, uh, staking and governance tokens are the same, and that's an issue because uh, low liquidity and market cap can cause uh, uh, possible attacks. Uh, so uh, you can just capture governance, uh, redelegate the stake, and redelegate stake to some entity and then hold the system because uh, governance tokens are the same as staking. Uh, so yeah, and talking about the like this model of separating like the security token and the governance token, we already have uh, like the approach that is like really uh, natural for that like and this is the smart contracts approach uh, we truly believe that smart contracts uh, like liquid staking based on smart contracts could, could be very good here uh, first of all because like this separation uh, token model uh, uh, for smart contracts it's much easier to fork the solution because any solution might be might, might become malicious as, malicious at the end of the day right because any DAO can like decide that it, it could, can destroy Cosmos or, or whatever, or whatever like that. And it's really hard to fork the zone, actually, because you need a new validator set, you need like to be approved by interchain security or something like that. But for the smart contracts, you can just deploy your own solution based on the same smart contracts. And with a liquid second module, like the whole state can be transferred like overnight, right? And basically, uh, Smart, con smart contracts also uh, give, give, like, give us a possibility to uh, not be worried a lot about like governance minimization because uh, we can we can not be scared about like locking some uh, parameters of the protocol because actually we want 
for underlying level to cover our back, right? And when we, we, when we make it in a, with a separate zone, the only thing we have is the social consensus. But if we make our solution based on smart contracts, uh, like the underlying level is the zone with its own governance, and it like can cover our back, can like take a look at us, and like can uh, be sure that we are not malicious, right? So we need like the secure platform for that, and God bless, we have Neutron, right? Uh, the Neutron like from one side is as secure as Cosmos Hub is, right? So uh, we believe like that. Uh, it's a very good idea to secure the liquid staking solutions with a like, Cosmos validator set. Uh, and on the other side, Neutron has like all of those uh, IBC features that we need like to make an uh, interchain liquid staking solution, right? So if you are interested in Neutron, go and check it. Uh, and we truly believe that the approach that we have is very aligned with uh, LIDA vision of like how to deal with this kind of stuff. Uh, so we made a lot of research, and we made the uh, proposal to the LIDA DAO to launch the LIDA on Cosma thing. Uh, it's still in the proposal stage, uh, and we want to make it good. We want, want to make it like healthy for the ecosystem, right? Uh, so that we need your opinion. So that, like, if you agree with us or if you disagree with us, please uh, go and leave your opinion on the LIDA DAO forum, LIDA DAO forum uh, where like our proposal is placed, and it also has like the uh, recap of like our vision. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can like uh, try to catch us like at the conference, or you can leave your questions uh, on the forum, and we'll try uh, to answer it basically. So thank you everyone. See you around. Members will get access to Monastery Festival in Cartagena Eligibility to own a part of Monastery Elevate your networking at the Monastery Convention in Medellin and receive unique clothes from this collection both physical and for the metaverse How to enter The key will be the Gyatso NFT collection from Monastery and RMA an NFT based on the Ethereum blockchain technology See you in Cartagena and inside the Monasteryverse Go to monasterynft.com now. Up next, we have a DeFi on Cosmos panel. Let's make some noise. Let's go. Your moderator, Zachy. And speakers, Sunny. We got Euron, and we got Young. Sorry, one more speaker, Vishal. Okay, so, sorry. Just trying to find the right messages. All right. Okay. Has everyone spoken already, or do we need to do intros? I think you you spoke. You spoke. Did you speak? Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. Spoke. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I don't think we need to do intros. Uh, everybody can see who we are. So let's just like get into the meat of it. Um, all right. So I'll just you know. A little bit of the theme is I think we want to talk more about how like DeFi projects in Cosmos are collaborating together and like building things collectively rather than like oh like which DeFi project is the best um, uh, but uh, you know so there's this uh, you know why don't we start out with Sunny you want to talk about the, the ION 3.0 proposal and uh, building a, a, a basket asset for Cosmos and like maybe why it's even needed yeah sure uh, I don't know if people saw, there was a proposal that just went up on the uh, ION Commonwealth, it's called ION 3.0. 
Um, basically, it's an idea to build uh, two pretty independent products for the Ion DAO. Uh, it's, one is called the Interchain Basket of Coins, ticker is IBC. Uh, Name is a uh, pending, you know, community approval. But uh, the, the, the point is to have a interchain basket where, you know, if people want to, you know, part of the problem today with Cosmos is like, oh, if you want to invest in Cosmos, you don't, you're a newcomer to this space, what do you buy, right? Like, you know, I guess there's Atom, but like that's very, you know, specific to one product, right? What you want to do is have like some sort of exposure to the entire Cosmos ecosystem. So. The point of the interchain basket is supposed to be a index token that you know it follows some sort of cap weighting of all the Cosmos ecosystem coins, and you know this solves a bunch of problems. It, it shows people you know it, it's a new uh, way of like directing newcomers to the space, and it's just like an easy thing to you know just buy this one asset and you you're exposed to the entire Cosmos ecosystem. The second product, uh, the other benefit of the IBC or the interchain basket of coins would be that it is a you know a pretty a, a much a better diversified asset than any one asset in the Cosmos ecosystem, and that kind of leads into the second product, which is to build a stable coin uh, called IOU, uh, following a maker or reflexor style model, but using the uh, interchain index as the primary uh, collateral in the system. So it's basically a IOU would be a IBC backed stablecoin. Um, so I think that touches on what I think maybe many people I think perceive as like one of the pain points of interacting with DeFi in Cosmos, which is there is no sort of basket or index or fat protocol asset that you can invest in. What are the other pain points that I think you as builders and trying to build DeFi in, in Cosmos are facing and uh, like what, what, what hurts the most? Yeah, I think the, the volatility of assets is, is one of the pain points, especially if you're talking about borrowing lending protocols where you use the assets as collateral. Um, high, or high volatility has the, the risk of triggering liquidations when you don't want them to, to happen. And I think a product like this can, can solve this, and we've thought about this as well, looking at doing something very similar but with a basket of staked assets. Um, so something like that could be very interesting where you have a basket of staked assets and uh, you use those assets then together as collateral. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of the things I guess a, a solution like this can, can definitely solve. This is a more boring answer, but I think the infra around developing I IBC applications really trails where it should be in other ecosystems, and it's getting much better. There's tons of really good work being done here, but right now if you want to prototype an IBC or ICA application and test it locally, there's no good testing framework. I would say it takes something order of like three to five times as long to do it right now on Cosmos as it does on ETH, for example. And there's tons of really amazing work being done by lots of teams to make this better. But right now, it's a pretty meaningful slowdown on DeFi progress. Yeah, on the like infrastructure, I think the one like one piece of vital infrastructure that's like missing right now, but it's being developed by like Strange Love and Osmosis is this and the IBC team is this idea of multi atomic multi hop IBC. Uh, routing. So, you know, as an example, and, and this is like a big blocker for a lot of use cases. So, as an example, look, take something like Quasar, right? So, Quasar is a Vaults product. It, if you t send Juno from the Juno chain to the Quasar chain, you put it in a Vault, and then it wants to start LPing on Osmosis. The the Quasar contracts can't just IBC that Juno directly to Osmosis because that would be like double hopped, right? It'll be from it'll be Quasar wrapped Juno, right? And that's not how IBC works right now. So they, but Quasar needs a way of like atomically sending tokens back to Juno and then to its account on Osmosis in like one click. It doesn't have, or not even a click, right? It's it's not even. It, it is a contract that's doing it, right? And that's the, that's the real challenge. And so, um, you know, we're working on building this out with uh, yeah, with the Strange Love team. So hopefully, I'll be re ready pretty soon. Yeah, so also uh, the one of the pain points for this index fund idea is that uh, when you want to like deposit or withdraw from that fund, then you need to bring all of these assets into it so that your same assets can be in invested so you can mint some uh, index token from it. And some of the assets are not quite available. That is possible. Some of the assets will be loose 
uh, any of like liquidity pool there, that there'll be no liquidity at all, then it is very difficult to mint those tokens. Or uh, so I think like uh, there should be like smarter way to like uh, avoid this kind of like pain points. Yeah. yeah so what we do, what, what would happen is uh, it would, you know, if you bring one asset, it will auto swap it to the right. Uh, portfolio on the osmosis decks and then put it into the index um, you know yeah I mean okay is there an edge case of like oh there's not enough liquidity for one of the assets on osmosis but like I don't know any 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 asset that's like probably should be in the interchain index will have enough will have like decent enough liquidity on osmosis I imagine so I guess when you like I guess so my my bigger question is is like is maybe like Okay, let's talk about this. What is like, what is the core objective that like we are all trying to accomplish with DeFi on Cosmos? Like, what is the DeFi experience that we're trying to build? What, like, what is the thing that like DeFi and Cosmos should be like anchored in people's minds as like what, what it is and then like what is the barrier to building that? Yeah, so I believe that there are different environment uh, in different blockchains and ecosystem and like in Ethereum or other smart contract platform they have one of the biggest advantage, which is synchronization. Uh, and in the interchain world, it is uh, quite tricky because every chain has its own consensus and is uh, synchronized uh, each other. So all these DeFi should be connected each other. So we have all this like connected e economy in this in interchain. But this like uh, asynchronous uh, prevent us from build this like very connected service within with this atomic transaction. Uh, accomplishment so we uh, I kind of like imagine something like uh, collaboration with all these different blockchains having different consensus but having like frequent like uh, occasional like uh, collaborated block uh, created all together with validation from all these validator set so that we can create this multi-chain uh, block one block, single block, uh, connected each other, so that this IBC can be uh, expanded as a feature, so that we can like uh, allow like uh, multiple messages cross all this multi-chain at once, atomically happening within a block. So this is kind of uh, uh, like a step points of each like block, so that you can we can connect every block uh, in every blockchain in one one block, so we can like uh, accomplish like part of this synchronization issue so that we can do all this kind of multi-chain MEV or multi-chain liquidation, uh, multi-chain message uh, uh, transaction, such kind of thing can be happened with, with this kind of technology. Yeah, and I, I really like that. And um, I think from my, my end, like one of the pain points uh, in DeFi that I really like to think about and, and one of the things we can potentially solve with the things you mentioned um, is really the, the UX experience at this stage or the user experience at this stage within DeFi. Um, it has been quite tricky to build because there's so many different app chains, uh, build a different chain for every app. But so now a user has to go and use those different apps. Uh, apps on different chains and it's very confusing because at some stage you just lost which chain am I using at this stage um, and I guess they're like interchain uh, accounts interchain security interchain queries these things start to help solving a lot of these these UX problems that, that we like to solve um, but I think it's only the beginning and I think the things you mentioned can really work I mean, work towards further progress on that stage I actually think that the uh, whole synchronicity is a little like a bit overrated you know you look at all of web development, literally all of web development happens via asynchronous like programming. You know, the entire internet doesn't run on one server. All of finance is not going to run on one synchronous like state machine. Uh, we, you know, all we, we, we just, I th and I think Cosmos is just the farthest ahead in designing systems to be like built for asynchronous designs. And we're, I think we're exploring a lot of new models of how to do this. So I know the Mars team, I think, is going to be talking pretty soon. The way that they do their outpost system is, I think, like, you know, one, probably like one of the most interesting ways of how uh, cross chain DeFi is going to work. And, you know, we're, 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 we're going to be applying a outpost model to Osmosis as well, where, like, you know, uh, deploy, you know, let's call it Osmoswap, right? We deploy a contract on Juno or Neutron or Archway where you, you know, if you want to do a swap, it, I, it set, you send it to the contract. It, the contract will IBC it to Osmosis. 
auto do, do the swap and then IBC it back and like ha have the same UX as a DEX on that chain but still actually be routing through osmosis liquidity. And so I think this outpost model is like one of the most interesting ways of how interchain DeFi is gonna sort of uh, grow. Are you, maybe one way of saying what you're saying is that moving away from token transfers as the main primitive of Cosmos DeFi and towards interchain accounts is yeah. maybe, is the future? Towards interchain accounts as well as just like custom interchain standards, right? Like the nice thing about Cosmosm is we get a lot of flexibility to just like, you know, build bespoke uh, IBC protocols really quickly um, and have them start talking to each other. I think there's also an element here where IBC transfers are good and I think ICA is going to make them better. But there's a lot of things that are underexplored with IBC. So for example, when I want to deposit on Osmosis, I have to IBC over and then deposit as two separate authorizations. You could easily imagine sort of IBC middleware that kind of intercepts the packets and routes them to the right function call. You could, it doesn't necessarily want. I could route through like six different app chains in much the same way a lot of server calls are done today. And I think we're moving towards a sort of future where the users are mostly abstracted away from the fact that I'm moving across chains. I just hit stake on Osmosis or Crescent or whatever it is, and then four different hops are happening in the back end, invisible to me. Yeah, the, the IBC team right now is working on like ICS 20 V, I don't know what, what V it is, but it, it basically includes a metadata field to an ICS 20 transfer. So when you send the tokens, you can include metadata of the action you want it to do as well. Yeah, I think you can do this right now with middleware, but it's a little bit hacky, but it's getting more productionized. Yeah, I think like IBC middleware is like getting, you know, developing a lot. So we, we uh, added a new piece of middleware to the osmosis chain. It will not be in this upgrade this week, but in, in the next one, which is like IBC rate limiting. And it's the idea of like, hey, we can cap it. We can say like, hey, you know, more than 20% of a channel's IBC channel's TVL shouldn't be like leaving in like a six hour period, right? If, you know, let's, let's have like uh, circuit breakers and stuff to like in cases ever hacks and stuff. So yeah, I think there's a, a and then we're, we're working with the Strange Love team to build this into a generalized like IBC middleware stack. So I think that's gonna open up a lot of new use cases. So on this context, I think also like um, Oracle is one of the uh, core issue for all this DeFi protocol. And I think like IBC can expand its feature to serve that uh, purpose, like uh, on one like uh, permissionless transaction, uh, which can be verified by all these like uh, host chain uh, so that this data from any uh, index in the KV store can be uh, verified by validator, can be sent over to destination chain, and then this destination chain, if they believe this IBC, then they can believe this data also. So this Oracle can be like more like on-chain than like off-chain in other uh, blockchain ecosystems. So I think that will be a great uh, expansion point for IBC features. Yeah, like the... So on Osmosis today, you can pay your transaction fees in any token you want, right? And I think that's like one of the most important UX features. And but we want to make sure this functionality gets like given to all Cosmos chains. I think that I don't know. I personally find that to actually be a big blocker in like a lot of cross-chain UX. Is that like, oh, when I send something to Juno, oh, I need to have some Juno to make the transaction fee. Then I go to Stargaze, oh, I need some stars to make to make my transaction. Uh, so we'll, we are going to be like exporting our Osmosis TWAP. Oracles over IBC so that other chains can use them as the way to uh, accept fees in any token they want. Cool. All right. Let's kind of go to like staking derivatives and like this, pers like, you know, we made it a big part of Atom 2.0 that we want to see staking derivatives sort of, per you know, become pervasive throughout the Cosmos DeFi ecosystem. Um, the question is, like, how do you expect that to play out? Like, you have uh, 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 B, uh, B Crescent, B, B Creek already out there. Um, you would, Strides uh, Staked Atom is out there. Um, huh? And Stars. Uh, and Stargaze. Uh, how do you imagine that this is going to, like, sort of, like, where, how do you avoid liquidity fragmentation? How is this going to play out in different DEX models? Um, how is this going to play out as collateral? What are the thought? What are your guys' various thoughts on this? Yeah. So all, all great questions. So one on liquidity fragmentation. 
I, I think this is slightly more of an issue in Cosmos and other uh, ecosystems because there's more different places to move the tokens. Um, but what we've seen so far is I think there are a sufficient number of arbitrators who kind of are different DEXs. And you mostly, I think, will not see too much liquidity fragmentation on one SD token. So SD Atom, for example, on Crescent and Osmosis, as long as there's one sufficiently motivated person running the relay, you're not really fragmenting liquidity that much. The more important liquidity fragmentation is probably like you have ST atom, Q atom, like a bunch of a bunch of different atoms. Uh, th th that is a harder problem to solve. Although I think there's like two ends of this. There's one where you just have one player dominate the market. That's also not not very desirable. We have lots of centralization on this one chain. Even the chain is decentralized. It might not be like the, what you really want in optimal end state. And then there's another thing where you really want enough liquidity on these uh, per, on these assets where it's actually usable. I think there's probably two futures we're going to see. Might be more, and this, you know, but what I'm thinking right now. One is when you see more stable swaps, for example, on Crescent, like pervade the ecosystem, you get much deeper liquidity for much less assets. So something like $10 million of liquidity will give you like $400 million or $10 million in the pool if you have stable swaps because you something like $400 million of liquidity, which gives you a lot of like slippage that you're able to do. And as long as you have arbitrators who come in and it's not like ETH right now where you can actually unbond. So the chance of depegging is less pervasive. I think you might also potentially see someone wrap all the staked atom into one different like super staked atom and that's what's going to be used as collateral. Um, T TBD like who actually does that and what the weights on that, that is. Um, but I think this is a solvable problem. You see this with like ETFs for example. There's all sort, there's like 100 different like S&P 500 ETFs and uh, various different flavors. Uh, but you don't see that much liquidity fragmentation. Each of these are liquid enough for their purpose. Yeah, and then I think that that makes a lot of sense, and I think the the true way out of here is, is collaboration in in a sense, and and I think we've seen this on uh, on Ethereum as now as well, where they have this liquid staking collective. I think that's trying to solve this the same problem. Um, on we were actually we have our, our SDK BNB product, and and there we have one of the solutions you mentioned is those stable swap pools where we actually combine all the liquid staking derivatives into one pool with the the base assets, uh, which makes the swaps a lot more efficient. Um, and, and capital efficient in a way. Um, so yeah, I think those are things that can be can be used. Then maybe also like um, things like um, flash loans, for example, could make arbitrage a, a lot more efficient. Um, so yeah, looking forward to, to seeing that and that way we'll have um, maybe quicker arbitrage and, and uh, things like that. So we need less liquidity maybe in a way. Uh, I'm gonna offer a third uh, world end, end game, which is maybe staking derivatives balkanized even further and I, I don't know if this is going to, what's going to play out, but a third worldview is that every DeFi protocol becomes its own staking derivatives protocol. So you look at some, so okay, who did this correctly? You know, say what you will about it, but I think Anchor actually did this correctly, where in Anchor you didn't deposit B Luna, right? You deposited Luna, and then the Anchor system would uh, stake the Luna and collect that staking yield and decide what to do with it, right? They used it to subsidize a 20% fake yield, okay, whatever. But like, the, the idea was correct, right? And so what will happen is DeFi protocols will accept, so I mean we talked about this, uh, in the, it, it was mentioned in the uh, ION 3.0 thing where it's like, hey, you know, this ETF is going to have all these uh, causeless assets, but then the ION DAO will stake the assets itself and collect that staking rewards as revenue for, you know, and it can choose what it wants to do with it. it can, give it to ION holders, it can, you know, give it to the index holders, it could use it for, you know, incentives for liquidity mining of, of the index. You know, there's a lot of different things that can do with it. But the, the point is that, like, you know, the DeFi protocols are going to be the ones who want to control those cash flows. And so I think that what will happen is DeFi protocols will start to, like, partner with, like, staking <coughs> derivatives protocols to provide, like, white-labeled staking derivative functionality. So uh, I see this... Uh, problems and uh, issue as a more like an ecosystem perspective and like culture perspective. Uh, so uh, I think all this like problem is uh, in this like DeFi composability issue. I think like uh, in this asynchronous world, it is uh, trickier than other uh, ecosystem. So we believe that there should be a quite strong culture that all these assets uh, like locked in different kinds of DeFi should be well tokenized so that it can be transferred through IBC so they can be reused in other DeFi. So this is like interchain DeFi composability and this should be well uh, supported by any chain so that this like DeFi 
shouldn't be like uh, improve and grow uh, within one platform, but like entire ecosystem. And this kind of new DeFi coming into Cosmos, they need to have this chance to touch these assets so that they can uh, utilize this for uh, improving DeFi and more utilities to come. So I think like this connectivity and composability, tokenization, this is the issue in our DeFi world. And I think like liquidify anything, like liquid staking, but like in Crescent, we are doing liquid farming, which is like liquidify your farming position so they can be used in UMI or Kava or any other lending protocol. So this is like where we should go because this uh, allows all the composability within other DeFi protocols. Cool. Um, so my question is really, okay, so the, so the question is sort of, what's the best way to think about this? I mean, I think that the, like, the, like, kind of the narrative that we're trying to say here is, you know, the, the narrative around Cosmos has historically just been, like, come and stake, right? Come and stake, get your airdrops. Uh, uh, then there was, like, kind of a little bit of the, you know, we had the Osmosis farming uh, craze, but now we're actually asking everyone to use different DeFi applications. So do you view that as, like, how do you think we're going to negotiate, like, that whole, like, use case, right? Like, that, that fact that, like, like, we have to change, that we're sort of changing the default, you know, onboarding experience from, okay, like, uh, stake your atom to stake your atom, put it in a staking derivative protocol, put that in a lending pool, right? How do you think that's going to evolve across like the whole stack of applications? How hard do you think it's going to be to onboard users onto that? Yeah, um, good question. I think it's, it's as, as what was mentioned before, maybe it should be easier for the, the end user to just um, start with a base asset and say, look, this is the asset I want to take exposure in and all the rest should actually happen in the background, even the liquid staking, the usage of different DeFi protocols, and you basically choose, look, I want to have exposure to Adam, I'm fine with that because I'm long Adam, um, and I see with this strategy, um, I can generate whatever percentage of yield it is, and I know these are the risks that I'm exposed to because I'm using this in this protocol. And as a user, you basically come in, you have some Adam, you deposit that, and the strategy runs like on its own. And, and as a user, you don't have to interact with all these DeFi protocols. And I think we can really make this, make this possible um, in, the, in the long term by, by really opening up and, and everything that we develop with um, keeping in mind the um, decomposability effects of this, like, like really building um, SDKs and APIs that allow protocols to interact with each other. Um, so yeah, I think that's to me it's, it's like the end goal for the users itself. Do we want to talk about oracles for the last few few minutes? Um, what do we think interchain queries are going to change the game on oracles, or you know, is there more to be done in order to enable sort of all of the DeFi applications that need oracles in the cosmos and not require you to like set up your own validator oracle network? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I mentioned this earlier, but I think that interchain queries will be able to, like, provide at least the price oracles that are on Osmosis, it'll be able to send those everywhere. I think there's some, like, development to be done. I think there's, like, you know, what, like, three or four, like, parallelly being developed interchain query systems. What are interchain queries? What are interchain queries? Interchain queries are, you know, a way of proving something about the state of one blockchain to another. So, you know, today you query a blockchain, you you like, oh, what is my balance or what is uh, the the price of this asset on Osmosis? You get back it. You can get you get back the result, but you can also get back a like client proof saying like, you know, showing you that that's correct. You can take that like client proof and show that to another blockchain. Um, so yeah, and w w one of my big concerns about like some of the interchain query designs, however, is that like they're letting people prove anything in the KV store of, a, of, of the counterparty blockchain. That's actually kind of dangerous because then like, you know, we need to have more strict boundaries on like what, you know, uh, as we continue development, we might want to change how some data is structured in our blockchain. And like, so I, the, we don't want interchain queries to make it like, oh, everything in our, all of our entire database is now like, uh, you know, has to be versioned and everything. That's kind of not what we want. And so we need to have like better guidelines of like, oh, which parts of state are supposed to be like queryable and which parts are not. Uh, is Stride using interchain queries yet? 
Yeah, absolutely. We use it in two places. So mainly we use ICA callbacks to handle most of record keeping, but slashing events you can't query through ICA callbacks because they're not done through an ICA yep. call generally. Uh, and then second, if anything, for whatever reason, uh, reason goes wrong, we also can issue an ICQ to revert back to regular state. Is Stride the first interchain controller and interchain query user in production? Uh, as far I, as I know, but I, I'm not aware of all the projects out there, so it's possible or not. Yeah, so, but like, how has that been bringing, you know, these very experimental Cosmos technologies into uh, your stack? It, it was a very painful development process. <laughs> it took us a lot of sleepless, uh, sleepless months, but we're, we're getting there, and the stack is getting much better. We're working with Strange Love, a bunch of other teams, to really start building up the IBC tech stack. It is, uh, it's gotten better. It used to be that my MacBook would crash like three times a day, and now it's down to like once a day. So you know, everything's getting more stable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, in general, it's, it's hard, like an example of flavor, something that's difficult. If you're an application that wants to serve other blockchains, you need to spin up two blockchains m at minimum, and you want to test some consensus failures in those chains. You want to have three to four nodes per blockchain. Then you might want to also test like, oh, what, what if I have th two chains I'm serving? Because in edge case, I don't c c get with just one chain. I'm up to running like 12 nodes on one machine, and there's no good framework to do that right now. You have to kind of build this all up from the ground up. I think it's getting more productionalized, but it's very early. Can I ask a question to you? How, does, how do you think Somalia fits into the whole interchain DeFi stack? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So, thank you <laughs> for letting me talk about Somalia. You're Som. like itching for it, I think. <laughs> um, okay. So, what is Som? Som is, is sort of interchain queries plus, or like not interchain queries because we do the computation off chain, um, but like essentially interchain accounts for Ethereum. Uh, it's essentially been like the, the, the base model of like what we've built for Sommelier, which is like you want to have a contract, you want to have a vault on Ethereum, which is controllable by an off-chain strategist. Um, we think that this model is like incredibly valuable, is like the right model for like, so like one of the things that I really worry about, which I've kind of been poking at in these questions is like accessibility of all of this DeFi stuff is going to be like a challenge, right? Like if, you know, Users are not, like most users are like not really capable or qualified or like on board with the idea of like wanting to hold like a really complex financial position, even if it like really expresses their intent, just because like the inner workings of that financial position. And like our job as software engineers is to abstract over that complexity. Like the reason why DeFi is interesting is because we could plausibly build meaningful abstractions over the complexity of like the underlying financial positions. So that's what we're trying to do with Sommelier, is we're trying to build these sellers that the seller expresses like some sort of user intent, which is, requires like active management and active trading, but like they are able to delegate that to the off-chain strategist, to the validator set of Sommelier, to like execute that intent, and then they don't have to be sitting there going, oh, I want to, like I have to like manually click through like, getting the staking derivative, sticking the staking derivative in this liquidity pool, taking that liquidity pool token and sticking it in this thing. Like plugging all of those things together and then rebalancing and them and changing them dynamically as markets is the problem that Sommelier is trying to solve. Yeah, I'm fully on board with your saying about aggregating everything. So like all these like layer one DeFi's are too complex and too efficient. So uh, this is like decision making for retail investors so too hard. And all this like aggregator for DAX, aggregator for DeFi, all this kind of uh, front-end uh, service should be provided, even like uh, connected to all this DeFi, so that yeah. the service can be decentralized one. So I think like uh, in Cosmos, this is also very necessary because users will find uh, more difficulties finding this new uh, opportunity in DeFi. Uh, space, yeah. yeah, I mean, we have a lot of tools in Cosmos that, like, you don't have on Ethereum to deal with. We have AuthZ, which, like, allows you to delegate accounts to, like, parts of your account fun functionality to specific users. Uh, we have interchain accounts that allow chains to, like, manip control funds on behalf of users. So we do have a lot of tools here that I think, I think, like, one of the things that, like, we can do is, like, we can both build these complex DeFi primitives in Cosmos and then use the Cosmos technology to also make them accessible. So, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
our ride. We'll see you guys back here again at 11, 10 a.m. We have Sip Chain up next. Uh, please check out the Persistence uh, Networking Lounge upstairs. Um, you guys head out to these doors and see a sign that points you in the right direction. They got some really good cold brew. Oh, uh, man, really good cold brew up there.
right, are we fueled up? Got enough caffeine in you? Up next, we got Jazir from Stiff Chain, CEO. Put your hands up for Jazir. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Excited to see everybody. This has been an epic Cosmoverse. I'm here to talk a bit about SIF chain. Um, as always, please be careful. We've got a nice legal disclaimer here. I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Do your own research. I always have to give the reminder there. Um, so SIFChain is a decentralized AMM um, built on Cosmos and it lets you trade between Cosmos uh, and Ethereum tokens, but soon we will add support for a bunch of other EVM chains. Uh, we were one of the first to do uh, Ethereum transactions, one of the first Cosmos chains to connect to IBC, so I'm really proud of that lineage and look forward to bringing tokens from the entire EVM uh, ecosystem into the Cosmos ecosystem and, and vice versa. Um, so the general problem we have here is, you know, moving assets from one ecosystem to another can be slow or complex. Uh, users may need to rely on centralized uh, tools or, or vulnerable bridges, which is obviously very rough. We've seen a lot of bridge hacks. We've seen a lot of uh, people pushing against centralized institutions. Um, so we built SIFChain, which um, has really solid validator architecture, again, from Cosmos. Uh, highly scalable, again, because it's on cost, and substantially faster uh, and cheaper than, than EVM uh, chains, of course, Ethereum, but a lot of other ones as well. Um, connecting to a whole bunch of, of chains, starting with a bunch of EVMs with Peggy2 soon, which I'll talk more about uh, in our slides, but uh, definitely other chains beyond that. Um, and then we sort of added uh, these cool monetary tools like margin trading or novel monetary policies, um, which I'll also get into more. But these things have really been, been great. Our, our crypto economists have led in a way that I don't think uh, that many other DEXs uh, or chains work on. There's a lot of stuff in distributed systems and, and protocol design, which is great. But we also really like to lead on the econ side as well. Um, and then a really great uh, developer and trading community as well. I think you know, no, no project is, is uh, important without its community. And, and we have one of the strongest ones, uh, probably because we started so early and built on such passionate uh, bases already. So just for context here, um, you know, across all of our platforms, we're, we're in about 100 different countries. I'm pretty big on Telegram and Discord and you know, 30,000 people globally, not to mention. Um, we have roughly uh, maybe the same or, or double the amount of, of addresses that are, that are active as well. So really good to see um, you know, that how, how SIFChain's like left its footprint on, on the uh, crypto ecosystem. And uh, also has been featured a lot in the news recently. Um, you know, with Entrepreneur, Cointelegraph, or the Bitcoinist, um, you know, these, getting, getting like these really major publications, I think, is a sign that, you know, the, the industry is recognizing SIFChain's um, power and, and importance in the, in the ecosystem. And we look forward to kind of, you know, continuing to be uh, at the cutting edge of, of uh, marketing and, and communications. Um, but I bring these things up basically to show the footprint we've left. Um, at the same time, it's really sort of done based on a roadmap. So for those of you who are not super familiar, um, you know, we started around early 2021, ended up launching SIFChain uh, in Q2. Um, then you know, we're one of the first, as I mentioned, IBC uh, chains to connect to Sentinel, Cosmos, Hub, Regen, and so forth. Um, then we ended up moving down to you know, getting uh, decentralized front-end providers, which I think is extremely important. I know uh, I've had tips inside of the Cosmos community and, and outside of it for uh, supporting um, you know, front ends through the community hosting as opposed to uh, you know, a, a core team. And so I'm, I'm proud to say that there are a bunch of front end hosts for the SIF chain um, uh, web application, none of which are hosted by uh, SIF core. And um, we, we definitely want to lead there. Um, probably will end up having referral systems or something in the future for, for these front end providers to, uh, to earn revenue. Um, and you know, we've, we've sort of iterated on rewards, uh, had a great SIFS expansion, SIFS ascension, these, these awesome liquidity mining rewards providing, I would say, some of the highest yield in, in the Cosmos ecosystem. Then moving on to things like protocol monetary trade policy, uh, you know, additional 
um, sort of councils that we've created between ambassadors and um, the PMTP council. We've got a validator council, the token listing council, these other groups that have taken on decentralized control of the way that the project works. I'm really happy to, happy to see that. Uh, margin coming up very, very soon. I had some good news on Slack early today. Uh, hoping to launch that. Um, you know, we were hoping to launch that sort of last week, but after additional polish, I'd say, um, fingers crossed, maybe this week, uh, but stay tuned for official announcements for, for an actual date there. Um, and then Peggy 2 coming out soon after, uh, current ETA is still October. Um, and then in the future, we, we want to do even more, right? Things like liquid staking, maybe an additional update for Peggy beyond just EVM chains, borrowing and lending or limit orders, and of course, Cosm Wasm support so we can connect to uh, all the other amazing chains in, in Cosmos, not just through IBC, but also through um, composable cross-chain smart contracts. Um, but I think our big sort of uh, to do at this point is, is margin, um, which we're calling DeFi with, with real revenue. So um, most projects inside of Cosmos on the DEX side and most projects, frankly, in the, the community in general and, and across crypto are actually focused on inflationary yield. And the Kujira guys asked a really important question recently, like, what are we going to do when we can't keep printing tokens? Like, how does liquidity mining work? I've, I've been really, really vocal about the idea that this um, DeFi summer era that was kicked off by you know, Compound and YFI and others kind of distributing tokens en masse, um, it, it's unclear sort of how sustainable that is. I know Cosmos people love their airdrops and so on, and all that stuff is great, but at some point you really do want um, yield that comes from uh, you know, a financial sort of product generating value, not um, to necessarily the distribution of tokens through inflation. And so uh, we, we are proud to be one of the first to release um, margin with uh, interest. And I'm sure you guys may be familiar with the interest uh, models for, for margin platforms. Um, we're going to have uh, Atom, ETH, Frax, and USDC uh, starting to, as, as, as like our first uh, pools. Um, but we'll continue to add additional pools over time. Um, and uh, we are starting with sort of just longs on these Rowan TCAN or TCAN Rowan pairs, but we'll definitely support uh, additional pairs like Token 1 or Token 2 or Shorts or these other like really novel things down the line. But the first sort of MVP, which may actually come out as soon as this week, uh, will we'll support longs for, for Rowan or longs for the other assets that I mentioned here. Um, and uh, yeah, as I mentioned then, it, it, the sort of the, the, the next round after that will be margin on any token. Higher leverage, we'll start I think with like 5x, but you know, our models sort of work up to 100x if we can get Oracle support. Um, so we'll be able to do that. And then I think a reputation system is super important. If we really did offer really high leverage, if the, the community voted for that, then it would make sense to make sure that people using that high leverage had actually built up um, a reputation for uh, succeeding in their trades uh, by, by starting at much lower leverage. So. Um, the thing about these these policies here, oh, I can't go back. Here we go. The thing about the thing about margin here is that, um, broadly speaking, um, you know, margin allows some a trader with high conviction to place a trade, uh, you know, expressing that that bet or that that belief, and they end up getting a higher payout than they would if they didn't use leverage. Um, but it still sort of leaves traders. I mean, we've seen sort of a, a, the vast majority of the SIF chain community, let alone a lot of other uh, DeFi trading uh, arbitrage type communities. Um, very few of them actually understand uh, margin or they're not sophisticated in um, you know, uh, f complex uh, analysis on, on these models. And if you've seen maybe something like GMX uh, recently, there was a tweet that showed that the overwhelming majority of money um, that was placed by traders ended up in losing positions on the GMX margin platform. Uh, like 95%, it was, it was really sad to see that like so many people putting capital towards uh, positions only to, to lose um, you know, their collateral. And um, you know, w there's no such thing as a perfect system. Um, you can't necessarily you know, ensure that everyone who margin trades is going to win. Um, but separate to um, our, our margin platform, we, we realized at some point, I think around maybe late last year, and then we implemented something in, in April of, of this year, that um, you know, the problems with inflationary uh, liquidity mining um, could actually be resolved with like novel other alternative monetary policies. And so we, we ended up building this feature uh, ratio shifting, which we used to call protocol monetary trade policy, where essentially um, the liquidity on SIF chain could be used to support um, the uh, sort of purchasing power of, in this case, Rowan, but it could really be any other asset. Um, and uh, so instead of using inflationary uh, liquidity mining, we basically were able to uh, drive value to our token, in this case, Rowan, um, at least on the SIF chain exchange as per you know, the, the wishes of the traders and, and the DAO. 
um, and, and, and yet still uh, provide some sort of um, alternative to just pure product development, right? The monetary policy, similar to inflation, it's not uh, a, 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 uh, an engine in and of itself, it's more sort of a, um, a change to the way the monetary policy, the, the, that money flows in the ecosystem. And, and this is really impactful. We ended up having, I think, um, you know, 70% price rise for Rowan over two weeks. Um, but this was sort of a beta or an early version. Um, what we realized is, hey, if you, uh, you know, release something like this, um, you know, if there's a, a crash, we actually had a market crash sort of in, in uh, late April, early May or so, um, that, that wiped out a lot of these gains. But nonetheless, 70% in two weeks, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty nice to see. Um, and we ended up doing um, this other, uh, man, um, we ended up having this, um, uh, this other sort of version of the policy that we call a liquidity provider distribution, uh, where with ratio shifting, you're essentially shifting the ratio of assets um, in, uh, yeah, you're, you're essentially shift making it so that a pool that was 50-50 becomes, say, 51, 49, 52, 48, and so on. And the extra value for um, the, the token actually comes from the, the increased weight, so it's a bit like levering the token inside the pool. And what we found is that people were thinking, hey, um, you know, this is cool, but as a pooler, now I'm, I'm pooling into a, a pool that's not balanced. If the pool becomes too unbalanced, that's potentially like kind of awkward. And so we, we kind of rework the concept so that instead of maybe shifting the weights of the pool, we simply take some of one token out. So here you can see the idea is you can actually take out um, some uh, Rowan while keeping, say, USDC in this case inside the pools. And then for the swap, the, the actual uh, liquidity pool, um, the, the value of the two, uh, assets will now change uh, according to the swap formula, but the pools actually keep their 50-50 ratio. And so we ended up releasing uh, this feature maybe a week or two ago and ended up going like, uh, as it says in the next slide, 88% in say three days. Um, but I think one thing that's really important for, for both of these, for DEX liquidity, for ratio shifting and for liquidity provider distribution is if there is this, this extra glut of, of um, value, either because the Rowan token has, um, you know, got an increased weight on the SIF chain decks, or because uh, there's additional Rowan floating in people's wallets in 50-50 pools for, through liquidity provider distribution, um, it's pretty important that we make sure that no kind of dumping occurs from a market crash. Uh, we definitely learned a, a very serious lesson in May. And so this DEX liquidity protection idea here is something where, hey, people know as they're watching, you know, trading activity occur, there's a threshold at the bottom for how much people can dump in any given, you know, day. And um, when we released, um, you know, LPD, uh, I think the policy was set to something like 7.5% uh, per day, but we ended up getting an 88% sort of um, boost over, over three days of the policy running. Um, and I, I think that maybe a, a decent amount of that came from people feeling more comfortable that, you know, this is a sustainable, uh, you know, growth and activity for, for SIF chain. Um, and so, you know, going back to something like uh, margin here, um, the, this is extremely valuable if you can say long a token where um, the monetary policies are set uh, to support that token. Obviously this is still sort of a free market. People can buy and sell and trade and unpool and pool as they choose. They can also trade, um, you know, Rowan on any other exchange that doesn't necessarily have these monetary policies in place. But what we found with our run of LPD and our run of um, ratio shifting is that uh, because SIFChain has the most Rowan liquidity and the biggest pool of Rowan traders, um, the uh, you know, value of the asset on other exchanges mirrors the value of the assets on SIFChain, which does have these monetary policies. So we actually think this can be extremely impactful for uh, margin traders because if they have some signal through these monetary policies, they may be substantially more interested in, um, in executing trades with us um, and uh, maybe getting a particular token that they have a little bit more confidence in for their trades. And, and in turn, that actually should lead to a substantial amount of um, uh, interest that they're willing to pay if their positions actually are more likely to close successfully, which means we could have, you know, hundreds of percents of, of interest or so, or even more in, in liquidity pools, uh, but again, without inflation. So we think this is extremely important and interesting. It's kind of one of those things, if you're not a math head, you want to see to believe. Um, so stay tuned for uh, the first version of margin with these monetary policies, liquidity provider distribution and DEX liquidity protection up, and then maybe ratio shifting in the future again. Um, so I want to say that like these concepts really I think are at the infancy of what we've been calling smart markets, um, which broadly speaking are DEXs with embedded intelligence to improve uh, cryptocurrency market outcomes. Um, so you know, an inflationary liquidity mining program is a way of saying, hey, yes, this project exists, but how do we distribute the tokens in a way that builds us a really solid community? Um, 
you know, ratio shifting, tax liquidity protection, these are other things that DAOs can use to appeal to communities and have communities collectively express their will and their desire. Um, AI has been pretty big recently for things like stable diffusion, uh, GPT-3 and so on. Um, and yet there's been a substantial amount of research for, for years about how uh, you know, complex systems, AIs or otherwise, um, can, can help manage markets. We certainly use them for, for some tools already, but embedding the intelligence directly in an exchange that has some bias as, as for whatever the DAOs want, that's not really something that's been tried substantially before, and we, we see a lot of opportunities beyond what we've already discussed. Um, a lot of the thinking here comes from uh, the Decentralized Autonomous Marketplaces thesis from Andreessen and Horowitz. There's also DeepMind that shared something called human-centric mechanism design, in which they uh, actually got a human uh, or a set of human um, capital allocators and also uh, like referees, let's say, uh, you, you can imagine it's like a government and also um, non-AI based uh, allocation systems and also allowed individuals to allocate their own capital um, all in sort of a public welfare scheme where you can give some money to uh, you know, a public system and then the, money, the uh, public system gives money out to, to all the constituents. And what they found is that the best allocator of capital actually was, came from um, an AI that they built. And it was a relatively simple AI, but that, that AI was able to outperform allocations from you know, the, the market unaided by an AI or any human referee. So this definitely leads to the, uh, you know, um, a thesis, I'd say that it's possible to have um, complex systems analysis used to uh, support, say, real-time dynamic changes to any monetary policy, whether it's inflation or liquidity mining or ratio shifting or uh, LPD or, or anything else. And so we can really see, um, you know, panics or, or uh, you know, all sort of market um, anomalies be resolved um, and, uh, through, through some sort of a, a base level intelligence. Um, and, and then we could even make it so that you know, market participants who are more informed, say analysts um, who, who do their deep fundamental research, um, can, can you know, potentially profit through, say, prediction markets or something else um, that are attached to these markets um, in a way that, say, your average sort of degen who's just looking at a tweet and deciding to ape in uh, might not be, be able to. So, so getting more fundamentals uh, to, to support the market as opposed to uh, mimetics or um, you know, short-term thinking could be, could be really powerful. Um, I also want to obviously give a shout out again to, to Omni EVM. Uh, we've been constantly going through testing for that. The Peggy engineer is working really hard, but the expectation is we'll connect to a substantial number of EVM chains relatively quickly. We're going to talk to with like quite a few of these teams. I know Polygon, I know um, Avalanche, um, you know, Ethereum obviously will be one of the first, Cardano, um, Near. I mean, there's, there's quite a few of these guys, although we might go, go, might go through Near through uh, IBC. But uh, my point is there's, there's been like a lot of these projects, Metis, are big fans of those guys, and then more that are not even on this slide. Um, connecting the two ecosystems could be extremely powerful. Um, so the idea is, you know, we, uh, the EVM sort of um, ecosystem, I'd say, is like collectively the largest by market cap and Ethereum obviously the biggest sort of individual chain by market cap. Um, they're really the only, or the main I'd say, um, alternative to, to Cosmos in terms of like having this, this uh, Block internet of blockchains thesis, although the EVM ecosystem was kind of created incidentally, not necessarily as in, uh, through intention, whereas Cosmos obviously looked to do it from the start. But either way, um, bringing those two ecosystems together would be extremely powerful, especially since so many chains are choosing to deploy EVM side chains or, or VMs of some kind. Um, so yeah, extremely, extremely excited for that. Um, and yeah, so that's essentially it for, for SIFChain. Um, you can always learn more by contacting us on Twitter or Telegram. We have a Discord as well. Um, I guess the last thing I would say here in, in uh, like uh, 30 seconds or so that we've got is, you know, we're really, I'd say, appreciative of, of like the community support we've gotten over the past, say, several months during, during you know, the market crash. Uh, but we've also had, I'd say, a lot of, um, uh, of, of anticipation for, for these, these novel features. And so um, I definitely appreciate people kind of being perseverant and, and uh, sticking with us. And I expect that uh, you know, once these, these new features come out, um, SIFChain will be able to execute on these novel missions like uh, smart markets or these novel monetary policies, connecting to more chains, uh, being sort of leaders. I've talked to a few people about IBC uh, over EVM, um, which I think will be extremely uh, passionate once we, or extremely cool once we, um, uh, once we're able to, to release that in uh, the coming uh, maybe years or so. And uh, yeah, all in all, uh, definitely thank you for having us here and uh, we'll talk to you more. We have a booth uh, if you want to learn more. Cheers.
How was that? Good? Hey, remember that exercise we did yesterday to get people back in the, in the auditorium? Let's do that again. So I'm going to count to three. On three, we're going to make a lot of noise, all right? Just whatever you can. Just make a ton of noise. One, two, three. <laughs> Woo! There we go. One more time. One more time. Ready? One, two, three. Woo! All right, all right. Awesome, awesome. Up next, we're going to learn about Ignite. Uh, speaking, we have Dennis Fadiv, creator of Ignite. Welcome to the stage. Hey, Cosmoverse. So, yeah, my name is Dennis. I am a core contributor to Ignite. What is Ignite? Basically, Ignite is a team that built Ignite CLI, which is the go-to developer tool for building Cosmos blockchains. And we're also have, uh, we also have an accelerator program, so if you're interested in that, please visit our booth. Ignite CLI has been around for over two years now and has been used by dozens of projects in production and hundreds, maybe even thousands of projects um, when developers just experimented with, with Cosmos SDK. The initial mission, and we're still, we still have this mission, was to lower the barrier to entry for developers, make it as easy as possible to build Cosmos blockchains. So Ignite is very featureful. It's a simple binary, single binary that you install in your machine. It can scaffold code and can add functionality to your blockchain. It has hot, re hot reloading, so it can serve your blockchain locally. It can generate clients, TypeScript clients, Go clients for your chain. And it's built with Cosmos SDK, and it's built for Cosmos SDK. So once we built Ignite and we got very positive feedback and we got developers to use it to build blockchains, we realized what would be the next problem to solve, what is the next interesting challenge, and we realized that after making it easier for build, uh, building blockchains, um, the next step is making it easier to launch chains. And that's exactly what we focused on. Launching chains is difficult. First, finding validators is challenging. Um, many chains have launched over, um, over the years, but all chain launches share the similar challenges. You need to convince validators, you need to find them, you need to explain them the process of how to launch your chain. And f sovereign chains, we believe in sovereign chains. We think it's crucially important for Cosmos to be the main platform for dApp developers who want their chain to be a sovereign chain, right? But right now, it's still very, very difficult. The next problem is coordinating the genesis. So those of you who launched chains before know that this process is very tedious, very error prone. If you're an experienced developer, you might go through it without any issues. But many validators are not experienced developers. They make mistakes. And we realized that. We tried launching chains for development purposes many times. And it's, it's very difficult. And the process is not automated. It's always ad hoc. So, so we, we, we worked on that for a while and figured out the best experience for this. And distributing supply is difficult as well, right? You want your chain, you don't want your chain to belong to like three entities, right? You want to make sure that you can, you have a lot of users, the distribution is roughly equal, and um, there are many validators, there are many users, so that's what we're focusing on as well. So to fix all of these problems, we built a solution, and we're going to announce it here for the first time. And um, it's called an Ignite Chain. Uh, it's awesome, and I'm really happy to announce it to the public after more than a year of working on it. Thank you. Uh, Ignite Chain is a blockchain built with Ignite technologies for launching blockchains. It's incredibly cool. It is very simple to use. It's very powerful under the hood. And in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to 
go through the process with you very quickly because it's just so simple and so powerful. So how chains are launching in Cosmos right now? Well, you typically have, when you want to launch a chain, what you do is you create a repo on GitHub, for example, and you put your initial Genesis file there. You tell validators to create pull requests and, and with their GenTX files. And this process sort of works, but it's very ad hoc and um, it's, it's not pleasant. It's not something you would do just to quickly launch a chain and see it live. You might not want to do this for your first test net right away, right? So it's, it's a very tedious, ad hoc, error prone process. With Ignite, we automated all of this and we put all of this on chain, which first of all makes the process trustless and easy to build on top of. And the second thing, it allows things that this ad hoc GitHub process didn't allow before, and I'm going to go into this later on. So let's see how it works. So with Ignite, or with the regular process, like the process is very similar, right? You have coordinator, um, it's a team who, team of developers, for example, who, li uh, who would want to launch a chain, and you have validators. So entities that run servers that are absolutely necessary for proof of stake uh, blockchains. So with Ignite, you have just a single command to publish your chain to Ignite. So you run Ignite network chain publish, then you pass a GitHub URL to your source code, and this announces the chain to the world. That's all you need to do as a coordinator. You need to install the binary, which ch takes one command, and you need to run this command, and that's it. Now validators know that your chain is available for them to apply for. So they can query the Ignite chain for a list of chains that are launching. And if they see something they like, they can run a command in it. This will initialize their uh, machine for, uh, to be used as a validator. You just need the ID of the chain that you're launching that you want to apply for. And the next command is join, which sends your application to the coordinator. So it's a simple request, um, re uh, request approval process, right? Validators request to join the chain, and coordinators approve their requests. Coordinators see these requests. They see the tokens that validators want to get for participating. They um, they see the name of the validators, they see the, their descriptions and everything, right? And they just approve, right? It doesn't have to be more complex than that. So once the validator set has been assembled, and it just takes just a couple of commands, right? A coordinator can run a launch command, which essentially freezes the information about the chain on Ignite, right? So let's say you're launching a food chain and um, you, uh, you assemble the validator set, you created the genesis. The, the genesis of this food chain is stored on Ignite. Not the whole genesis, but information about it. So it's very transparent. Once the coordinator runs the launch command, the genesis file is finalized, and validators can download this genesis to their nodes. And to do that, you just need one command. Since, since this process has been um, codified in, in the Ignite chain, it's not an ad hoc process. Like this all works very reliably. You just run one command. Ignite CLI knows where to go for the chain information. It fetches the data, fetches the final genesis with all the gen TXs with everything. It uh, add peers to your configuration file. It does everything for you. Of course, you can customize all of this, right? You don't. Uh, you, you can provide special flags, you can download the genesis yourself. That's also possible if you have a very customized setup. And that's it. Validators run their binaries and the chain is live. It's that simple. Thank you. 
I share the pain of launching chains manually. Like that's what that's exactly what we tried to fix and succeeded. So with Ignite, you can easily launch your chain. Like there is no reason why you wouldn't launch a couple of chains today. It just takes several commands, like literally. With Ignite, we also understand the process of launching chains, right? We've we've worked on this for quite a while, and we know it's never it's never about a single mainnet, right? Chain launch is always a sequence of test nets before you get to the mainnet. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's a dozen. And Ignite is built from the grounds up to support exactly that. So one of the first cool features we're adding, we've added already to the Ignite chain um, is tokenization of mainnet tokens. So we call them vouchers. Basically, what you have is a mainnet in the future, and this mainnet has tokens. But before you launch your mainnet, you probably want to have these tokens. You want to use them for something. Maybe you want to reward validators. Maybe you want to sell these future tokens, but you can't sell them because they're in the future. They don't exist yet. So since Ignite is a blockchain, what we can do and what we've done is we've tokenized these future tokens and um, so they're like vouchers. You can give them to people, you can sell them, you can reward um, developers with them, you can do whatever you want. And you can do this for every single test net that you have. So that's how the process looks like from a very high level. So basically, initially you can launch a test net um, that is not incentivized. The next test net might be you, you can incentivize a test net with existing tokens like atoms. This makes it um, easier for validators to trust your project, right? So the first test net was not incentivized. It was just a, uh, a dev net to see if everything's working for like the core believers in the project. Then you incentivize with real tokens. Um, and the more you spend, probably the more validators will believe that you have a serious project, right? And you can have multiple test nets like this. So as a coordinator, you spend your own money investing into this trust and rewarding early validators of your chain. And you can go through many test nets like this, and at some point maybe you want to use your future mainnet tokens, and you can do that very, very easily, again, with just one command by setting the rewards in vouchers. So maybe you want to dedicate 1% of your total supply of the mainnet for validators for this specific testnet. And you announce that 30 validators will be participating and validators can estimate their gains from validating this testnet. So that has been a very big problem in the past and it's, 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 it's been a very hard thing to do. You, you had to organize and incentivize test nets manually, right? It was very, again, error prone um, process that was made by humans. Now it's all on chain. You don't have to, as a validator, you don't have to trust someone. Um, if a coordinator announces an incentivized test net and submits tokens, they will be distributed. We are actively using IBC for that, so the chain, the test net, after it's done, it reports back to the Ignite chain the information about which validators validated for this test net. So you don't have to trust a coordinator. If they submitted the tokens, you will get them if you validated the chain. And this, of course, allows this voucher system that was only possible to do because um, Ignite is now a blockchain can be used for other things like fundraisers. So you can fund your project before it's live. You can um, use it to reward developers. You can uh, you can send the tokens to your investors. You, like it's up to you really what you do with vouchers. But the point is is that you have access to the mainnet tokens even months before your mainnet is live, which is incredibly useful and it can lead to a bunch of different interesting applications that we haven't even thought of. And 
the next thing I want to announce is Ignite Launchpad. So Ignite Launchpad is essentially an easy way for developers, uh, validators, um, token holders, anyone basically to explore what chains are launching from Ignite. They can, um, they can participate in chain launches. It's going to be announced, it's going to be available later, but uh, Ignite functionality that I've demoed earlier is available today. Thank you. So please join our community. Now that we've announced it publicly, you can see the source code of the Ignite blockchain, of Ignite CLI. It all works seamlessly together. You can visit us on GitHub and explore the source code. If you find issues, please create issues. You can join us on Discord. Uh, we're very happy to chat with you about the CLI, uh, of course, about the Ignite blockchain. And we want to get feedback, as much feedback as possible from the community to make this, this blockchain together with you and make it useful, make it, make it the easiest way to launch blockchains. It already is, but we want, want to make it even better. So all the functionality that I showed uh, is available in the Ignite CLI right now. And later today at 12.30, we will have a workshop. I invite all of you to join. Uh, we will be launching a chain together. Um, and I'll, we, you, can, you can see for yourself how easy it is. And it's no longer a tedious process. It's actually very fun. And the first time you see your blockchain live in like 15 minutes, it's unbelievable. Like you, you scaffold the chain with Ignite. You then use it as, as the project. Then you launch it together with your friends. And you have a chain running in 15 minutes in production. It's so cool. So I invite all of you to our workshop later today. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Dennis. Up next, we got Umi. And speaking, we have founder Brent Shu. Please welcome Brent Shu to the stage, everybody. Testing, testing. Awesome, really great to be here. Thanks for having me. Dennis, really awesome presentation. So, welcome to the Cosmoverse. Uh, my name is Brent, I'll be presenting UMI, and we are crossing the DeFi waves. So, the overall vision and mission of UMI is to bring the, the bond markets or the debt capital markets to crypto. And we'll be doing many different types of use cases and tools for bringing these, these types of assets into IBC. Because IBC, think of it this way. Uh, back in the early internet days, we saw TCP IP and OSI fighting a war. Eventually, TCP IP won. IBC is going to do the same. And we are fully behind this protocol and how it's going to support the adoption of crypto. So UMI is going to be focusing on three main avenues for bringing the overall debt capital markets to crypto. First off, is the UMI blockchain. This is the barn and lending hub. The UMI blockchain 
is an omni debt hub that allows IBC assets to be borrowed and lent and be used as leverage for different types of interchain DeFi protocols and cross-chain composability. We're also focusing on a native yield curve or a term structure of interest rates. So a term structure of interest rates is arguably the most important concept in finance. Because what it does, it's, it's used to produce your opportunity cost or the time value of money. So in Cosmos, we have a very powerful proof of stake rate. And proof of stake is the ultimate hedge against inflation. And it's the, per, it's the ultimate risk-free rate that can be applied to different protocols. We intend to use these base rates to build out a yield curve to price all of the rest of the crypto ecosystem. And third, we're working on this interoperable bond market. So connecting the bond markets to IBC, basically allowing different types of debt capital market primitives to interact with the IBC protocol and connect with the interchain. First off, big shout out to our core engineers, our product engineers, as well as infrastructure engineers. They're hard at work on a mainnet upgrade, and we will be bringing the flagship product for the Millie blockchain onto the network. Throughout our many test nets, we've had various great interactions. We've had significant support from the ecosystem. On the Arumi Mania test net, we saw close to 30 billion TVL, 20 million monthly transactions, as well as 120,000 unique addresses. Through this mainnet upgrade, we're adding SDK 046. We're one of the first teams to implement 046. We're also adding the latest version of IBC. By building out this leverage module, we want to connect all of the IBC assets in a borrowing lending ecosystem and allow them to interact with the multi-chain universe. A note on oracles. So right now, there's not a major oracle in the Cosmos ecosystem, and that's a problem. We know that oracles are one of the most important parts of crypto. Look at the March 12, 2020 crypto crash, where oracles went out of whack because of precipitating price decreases, and we saw lots of DeFi get liquidated with precipitous losses in the ecosystem. Through UMI, we're building an oracle on top of the blockchain. Validators in the UMI network will need to run an oracle module, and they'll also run an off-chain price feeder that's taking time-weighted average prices from centralized exchanges and creating different types of uh, price feeds for the broader Cosmos ecosystem. We want to utilize this oracle to provide the best types of data for all of Cosmos and IBC assets, we want to use uh, IBC queries to query information directly from the Oracle and just allow an ultimate cross-chain DeFi protocol for, for onboarding more assets. You can think of uh, our approach to the Oracle as a way to pr produce not just price feeds, but information feeds, uh, interest rate feeds, uh, collateral value feeds, as well as many types of data that can apply to cross-chain DeFi. Custody is also a major piece of the Cosmos ecosystem and the major piece of crypto. In order to get institutional adoption, in order to bring more value into the broader capital markets, you need a strong custody provider to understand Cosmos assets. We're working with custody providers to help them understand proof of stake consensus, to understand how to manage validators, and to understand how to be part of this Cosmos ecosystem as we see more and more growth. Overall, we want to support institutional custody adoption because we think that this will catalyze the next adoption of this multi-billion dollar network and just bring us to the next level. We're grateful for our partners such as Coinbase, who have been working with us on the custody side, as well as Pine Street Labs, creating their universal API, as well as CoinList, who's been with us since day one in building out this protocol. We're building out middleware universal APIs, we're building out um, MPC management systems, and just overall helping the development of the Cosmos ecosystem. So staking derivatives. Earlier I said proof of stake is the perfect hedge for inflation. And there's many ways you can think about this. Proof of stake is the, the, the preeminent way to understand opportunity costs in all of crypto. For example, let's take a proof of stake rate for the Cosmos Atom for one month. Apply it to two months, three months, six months, 12 months, two years, five years, 10 years, 30 years. And you effectively have priced the value of time using proof of stake consensus. This is very important because for financial economics to work, there needs to be an understanding of time value and how different assets are, are, are valued and, and applied in different discounted cash flow models. And by using staking derivatives as a way to price this time value, 
you will see the adoption of multi-tier assets into this space, and you will see more uh, uh, advanced borrowing and lending protocols being built as, as the ecosystem evolves. We're going to be allow, uh, allowing leverage staking as well as proof of stake assets for borrowing and lending on the UMI blockchain. And through this, we want to catalyze the adoption of proof of stake consensus to allow it to be known as a universal protocol that all blockchains should adopt. So, a, a note and uh, an anecdote from traditional finance. The mortgage backed security crisis happened in 2008. We saw a tremendous destruction of value. $50 trillion of value just disappeared. And the truth of the matter is that this was actually happening for 30 years since the first issuance of the mortgage backed security in 1984. This was due to bad debt. This was due to rehypothecation of the collateral. And this was just due to an overall broken traditional finance system. One thing to note about the recent crypto crash with uh, different lending protocols like BlockFi, Celsius, Nexo, um, Babel Finance, and, and, and others, is that there's a major silver lining. Even though these protocols or these, these teams had bad debt, everything was on a public blockchain. Everything was open source. And so it only took about two months for this whole crisis to unwind, and everyone realized what was going on. As with the mortgage crisis, it took 30 years. This is a major improvement to how blockchain is changing our world. Uh, and based on this, we want to provide good analytics platforms. So we're building Astrolabe inside of UMI. Astrolabe has been used to monitor different forms of supply volume, borrow volume, and just understand the overall health and monitoring of these different loans. And through building out these monitoring analytics platforms, we want to bring better transparency and just overall superior auditability of this financial data. Additionally, we're partnering with Forta. Forta has done a great job on Ethereum smart contracts. They're also looking at cross-chain interactions between bridges and ensuring that there is sufficient monitoring and, and acknowledgement of different transactions between these chains. These protocols will be the key to making sure that our future financial ecosystem is safe, transparent, and well-structured to, to produce more value and add more uh, forms of TVL into the overall blockchain ecosystem. So stable coins, one of the biggest parts of the equation as it relates to fixed income and bringing the debt markets to crypto. So Web3 infrastructure, that can include scalability, interoperability, and privacy, along with different debt primitives in the credit markets and capital market space, can be combined to form the future of the fixed income ecosystem and bring the trillion dollar value directly into crypto. We're grateful for you know, support from our partners such as MakerDAO and bringing DAI into the Cosmos ecosystem. We're also looking to support the USDCs and Tethers of the world as they bring more of their stablecoin market share into Cosmos. And we're also really grateful for all of the developments from the Kujiras of the world, the Harbors, as well as um, uh, Agoric, and building out stablecoins with the Cosmos ecosystem. And we want to see these stablecoins persist and develop as Cosmos is further developed, uh, further, further acknowledged by the overall blockchain ecosystem. So... The markets are always asking, what is the next billion dollar idea? The answer to that is generally either a, a new chain or a new protocol, to a point where we see sort of this arms race. If Ethereum is not you know, fast enough, try Solana. If Solana is not scalable enough, try Aptos. If Aptos is not usable enough, try Rollups. If Rollups are not uh, self-sovereign enough, try Cosmos. To the point where we see just so many blockchains out there, and so the real question becomes, what is the solution to connect them all together? The answer, IBC. IBC is the TCP IP of crypto. It's the only true layer zero protocol, and it's low level enough that it can connect with Solana uh, sub, uh, clusters, Avalanche subnets. It can connect with rollups. It can connect with ETH 2.0 shards. It can connect with any Cosmos SDK chain. It can connect with the BNB beacon chain. Uh, it can even connect with Polygon. We actually connected uh, UMI with the Polygon Heimdall consensus layer using IBC because Polygon uses Peppermint, which is a fork of Tendermint consensus, making that connection very easy. The point is there's 50, 60 plus IBC chains out there and they're all contributing to the interchain. Just saw a great presentation from Dennis earlier about Ignite CLI. More, more IBC chains will launch and we will see a further interconnected world. But we think that there's going to be a thousand chains in 2024. And what is going to be the catalyst to 
to produce these thousand chains? What is going to, you know, onboard all of these thousand chains in the Cosmos ecosystem? For the first time, we're announcing UDX. UDX is the lending DAO of the UMI blockchain, and UDX is going to focus on bringing the broader debt capital markets, the trillion dollar markets, into crypto loan by loan. So what's special about UDX? For UDX, every loan issued through the platform will be a blockchain in and of itself. Enter the loan-specific blockchain. By creating a blockchain for every loan, you can have three major components. One is TVL, uh, affiliated with the blockchain, can be used as collateral. As a blockchain gets more TVL, it will increase the collateralization of the loan. As the blockchain gets more IBC transactions in and out of the chain, it will increase cash flow activity of the loan, boosting the collateralization that you can uh, affiliate with the loan itself. Second, the blockchain can act as a financial ledger like a cash flow statement or a, a quarterly statement, something that showcases the health of the loan. You can use a block explorer to basically understand all the information entering the blockchain and anything needed to facilitate a better loan platform. And third is the blockchain itself is a special purpose vehicle for underwriting the loan, creating a new way to onboard new loans into the IBC ecosystem. Through this platform, we want to bring a thousand loans in the ecosystem, as well as a thousand new chains that connect with IBC. IBC is the new standard for value transfer. And by rebuilding different parts of the loan market using this protocol, we want to see further adoption of IBC, and we want to see the, the, the development and evolution of the IBC network. A note on Atom 2.0. So this was one of the, the, the biggest announcements in the space. This will also catalyze the adoption of Cosmos, as well as the adoption of interchain security. Interchain security is also a major piece of the debt capital markets, a major piece of the loan ecosystem, because for the first time, you can have cross-chain collateralization. All of the loan-specific chains will be consumer chains of the UMI network, and these chains can be used as collateral for other types of borrowing and lending that happen throughout UMI. Through allowing interchain security through Cosmos, we want to create new cross-chain collateral and new uses of chain protocols as they help with the building of, of different debt foundations. Additionally, UDX will catalyze the adoption of the UMI token. The UMI token will be used as a collateralization factor and will help improve overall collateral as you stake UMI tokens. Additionally, UMI tokens will be used as an insurance by you being used as a, uh, as a backstop for different types of Debt, uh, debt primitives. We want to create different, um, different insurance backstops to prevent further defaults and better catalyze the, the efficacy of these loans. Furthermore, UMI tokens will receive airdrops directly from the loan specific chains, as well as value accrual directly from the protocol of the borrowing and lending that's happening. UDX will catalyze further developments of UMI and build out this network to, to further allow more uh, more forms of assets to join the IBC ecosystem. When you think of IBC and beyond, I want you to think about um, you know, IBC being able to rebuild the cash flow piece by piece. We want to think about loans being rebuilt as, as specific chains to, to further develop how, how we, we view this ecosystem and further develop how the financial market should be viewed from a holistic capacity. So I always talk about this vision, bringing the bond markets, bringing the debt capital markets to crypto. But what does this mean? We all know the bond markets are the biggest, one of the biggest, if not the biggest market in the world. And we want to catalyze this adoption piece by piece, starting from the leverage module, allowing different forms of borrowing and lending between IBC assets, allowing leverage of IBC tokens in the broader cosmos worse as well as combining this with staking curves, combining this with proof of stake consensus, allowing proof of stake to be this new benchmark for how value should be accrued in the network. This will catalyze further, further interactions between, between IBC networks, as well as proof of stake protocols. And by adding the concept of the bond market directly into this protocol, you see an overlay of technology for how we should be viewing the future of financial development. Ultimately, we want to rebuild the bond markets, but eventually we actually want to be bigger than the bond market because, you know, 
those markets are one of the most opaque, non-transparent ecosystems in the world. But by bringing everything open source, by bringing everything on a public blockchain, and by connecting everything with IBC, we will build a better market for the future generations to come. And we will be evolving as a, as a, as a universal uh, capital market debt hub, and we will be providing a broader Omnidex, uh, Omni debt hub perspective to how folks are reviewing the development of cross-chain DeFi. I'm Brent Chu. Thank you so much for your time. That was exciting. Thank you so much for the good vibes. <laughs> well, our next speaker is, is ready? Is he ready? Let's see. Almost there. A little bit more noise, please. <laughs> yeah. Suspense, you know. Okay, so Jose Maria Macedo from Delphi Labs, welcome. Thank you. So, I gotta click to get the presentation going. Yeah, there we go. Oh, cool. So, before we start, just a quick intro. I'm Jose from uh, Delphi Labs. Some of you might know us from, so Delphi has three different divisions. We have research, where we do research on the space, uh, and then we have venture fund, which is prop capital, and we have labs, where we, we build stuff. So labs started off actually as doing mechanism design for a bunch of different protocols that you might have heard of, like Aave and Compound, Synthetics, Axie Infinity, and that's kind of how we learned, learned, our, our, learned the ropes. And at some point, we realized we'd built a really good team. We had a lot of views about how DeFi should be built. And we wanted to actually go in and uh, build stuff from scratch. So uh, we kind of started be becoming more like a protocol R&D lab. Um, yeah, there's a legal disclaimer before we start. These are ideas for things that we might build. There's no guarantee that we will build them like this or they'll work exactly as expected. And it's not an offer to buy or sell tokens. And also, Mars is not trading, so please do not ape the random Mars token, because that's not us. And uh, yeah, so cool. So Delphi Labs, we, um, there we go. So we started off um, building and contributing to protocols on Terra, most uh, rest in peace, um, most notably Mars and, and Astroport. Um, and so obviously after the collapse, we had a big um, sort of period of reflection where we went back to first principles and thought through why does crypto matter? Like, why are we all here? Why are we building? What does the end game UX look like? Um, and how can we contribute towards it, right? So in this talk, I want to kind of take you through that process for us. It's going to start with why we think crypto matters, um, and then how, what we think the end game UX looks like, um, how we think Mars can, can contribute towards it, and why we, chose, why we chose Cosmos. All right, so to start with why crypto matters. So, from our perspective, crypto is um, uh, freedom tech disguised as a get-rich-quick scheme, right? And for most people, even some people in crypto, they don't see past the get-rich-quick part. But in our perspective, crypto exists to empower individuals against corporations and nation-states and give them back control of their finances and eventually of their data, of their identity, of their social graph, right? Um, and I think as globalization unwinds, not to get too much into the politics of it, but as globalization unwinds and states get more PVP, 
um, that will become increasingly important and we're all going to be glad that we contributed to help to help build this um, yeah and so yeah but the, the the killer app though of crypto is undeniably speculation right and we have a complex about that in crypto um, but I think there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that for, for kind of two reasons. The first one is speculation is how all new tech gets funded, right? From canals to the railways to the internet, there's always speculative bubbles. If you read Carlotta Perez's book, it's excellent on this. That, that's how it starts. Um, and if it takes a few dog tokens to rebuild the global financial infrastructure, I'm okay with it. Um, the second reason is that speculation is a much bigger use case than, than people normally give it credit for. Right? We believe in a future where every asset will be tokenized, every single person is going to be an investor, and um, every, every, yeah, every asset is going to be tokenized, every single person is going to be an, an investor, and um, speculation is the way that we sort of allocate capital and attention to the narratives that we think are most important, right? and they're going to make the most difference. Um, and from our perspective, uh, like the trend is one way. We've already seen a proliferation of, of crypto tokens, right? From, from tokens representing governance rights to smart contracts, to JPEGs, dog tokens, membership tokens, um, you know, real world asset linked tokens, all sorts. And we're just scra scratching the surface of that. So, and DeFi for us is the global, open, permissionless rails that this new financial system is going to run on. And from, from, from my perspective, it's a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. And it's the core narrative and the core uh, differentiating factor for me for crypto. All of the narratives, NFTs, Web3, feed into DeFi and I think require DeFi to succeed for them to really succeed as well. So that's kind of why we focused on DeFi. Um, and now going into what we think the end game DeFi UX looks like. So right now, um, DeFi is a fragmented experience, right? If you want to trade spot, you go to Uniswap or SushiSwap or something like that to use Ethereum examples or Osmosis. If you want to do lending and borrowing, you have to go to Aave and Compound. Then if you want to margin trade, maybe you're on GMX or on Perp. But all of these are fragmented experiences, fragmented LTVs. And this is, this is not just like a front end and UX aggregation issue. It's actually deeper than that. Uh, because the, the big thing that centralized exchanges do, in addition to bringing together all these different DeFi jobs to be done the users want to do under one UX, is also provide this cross margin primitive, right? Where you can have all your different positions cross margin than one account. Whereas in crypto right now, you have to manage liquidation and margin thresholds across all your different positions. If you're doing leveraged yield farming, if you're doing perps, and it's, it's not only uh, a hassle, it's also very capital inefficient, right? So what do we think the solution to this is and what does it look like? So if you rebundle DeFi, so if you create a UX for people to, 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 to have like all their jobs to be done in DeFi, what are those jobs to be done? So Obviously spot trading, which includes the large caps like Bitcoin and ETH, but also um, new tokens that people want to ape, right? Token distribution primitives like LBPs, so the equivalent of Binance Launchpad. Um, that, that, that's important. Then there's obviously lending, there's, there's margin trading, there's derivatives, especially perps, and, uh, and which, which are arguably the, the crypto finance product with the most product market fit. But also, where this gets interesting is where you can integrate yield opportunities that actually aren't accessible in centralized exchanges, right? Because a rebundled DeFi experience can integrate all DeFi primitives, including LP tokens, including vaults, including staking, and include all of that into one, into one sort of account, right? Or into one experience. So how does Mars facilitate this? So Mars introduces uh, basically what we're calling a credit account or a DeFi credit account, which we're calling the Rover. Um, and how this works is a user creates a rover and then they can, they can fund it, um, similar to how you would fund an account on a centralized exchange. From there, uh, they're able to interact with a bunch of different DeFi protocols on leverage. Um, and crucially, so that they'll be able to buy, like go long and short tokens, go long and short different yield opportunities, do leverage staking, leverage LPing, all in sort of one, uh, all with one margin threshold on the account. Um, so what does this look like? So what you end up kind of having is this rebundled uh, DeFi experience, right? Where from a simple UX, users can uh, go in and interact with different whitelisted uh, strategies and tokens. They can trade them on leverage while having one the margin threshold on their on their account. Now each of these sub accounts is represented by an by an NFT, and users can have multiple sub accounts. So they could have one with a different risk profile, one with a with a with a more degen risk profile. The crucial thing is you only have to manage one margin threshold on this, on this credit account and, and you can interact with, with, with all of DeFi from it. 
And like the, the really important thing to, to sort of understand here is provided the chain is sufficiently fast and there are chains on Cosmos and with improvements to Tendermint, you, you can get it to that level. This can provide an experience that feels similar to a centralized exchange on all the key dimensions in terms of speed, in terms of the leverage available, in terms of not getting wrecked on, on liquidations, all those key dimensions while being non-custodial, decentralized, permissionless, and integrating with anything that exists in DeFi, right? So it's, it's very powerful. And then the other cool thing is these, these credit accounts, are these rovers are represented as NFTs, which I think I'm, I'm curious to see what the, what the community does with those. I think they could be an interesting identity primitive, right? Like these NFTs are gonna expose an on-chain net worth, an on-chain PL. You could do social trading based on this. You could fractionalize it and have asset management based on this, and they could also just represent kind of these on-chain artifacts, right? If you think of a, a legendary credit account that, uh, you know, a massive liquidation or something like that, or someone that held their ETH from, from ICO days and never sold it, these credit accounts will have like, they'll represent a piece of on-chain history and they'll have, I think, artifact value as well. So now the platform choice. So we, we kind of decided, we knew what the end game was, what, what we thought that, that the DeFi experience should be, and then we kind of went through and figured out where should we, where should we build this. And in order to understand kind of what went into that, it's important to understand our views on, on cross-chain. So I don't need to shill Cosmos to, to all of you, but basically there's kind of two views of the world as I see it. One is the monolithic view that every single dApp is going to exist on a generalized execution environment like Solana or, or um, ETH, and, um, and then the other view is the multi-chain view where effectively we're going to have more and more specialized app chains that, that like, connect asynchronously, right? And we very, we, we very much believe in the latter, obviously, but we think it's a trade-off of basically composability versus specialization, right? And the benefits of specialization, the benefits of having your own app chain, I'm not going to go into it too much because everyone here understands it, but it's you get to control your own block space, so you don't get things like an NFT mint causing your, your cost to spike and your app to become unusable. Um, and also you get to customize um, consensus and do all the interesting things that we've heard from all the different dApps presenting here, right? Whether it's Osmosis' threshold encryption, whether it's Sayer Injective's on-chain order book, all the different things you can do when you can, when you can kind of customize your chain from the ground up. And what you give up is that synchronous native composability that you have on something like a Solana, right? And, and from our perspective, what we kind of realized is that that composability is actually not that important for the majority of apps. When you look at Solana state, the majority doesn't touch each other, with the exception being DeFi, right? DeFi, you actually need that native synchronous composability, whether it's for rehypothecation, right? Leveraging up on, on, on tokens, whether it's yield farming, or just having a, a solid leverage trading experience, you can't really be waiting for, for, for relayers for when you're trying to like top up your position and not get liquidated, right? And so th these kind of beliefs lead us to, to, to this world of, uh, I really like Sonny's, Sonny's sort of uh, view on this of mesh security, right? Where you, you, you effectively have, um, you can see the app chains, like specialized app chains as sort of suburbs, and then you have main DeFi hubs that their economies will run on. So it's kind of like you deploy your app chain in the suburbs where you control your costs, living costs are low, and then there's high-speed rails that connect you to the DeFi hub, Osmosis being, the, being kind of the primary one, primary one, and, um, and your economies run on there. So in terms of what this looks like, so how, how should an app build if, if this is our view of the world, right? That there's gonna be these DeFi hubs um, and then all these specialized app chains. And, and for us, um, the key thing is you want to have standalone deployments on each chain because you wanna have that sync on each DeFi hub, because you wanna have that synchronous composability, right? You want to be able to, to, to liquidate, to pay down your debt, to do leverage fast without having to wait for cross-chain contract calls. But also, you don't want to have fragmented liquidity, right? Uh, and th that's really the key of, of, of kind of the Mars cross-chain design is the idea that we want to be present on a bunch of these, like Mars should be present wherever there's demand for leverage, right? And it should be pre present there natively because leverage requires that. And so we need to do that while trying to not fragment liquidity. And so this is kind of the design that, that, that we came up with. Um, so effectively, you can think of Mars as, as a, so that we're, the first outpost will be deployed on Osmosis, that, that, that's already been announced, and the outpost is sort of a native super app experience, right? So a native, the, kind of the UX you saw before is a, is, is a teaser to that. It's, it's a native synchronous super app experience where you can deploy the credit account, have leverage trading, leverage LPing, all of that. But 
um, it's connected to this hub, which effectively uh, the, the Mars hub will, um, you can think of it, one metaphor I use is sort of headquarters and branches, right? Banks or supermarkets, you have your, your branches where, where the stuff actually happens, and then you have your headquarters which coordinates all the different branches, right? You wouldn't go to like uh, Tesco headquarters and try and buy groceries. It, it's, it's, and that's the same thing with Mars. Nothing happens, no lending and borrowing happens on Mars Hub. What happens is Mars Hub governs all the outposts via interchain accounts, and shout out Larry who's, who's uh, pioneering that. Uh, it receives fees from all the outposts, so the fees flow up and get distributed to stakers. And then the last one, which is really cool, is this communication portion, where the Mars hub acts as a coordination hub between outposts to ensure that liquidity acts as one. And what this basically means is just, if there's more demand for leverage on outpost B than on outpost A, Mars hub will move liquidity from outpost B to outpost A, right? And so what you end up with is this really cool sort of liquidity network where Mars is present on all these outposts natively and then the hub is like shuffling liquidity around dynamically to satisfy uh, wherever the, the highest demand for, for leverage is. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the, the main kind of principles behind Mars and now we have a little video to, to show you, to tease, oh, one sec, damn. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of the main, um, yeah, that, that goes through kind of the Mars architecture and, and, and how it works, and I hope, uh, hope that was clear. I'll be around to answer questions as well if anyone, if anyone needs them. And then we have uh, a video of the UX, which will hopefully uh, get people pumped, uh, just a little teaser video. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for listening. Now, let's welcome our next speaker, Adam, CTO of Akash Network. An applause, please. Hey, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm Adam Bosnich, uh, CTO of Akash Network, Overclock Labs. This is my first time at Cosmoverse. I'm just blown away by uh, all the projects here, the community here. It's a really inspiring place to be. So thanks for coming. I'm really happy to be speaking with you today. 
Uh, a little bit of a background about Overclock Labs. We started as a normie tech company. Uh, we're a deployment platform we were building. Uh, the main problem we were trying to solve is we felt like the internet had kind of lost its way. Uh, originally, the internet was supposed to be like this interconnected set of independent nodes that could withstand nuclear blasts, all that thing. It was decentralized. But what had happened with the move to cloud is that much of the hosting had been centralized into a few, few, you know, small number of, uh, of large companies that were hosting the vast majority of the applications that uh, we all use every day. Um, very quickly, we realized, we realized we wanted a marketplace. And not only that, we wanted a, de a decentralized marketplace. So we found, originally found Tendermint. We, felt, you know, we built our first version on Tendermint. SDK wasn't available at the time. Thankfully, SDK became available. We rewrote it in that, and we've had our, our network available for about a year and a half. It's been live. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, the state of the Web3 infrastructure. Web3, actually, the, the problems we were originally trying to solve is especially uh, prevalent in, in Web3. Uh, it goes across the board, but there's a lot of opportunity in Web3 for uh, our technology. I'll give you a bit of a kind of a back, uh, overview of like the way it works and some of the ecosystem that's been built on top of Akash and uh, where we're going to be going from there. So the state of current Web3 infrastructure, um, I think as we all know, this has been a topic you know, a hot topic, the protocols themselves are extremely decentralized, but uh, the infrastructure that runs all these protocols is not. So if you look at Ethereum, like more than 50% are centralized within a few number of, of uh, hosting companies. Um, uh, similar with Solana, this has been a hot topic lately, as we all know. Um, and so it's like we have these amazing protocols built to like kind of empower individuals uh, and independent entities around the world, but fundamentally they're running on these centralized, centralized uh, hosting. We saw this recently, of course, with Hesner. Hesner just kind of basically turned off running, uh, running, running blockchain applications. It was a huge issue. Uh, we were actually pretty proud when this happened because Akash started, started uh, trending at that time. Uh, this really validated our thesis that Akash is a solution to this, to this um, infrastructure layer of what we're all building. Uh, we can make this thing actually be decentralized, not only from a protocol level, but from an from a, from a infrastructure level as well. Uh, so, yeah, there's hosting is centralized. Uh, as, as people have been moving to these big clouds, it's left all these smaller data centers by the wayside, these independent data centers. So it's like, hey, why, can't, why don't we just move to the smaller data centers? Well, the reality is that there's a, an enormous amount of friction when moving to these data, smaller data centers. First of all, you have to find them. So you know, how, how are you going to find... It's very difficult to find you know, any of these like thousands and thousands of data centers. It's difficult to find them. It's difficult to compare between them. The like the contracts aren't like on demand necessarily. They're longer contracts. Uh, there's a more capex. You might have to buy more at a time. So the the kind of ease of use of cloud is really powerful in that like you could spin something up and spin it down, and you only get charged for that. Well, uh, it, you could actually have better performance, lower cost on these independent data centers if only it was easy to use. And Akash solves that problem for us. One of the things about this is that as the move to centralized cloud providers has happened, these smaller data centers, they're still there, but they're, they're going down. But even so, there's still like seven, you know, seven million-ish data centers out there that can be used and for the most part are sitting idle. And so those guys are looking for distribution channels. They want to reach the demand. And we think the demand really should be reaching these independent data centers. And again, this is what Akash is, is, is here to solve. So let's talk about some of the other issues of the public cloud, using the public clouds. Um, you know, again, our thesis has really been validated recently by Andre and, and, and Jason Horowitz. The, cloud is exp the public clouds are expensive. And even Andre Jason Horowitz says, like, there's a huge opportunity in between the computers and the software that's running on them. Uh, and that's basically the layer that Akash is on. So we should be able to distribute applications, again, to these, these smaller data centers. The public clouds um, also, as it's become concentrated, they have a lot of power over pricing. Uh, so 
just to give you an example, we have a Lumen provider on Akash right now. They, say, they charge nothing for bandwidth. They're like, they have really powerful machines, really the price, price competitive, and they don't charge for bandwidth. If you're on Amazon, they charge a lot for bandwidth, and that's because they can, because everybody's started to move towards them. So really, there's a lot of reasons to, um, to, to try to switch away from these. Uh, we, like I said, we originally like targeting Web 2.0 co companies, trad tech, normie tech companies, but it's especially relevant to Web 3. Um, low cost infrastructure is really important for running base layer protocols that we all want to do because we want to have a, a broad set of validators, independent validators, and that requires it to be really easy for validators to come online. Um, so in order for these independent people to come online, it needs to be low cost infrastructure. You see this, you know, so there's some of these protocols, a lot of uh, 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 proposals on protocols to, to limit how to put a lower bound on the commission for, uh, for validating. Um, and that's primarily to make it such that like, the, the validators that are like really like pr pretty far down in, in the number can still pay for, the, pay for their base infrastructure. Uh, another way of getting at that problem is finding lower cost infrastructure. Um, so like lower cost infrastructure will get you more validators uh, and we'll have uh, less centralized chains. So um, yeah, uh, so the current state of things, Web3 infrastructure, is there's a lot of concentration on big clouds. Those people have the, those companies have the power to just turn off a protocol, essentially. Uh, and to fix that pro and then at the same time for independent uh, uh, validators, there's a like, high barrier to entry because the, the cost of infrastructure is so high. So uh, again, this is uh, a problem that we think Akash is really well poised to solve. And this is how we could reimagine things with, uh, with the Akash network. So this is a little schematic of, of uh, what things look like today. Like with most people, you can, you can replace that big top box by either Hetzner or AWS or what have you. But the, the reality is that many people are deploying to this small set of, set of companies who, uh, again, have a lot of power to turn things off, to ramp up prices, what have you. Um, ideally, you know, we're building decentralized protocols. We would like for there to be a decentralized set of hosting providers that we can deploy onto. So this is what it would look like. Users can choose between a wide set of providers. Uh, there's a lot of competition among those providers for pricing, for, for uh, features, for, for locations, what have you. Um, and th like, this is really what Again, the initial vision of the internet was supposed to be about. It was supposed to be decentralized. Uh, and this is where, again, Akash can really uh, kind, of, kind of put things back to where uh, the original vision for the internet and actually the, fun, the, the, the requirements of an infrastructure layer for decentralized protocols should be. So the Akash marketplace which sits in between the provider's supply and the tenants deploying people the demand for compute. Um, <laughs> so we've been live for about a year and a half. Uh, we've seen, you know, so just kind of just showing it. Here's a little slide showing th that, that things actually work. This is a picture from a project called Cloudmos, uh, who makes it easier to deploy on Akash. I think Max is here somewhere. If uh, maybe he's in the audience, maybe not. Uh, but as you can see, uh, you know, the, the, price, the, the, the price advantages have been, have been borne out. Alkosh compared to m many of the big clouds is reduced by like 85% here. You know, that fluctuates depending on how big of machines you want, what, many things, but uh, for the most part, uh, that thesis has been borne out. So with Alkosh, you have uh, lower cost, greater choice. You can choose between many independent providers, more self-sovereignty, it's open source, community driven. Uh, powered by uh, a decentralized network. <clears throat> uh, just one real quick, we really do call this thing the open cloud or the people's cloud. We think the internet should be controlled by all, of everybody, all the participants of the network, of the internet, instead of just you know, some big companies that, that host uh, almost everything. So it's a really big part of, uh, 
of uh, what we're about. So this is, I'll go into a little bit of the details about how it works, a bit of the technical aspects of it. Um, we built, we are, of course, open source, and we leverage a lot of open source projects. Uh, in particular, we really, we use Docker containers, which is the way that you know, applications are, the vast majority of applications are deployed today. A Docker container is essentially like if you want to run a web application or a blockchain node, an API node, a validator node, you package it up in a thing called a Docker image. That image can then just be pushed to many different, to, to an arbitrary, uh, you know, hosting company, and everybody knows how to run your application in that Docker image. Provi uh, Kubernetes is the open source way of orchestrating the ex execution of these Docker images, or Docker containers when they're running. Um, so we leverage both of those things. Tenants, people that are providing applications, package their things up into a Docker image. Providers, the people that are running applications, we end up using Kubernetes to run those applications. The way that the decentralized marketplace works, um, it's pretty simple as you'd imagine. A person says like, hey, I want to run, oops. Uh, I want to run an application, kind of describe your application. On chain, um, not everything goes on chain. What goes on chain is essentially like the resources you want. I want five CPU, I want 10 gigs of bytes of memory. I want it to be in this particular location. I maybe want it to have this, you know, ha be uh, uh, audited by this particular entity. That order goes on, on chain. Um, then providers are able to bid on those orders, and you choose, you choose a bid that you would like, you reach a lease. We call this the resource acquisition phase. So this is the marketplace part. Once you have an, an agreement with a provider, then you, then you send you know, your manifest or the rest of your assets to that provider to be executed. Uh, getting, diving down into a little bit deeper for people that, you know, developers here that are familiar with Docker Compose files, we, we, we got a lot of influence from Docker Compose files for how we configure these things. Um, so you could say like, hey, what app services do I want to run? Is it a blockchain node? Is it a Tetris app? Is it, a, is it, a, is it an API server for, for an iOS app? Uh, what resources do you want? Is it 10 gig memory? Is it you know, 16 CPU? Is it a half a CPU? Where do you want to run it? Do you want it on the east coast of the US, west coast of the US, uh, many other things? Uh, and how much are, you, are you willing to spend? So that's, that ends up being the ceiling for the price. Then providers come in and bid lower than that. So it's a reverse, reverse auction. So that's a little bit like tedious, dealing with YAML. People hate it, understandably. Um, but fortunately, we've had you know, just, uh, just an explosion of projects that are building on top of Akash to make this thing more usable. So the building on Akash piece is, first of all, there's Prater, who, who makes an amazing application for helping run providers. Um, running a provider is a, a pretty technical uh, endeavor. Um, and Trader has made it incredibly easy for people to create providers on the network. It's just an amazing project. Trader is also here at this event, and I don't know if, oh, there they are, over there. Yeah, go, please say hi to them. Uh, it's an amazing project. Um, then for, from, the, from the user side, from the tenant side, uh, from the tenant side, if you want to deploy applications, not everybody wants to write the YAML or use, like, frankly, a pretty crappy CLI at this point. People want to be able to like, do push button things to deploy. Uh, CloudMos, that used to be Akashlytics, was the first one, they just totally crushed it. So they do not only deployments, they do a bunch of analytics about uh, what's currently running, running on Akash. And Max, I don't know, oh, Max is over here, so please go talk to him if you're interested in deploying on Akash. It's an amazing project. There's a couple others that are coming online soon, Spherion and Vixello. Vixello has like a huge number of applications and they want to move all of them over to Akash. It's actually a really exciting project. Um, Moultrie Audits is part of this like, in the real world, like pre all of, all of this stuff, like in the real world, when somebody wants to use a data center, there's auditing of that data center. Like are people, like do outside people have access to the computers? What's the security model? How often is it set up? And we needed to model that on Akash. So the, the Akash 
uh, network actually has facilities to allow for these auditors, and these auditors can be independent. When I'm deploying, I can choose any number of auditors that I'd like. So I could say like, hey, I want a provider on the West Coast that the, this set of auditors have said, yes, that person is actually on the West Coast. And by the way, they're like, we rate them at a four out of five stars. Moultrie is the first third party auditor uh, out there, and this is something that we want to continue to grow. We think that there should be like a, a, a thriving kind of ecosystem of, uh, of auditors on the network, and this is something that we're going to continue to work on. And because of these, 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 uh, these platform applications, the, we've, we've seen a lot of integrations. Some of the applications on the, uh, 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 you can see on your right, uh, uh, you'll recognize a lot of the, uh, a lot of the logos. We plan on, we intend for that to continue growing. We've seen an amazing amount of growth in that. We've seen a lot of success in, in mining. Uh, so it's been a really exciting uh, year and a half for us. Uh, and in addition to that, we are finally, so our original vision was that we wanted to create, this was like, you know, way back 2016, 2017. We wanted to create a console to access this network of in independent data centers, and we are finally reaching that point. So we're in like a private beta right now. Um, in fact, we're gonna, you can get your hands on it and try this console. We have a workshop happening right now. It's in the sugar room. What is it? The Sucre room, okay. Uh, so please come visit us, we'll be over there. Um, get, you can get your hands on and deploy things. If you want to reach out to us, there's plenty of ways to reach out to us. I'm at A. Bosnich on, on Twitter. Go to Akash Network, you can find all these links. And if you have any questions, either talk to me offline, come to our, come to our workshop, or I don't know if we're able to field questions now or not. But. Uh, Two slides? Uh, the one that was shown, like, 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 Yeah, so the payment method in the token is from Akash. We have like the kind of traditional um, inflation model that many of the Cosmos chains have. Um, we're going to, you know, one of the challenges we've seen is onboarding providers. Um, and so we're going to be adding a mechanism to incentivize providers to come online. Um, so that's, it's, you know, as with everything, it's a work in progress. But fundamentally, it's like, okay, it's a payment token. Um, and we're going to be incentivizing providers as well, so like offering them uh, to, to, to help, re help reduce the cost as we're bootstrapping this network. We, you know, it's a very ambitious project. It's a two-sided marketplace that we have to bootstrap, so we have to like match supply and demand and kind of bootstrap it from there. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work over the past year and a half to do that. It's, it's very difficult, but uh, at this point, we're, it's like we're going to be start focusing on helping providers come online and bootstrapping them. Because we can find, this, we can find the demand, but um, getting, getting the supply on there we found to be a challenge. Prater has helped with this immensely, uh, but we still have some work to do there. Thank you all. Our next panel is MEV on Cosmos, and the moderator needs no introduction, so Sonny, please come. The stage is yours.
Hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> welcome to the MEB panel. Uh, you know, MEB, I'm, I'm excited to be moderating this. MEB is something you know, we think a lot, a lot about at Osmosis. Uh, Osmosis, before it actually became a DEX, we were actually working on like MEV mitigation strategies and we're like, well, we need a product here and that's how we build the DEX. So um, maybe we can just start with some introductions though from you guys. Uh, you know, Barry, you wanna go first? Sure. Um, hi guys, my name is Barry. I'm the co-founder of Skip, which is a Cosmos native MEV infrastructure team. We're working to basically build toolkits to help chains capture MEV design block space markets in the way they want them to be run and distribute that revenue to their stakeholders in the way they think it should be done. Hello, I'm Raps, I'm the co-founder of Mechatech and we work on interchain block space markets. Cool, um, maybe we can start with like asking you guys, for, for anyone who doesn't know, like what is MEV? Um, and it's also like, you know, I feel like we've uh, pretty well memed MEV as a word in Cosmos to be this very scary thing and uh, you know our team may have had a role in that. <laughs> Why is, is that the you know should MEV be a scary term? Is there is is there good MEV? Is there or is all MEV bad? No I think so the the, the scary word in MEV is extraction so it somehow conveys the idea that there is value in an ecosystem in a community which is being taken out and going elsewhere and sometimes that could be sort of represented in um, some kind of rent being extracted by a party that has like a privileged position. It could also be represented by the lack of competition in a, uh, in a network or it could be represented as additional infrastructure or operational costs which is burdened to uh, a validator or to a player to perform some otherwise essential role um, in, in a community. Yeah. Um, to back up a little bit and try to do the what is MEV. I think a lot of people have different definitions and most of them I really don't like. The one that I use, which is probably wrong as well, is there's like a black box basically that takes place between when a user signs a transaction and how that transaction ends up in a block with other transactions and how they're ordered. And MEV is sort of like the output of how we design that box. Um, and different designs, whether you sort of just have transactions first come first serve, whether you have some kind of auction system, whether you do something else, something on chain, you can end up with different people making money off of that. And in some cases that money can be sort of kept in protocol or in a community, in other cases it can kind of leak out. Um, and so for Skip, we think about sort of good versus bad MEV in the context of extraction. Um, and we, we really do see sort of a strong difference there and I think that's something that makes us different than most other MEV infrastructure providers. Um, I think front running and sandwiching harms user experience uh, on DEXs and basically every DEX I've talked to is doing things to try to mitigate that and so our view is user experience should sort of be the guiding principle that we follow and we should try to enable kinds of MEV that don't harm user experience and we should try to do things to disable kinds that do. Which user? Retail traders, the, the folks who bring liquidity, um, liquidity providers, folks who are actually using the DEX, who are holding the token. But how do you, how do you square that circle? Is it like if you sandwich a trade on a DEX, right, that constitutes a payment from a user to an LP. So the question is, in a community, are LPs represented? Are their incentives aligned? And, like, and how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you find that, that overlapping preference? It's a good question actually. Um, it constitutes, I think, part of a payment to an LP, but then there is a significant portion, the profit of that sandwich that often exits the chain and ends up getting paid to the sandwicher. Um, and our view, again, is like MEV is something where I don't think there's a right answer, right? I don't think there's a wrong answer. It's a question of values. Um, and we have to make sort of value-based decisions here about how we weigh LP incentives against traders' incentives against the incentives of market makers and sophisticated traders. What are some like, like so kind of like related to that, you know, I feel like, you know, if you, in Ethereum we've noticed something very interesting which is like 
the whole MEV game has actually brought so much like mind share to Ethereum, right? Like all, I know so many like builders who started as searchers and then got bored of that or got out, com put, competed out of that. And then they're like, oh, well, I guess we know this stack very well. We're gonna start uh, building stuff on top of it in instead now. Um, exactly, so like the whole MEV game can just be like a builder incentivization program to sort of bring people into the ecosystem and get them paid completely independently. So no grant, no job, no employment, no uh, uh, permanent establishment risk, just like on-chain activity that gets you into the ecosystem and creating value. And I think like to come back to what Barry's saying about like good and bad MEV, like we are very much not in that game of making that declaration at MechaTech, right? We know from the research that as soon as we look into the effects of even what is considered the most dubious kind of MEV, like sandwich attack, right? It does have aggregated benefits in terms of beneficial routing, so not just in terms of incentivization. So it is this sort of like weird space of overlapping of preferences, and one of which is like who can participate in creating that liquidity and, and, and getting that, that, that value. So bringing developers to the ecosystem, is it a tax on users? Yes. Is it worth it? I'm going to go ahead and say yes. I, I think that the, the actual... I would say that the, the usual price that a user pays, say 2% slippage or whatever on, um, on osmosis, right, is like, it's barely worth talking about, the 2% the slippage. I know on, like, on, on Uniswap or whatever there's huge things, but the 2% or whatever to, to bring devs into the ecosystem is such like a clear win. Actually, it might be the most effective allocation of capital, like better than a grants program that could be quite political. Right? It's like a governance minimized on-ramp for developers. That sounds amazing to me. I think viewing MEV as a way to get developers into the ecosystem is a pretty narrow way to look at it. I think it's one way developers can come into an ecosystem, but I think over the past few months and few years, Cosmos has not had a hard time getting smart developers into the ecosystem, and that's without creating any kind of social shelling point around the need to sandwich people or front run people or those kinds of things. Like there are other interesting things to build and when you don't allow those kinds of strategies, you know, there are also other kinds of strategies that are um, more technically interesting. Uh, but putting that aside for a second, I, I would also say Skip is not really in the business of making this distinction. We're a product driven company. It, this has come from dozens of conversations with validators and dozens of conversations with chains, including Sunny, where people have said to us, okay, yeah, we like MEV. We want to try to help our stakers make more money. We want to try to help token holders make more money. But our users are afraid of this kind of stuff and they're afraid of having their money taken, even if it improves optimal routing. Um, and I think trying to fight that trend is something we don't want to do right now, but ultimately something we would also be open to leaving up to governance. At the end of the day, like, it's not really our choice and we don't think it should be either. Yeah, I, I feel in Cosmos, we've, uh, going back to the previous point, uh, you know, the, instead of these searchers, uh, we, I feel like there's a really good validator to developer pipeline. I feel like valid, so many projects like, oh, they start by running validators and then they learn the stack and then they like start to like build stuff. So I don't know, maybe we already have a pipeline for that a little bit. Exactly. And I think the issue is that the, like, if you're, you know, a bottom 100 validator, so if you're like number 100, 120, or whatever, on osmosis, right, you're making probably about like 40 osmo a month or something like this. And at whatever, whatever price that is, that, you know, that's just not enough to even do things like participate in governance. You know, sometimes we think about validators and their, their economics purely in terms of like running servers, which is ridiculous. Like validators have an essential role in the political economy of, of Cosmos. And if they're, not, if they're making 40 Osmo, how can we expect sort of people to put in the time necessary to participate in that system effectively? So, Sean, you guys, Mechatech started as a searcher, in fact, would, would that be fair to say? And then you've pivoted towards building infrastructure now? Mechatech has always worked on all sides of the market, on the, the supply side, as in like selling block space, on the demand side, as in buying that block space and learning about that market and building empathy from that perspective, and then on the market, on the market intermediary, right, that mediates these forces, creates competition, and maximizes value for the ecosystem. So Mechatech encircles all those concerns. Can you guys maybe 
compare and contrast like how how does Skip and Mechatech differ in how they approach MEV on in Cosmos in general and then maybe also on Osmosis specifically? Well, I think like Mechatech is like a very much builder oriented organization. So we just like went ahead and build it. So we have a market that's live running with validators on Osmosis today. You can go to mecha.tech and you could read the documentation, you could integrate, we're probably gonna have around 10 to 15 validators. As soon as like this conference nonsense is done and people get back in front of laptops, I think you're gonna see uh, a lot more voting power go through our system. We also operate searchers um, that essentially generalize back running to center, actually incentivize real validators with real revenue. And then we take a cut of the profit, which we use to just redelegate to the validators that help us. So we kind of like make some money and then we lend that back out to the community so that all their profits are sort of incentive aligned with the overall growth of the ecosystem. So that's what Mechatech is doing. I, I won't speak first, yeah. Yeah, I think we've taken a very different approach with respect to osmosis as well as sort of the block space market that you guys have created in general. So your solution is very similar to out of protocol PBS in Ethereum. We actually believe that Cosmos needs a Cosmos native solution. There's a lot that you can do with Tendermint and the Cosmos SDK and ABCI++ that isn't captured by that solution. And so over the past few months, we've been talking to Sunny, talking to validators in Osmosis and have developed a module that will be launching on chain that will capture back running MEV revenue for the Osmosis community in a way that is fully audited, fully visible, um, and can be reviewed by everyone and allows the community to decide, okay, where do we actually want this money to go? How much of it should go to Skip for providing the services and how much of it should go to LPs or the folks actually being back run or stakeholders and token holders? So I think this sort of does capture the main difference between us, which is we're trying to actually go out and figure out what do people need and then look at Cosmos and say, okay, what are the solutions we can build here that you couldn't build in Ethereum? Yeah, just to summarize, I think the biggest difference between Skip and MechAttack is like, we did not go through governance. We did not wait. We did not ask for permission. We just built it. And we're relying on the free market to maximize that value. So no governments, we don't know the price. Like our searchers that do back running participate in an open API that could get front run, that could get outbid. Actually, we hope they do get outbid. If someone outbids our searcher, that means that more value is going to the validator, right? So that's a, that's a free market sort of approach to this problem, government's minim minimized. So it, it would be fair to say, like, the distinction is uh, Skip is taking a very on-chain approach while Mechatech is taking a more off-chain approach? Well, I think, okay, oh yeah, so I think what Barry said made a lot of sense that I think we do need some, like, Cosmos native facilities. So like right now, the actual implementation is like we just fork Tendermint. So all, everyone that, uh, the two founders of Megatech used to work on Tendermint, so we know the code base very well. So we just kind of, kind of made a minimal patch to enable PBS, right? Uh, but it's kind of a pain to maintain. So what we're going to do is we're going to upstream those changes in a native builder module that will, pro will provide sort of an open API that anyone can compete with us or, or anyone else, right, to choose the most profitable block from an open network. And that will be a native module. So one, Mechatech won't need to maintain it. I like that. Uh, and, and, and two, it'll provide sort of like competition all the way at the edge of the validator, you know, and minimize that integration. Um, that's a good point. So... Skip is also working on upstreaming Tendermint changes. We're working with you guys, with Marco, with the SDK team to try to figure out, okay, what is the best in protocol way to do this in the long term? In the short term for other chains, so outside of Osmosis, we're working with Evmos, Juno, Terra, a couple others that are not yet announced that have more generalized chains where maybe in chain, uh, in protocol arbitrage capture doesn't make the most sense. And there we also have a custom version of Tendermint. Ours is quite different. So it, it doesn't actually just import out of protocol PBS and force validators to sign blocks sight unseen. What it does is it relies on completely native P2P gossiping mechanisms that are already in Tendermint, doesn't require validators to make any new security assumptions, doesn't require them to sort of change their key signing, and is sort of easier to integrate as a first step, but as a downside potentially, or maybe as an upside, is less expressive. So we don't build a whole block. We just run an auction to help build a few 
transactions at the top of the block, and then we let the validator build the rest of it. And that way, even if folks don't trust us, we can't do anything related to censoring or anything malicious. And we can ship bundles that are small enough to show people, hey, we're not sandwiching or front running your users and build that trust. So yeah, it, with Skip, you guys are like making the explicit like requirement that you can't, like people can't use it for like front running or like sandwiching. How, how do you do that? So it has to do with the kinds of bundles that we allow. So in theory, you know, you could still probabilistically try to front run someone using the public mempool and we don't deal with that. But in when you're submitting bundles to our infrastructure, we basically ensure that the person who's submitting the bundle has signed all of the transactions in that bundle after the first one they didn't sign. So you can only put your transactions after other folks' transactions in our bundles. You, so, uh, Sean, you mentioned that you guys have about like 10 to 15 validators run on Osmosis running this. Is it, is it, is the list of validators right now public? And do you, is it important for like validators to be transparent about? What I think they should absolutely be transparent, and they should be governed by their um, by their delegators, right? So I think it's com the system is completely opt-in, and the idea is that we are not going to be the only builder. So our our, our philosophy is that. The best thing that is going to aggregate the most amount of value is going to be a competitive market. So we cannot be the only builder. There must be other builders that operate with different theses, like in the same way that like BlockX Route has a builder in, in Ethereum. It has like an ethical builder um, that you know sometimes wins blocks. And this, of course, ensures that no one builder can sort of censor the entire network. As long as there's choice, we don't really have to worry about censorship, censorship at that level. Um, and I think that validators will sort of, the, the goal, right, is not only to maximize the revenue for large validators, but it's specifically to equalize the revenue for small validators, right? So if you have a big validator who sort of vertically integrates, like if we move MEV to the consensus layer, where it's like about, about doing it right, then big validators are going to have a disproportionate advantage. Small validators are not going to do this. And the thing about most Cosmos networks, and uh, including Osmos, is that like, Big validators have a tendency to vote less. Like they, they vote more conservatively. They represent sort of a larger uh, delegation of people and can be less, let's say, engaged in, in taking the risk necessary to move the ecosystem forward. So we're, we're trying to fix this by making sure that every validator can, can sort of opt into sort of proportionate um, uh, uh, amounts of revenue without sort of taking this risk for censorship. And, and I think we've done this. I think Skip has completely the same point of view that you need a competitive market for these kinds of things. I think on the flip in the case of osmosis, I think you end up with a more expressive um, kind of protocol value capture when you put it in chain. If generally like my personal point of view, and it's not really speaking for Skip, is like if something can be in protocol, like if it's technically feasible to put it in protocol, it probably should be so that it's treated just the same as anything else and it's not some sidecar thing that's attached and is some potential cartelization risk, um, which is why I think upstreaming a builder module in partnership with you guys will be exciting. But I think it's also why we're experimenting with this on-chain approach first with Osmosis, because Sunny and the team have been sort of so open to that experimentation. And we'll see how it goes, right? Um, we're going to see how governance actually wants this money to be distributed. I suspect it won't be that large validators end up with more of it. And actually, because it's in protocol, you could have a system where folks decide, actually, the smaller validators who are getting less revenue regardless should take a larger portion of this revenue so that we can equalize some of that. Um, and that can be voted on in chain. But the, the thing about doing anything in protocol is, is not the question of like what's in protocol. It's a question is what is out of protocol. So if you have, what we're talking about is like designing a mechanism, whether it's like a skip mechanism for the block space or a mechatech mechanism for the block space, the question is not how much is extracted, the question is how much is aggregated, how much of the total value is actually captured by the mechanism. So if we say like, oh, let's put like, I don't know, a searching algorithm in every validator and it could only do two swaps or two skips or two levels or whatever because you just have a limited amount of space or like low specialization, that means that there's going to be money outside of protocol that anyone could capture, right? So if the, if the solution space is like valued at like how much of it is captured by, by the validators, it, it is somehow a superset of what is in the protocol and out of protocol that matters. So I guess related to this, how, 
How do both of your solutions change once threshold decryption is like live, right? And you know, we have like most user transactions are encrypted uh, in the mempool. Is, does that, what happens to that value? Does that value like get given back to users or do you think, like, yeah, how, how do your systems? I think either way, most of the value is going to, in a competitive market, no matter what the mechanism is, the core of it is how competitive it is. That means that how much sovereignty, how much agency does the validator have to make a choice over what it proposes and, and how many things does it have to choose from. Insofar as it is a competitive market, you're naturally going to see the margins of searchers get squeezed by that competition. And that's the kind of outcome that we're looking for no matter what uh, encryption or whatever is on the other side of that. Yeah, so I think for us, it's a lot simpler. Uh, once we have threshold encryption, actually what Skip is doing now, which is back running every transaction in the chain on behalf of the Osmosis protocol and giving that money back to Osmosis users is going to be easier because we don't have to worry about searchers capturing um, back running opportunities from unconfirmed transactions in the mempool. We can actually just run a convex optimizer in chain at the start of every block and find the global clearing prices for assets on osmosis, which I think is pretty cool, and then give all that money back to uh, stakeholders. And in terms of competition, I don't actually think that this is um, in conflict with competition in any way, because you can pair this system with an in-protocol auction system. And then as much as it can be in protocol, you can also control where the revenue of that auction goes, which is another cool thing. Um, so you can have in-protocol competition as long as you can have it sealed bid. And if we, if we have threshold encryption, I think we can really get there. So I'd, I'd push back on the notion that putting things in protocol is anti-competitive, and I'd, I'd suggest more that it's um, more about having control and visibility into where the proceeds from the competition go. But here's exactly how it's anti-competitive. If I'm a searcher and I run a GPU, I'm gonna find more opportunities faster than you, okay? If I do it off-chain. I just need to run it on one node, specialized for exactly that purpose. If we move that in protocol, it means that every validator essentially becomes Solana. You can still bid in protocol. You can just submit your transaction in protocol and try it. And if, if we just decide with osmosis and with the community that we want to put that above our convex optimizer, great, let's do that. But you back run everything, but who are, are you open to being front run is my question. So I, Yes, I, I, <laughs> if that's what the osmosis community wants. Um, again, we don't care so much about the details and more about the alignment. So I would say like the back run ARBs are, you know, that from my opinion, how I see it is because this is all using information that is completely on the osmosis chain, I feel that is like something that the chain can do. Uh, and I don't think that the, you know, it, it's not going to be the perfect ARB, right? We don't want to spend too much compute cycles on that, right? But if we can capture 50, 80% of it, and then let off-chain searchers capture the rest, right? So I think these things are in uh, conjunction. I think the real place where the auction really comes in is when you have things related to off-chain information, like if you're arbing prices against a centralized exchange, right? Uh, there's no way the osmosis like chain can know the right arbs to do, right? And that's where that comes in. But I guess I don't understand why a searcher who could front run the system would leave anything left. So if you're like on the tail end, so you get the, the bottom of the block, something else gets the top of the block, what's the incentive for leaving anything at all? So I, I, I think maybe it's a question of like whether you view it as there is a fixed amount of opportunity uh, or not. And I think sort of just like looking at how traditional finance has evolved over time since that's my background for better or worse. What you see is people exploiting information asymmetry advantages at very high frequencies and lower frequencies. And to Sunny's point, I think part of what searchers are going to be doing is looking at opportunities that fundamentally the protocol can't capture, right? Sex dex arbitrage is something that we couldn't do in protocol, or if we did, it would be extremely dangerous and we wouldn't want to do that. Um, or things related to trying to do cross domain MEV, where perhaps there's an opportunity that arises on Kajira and Osmosis, and you need you need block space on both. Again, we we couldn't do that. So I think I do think it's sort of like these ideas work in in conjunction. Um, 
and I think like it is very good that we have different approaches going about it so far. Um, and I think in the end you're going to have some combination, right? I think they can be good. I'm just worried that like putting more burden on validators to do stuff that doesn't generate value creates negative utility for the ecosystem. I uh, let's want to switch to uh, another topic, um, which is the Atom 2.0 white paper included this idea of a interchain scheduler, they called it. It's effectively a block space futures market. What are your guys' thoughts on, you know, do you think chains are actually going to use it? And two, how does this futures market approach differ to like more the just in time block space markets that both of you guys are building? So we're super excited about this. I mean, we've been going around banging a drum saying MEV is the best way to have financial sustainability and, and token value appreciation. And now to see Ethan and the folks at the hub get up on this stage and say, you know, we think MEV is the best way for the hub to uh, actually get Adam's value to go up is great for us. I think there's questions. I think so. I think we agree at a high level. Like this is a good economic direction for the hub to go in. I have questions, you know, around how it will work in terms of how do you resolve multi-dimensional auctions for different block space. Like how do you express those kinds of preferences? Do you build the whole block, or are we auctioning off sort of parts of blocks? And how does that all work? Um, and also, how much DeFi activity will there be on the hub versus not on the hub? But we're excited to sort of try to work to answer those questions with Zaki and the team actually building this and, and try to contribute there. And then on the high, low latency block space auctions, I think you need both, right? The low latency things are useful sort of the block ahead when you know an opportunity exists. And fundamentally, part of that is going to have to be on chain if you want, or off chain if you want to have a generalizable solution. But that doesn't mean you can't also sell block space a long time in advance at some average price and have these systems interact. So I sort of see it as complementary. Yeah, I kind of ag agree with what Barry is saying. It's like, as a, or I guess Megatech takes a very like value maximizing approach, right? So we look at everything incredibly critically. So it's not just this thing that we're criticizing, but just this thing in particular, right? So the, the way that you maximize value to a validator is by lowering the risk or like as a searcher, you're only going to bid sort of your risk adjusted returns. That's, that's the value of getting something executed. And there's a lot of things that sort of introduce risk, like time introduces risk. Um, adding randomness introduces risk, where I have to like spam a chain to get executed or whatever. All those things, in some ways, they, they may seem like they prevent uh, extraction, but they actually create more extraction because it's more wasted effort um, for everyone, right? So this, this idea of, of selling um, block space in the future, it means that there's like, so what am I going to bid on that block space? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bid at the point of like minimal information, some like pretty much irrelevant price, you know, some bottom of the basement price. And then the question is like, if someone, how long do I hold that future? Is it fungible? Can I sell it later? Because if not, if it's like locked in by the system, so if the, the ecosystem converges on this mechanism of which block space is sold once a day, it means the clearing price for that block space is going to be terrible. Right? And that means, again, that more searchers are going to go off chain. They're going to circumvent this mechanism. And then what is the value that's going to be accrued or aggregated to the stakers at that point? So I think the mechanism has, has, has a, a little while to go before it's sort of incentive compatible with, with where we see the ecosystem going. Yeah, that's you sort of the area I think we'll play a part in, in terms of like figuring out what's a fair clearing price and potentially competing there and then sort of aggregating demand for searchers where we'll like in real time sell block space back to them, sort of cut up um, in a way that's off chain but still drives value on chain. So I, I think like you're completely right. It's incentive incompatible right now and I sort of hope that what Skip and Mechatech are about is like making it incentive compatible. I mean, I'll buy it for cheap. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, <laughs> I'll, I'll, buy, I'll buy it for cheap, but then yeah. we're a centralized party. You know, we're, we've been in the market for, for, for nine months now, and it seems like counterintuitive, but what we want is more, more people and take it, like, we want the capital requirement for participating in the network to be as low as possible. That's what's going to maximize value. And yeah. so even though it benefits us, you know, I don't think it benefits the kind of world we want to see. Yeah. I guess 
uh, one last question would, would be like, will chains opt into using like something like the Atom 2.0 scheduler versus, you know, Osmosis is building it into the Osmosis protocol. Wouldn't all chains want to like build it into their own protocols? But what is this thing about all chains? I mean, until like, until Flashbots, we really believed that like, no one would ever run custom software. That every, every validator would like pull from GitHub and, um, and you know, and just participate, which I think had a stronger argument in Ethereum, right, where, val where miners didn't really play the central role that validators do in Cosmos, right? Cosmos validators are sort of like the, the bastion of voting, like they, they play an important role. So they have a, they, a lot of agency and also a lot of responsibility, you know? And so this idea that it's gonna be one size fits all for, for every, like the protocol is gonna act as a unified force, especially when we start introducing you know, ideas like mesh security, you know, where there's multiple participating in multiple networks, like validators are gonna do what validators are gonna do to perform their role, which is vote on governance. I think what you're, the question is sort of like, does it make sense for Osmosis or another chain that has a lot of DeFi activity to sell its block space on a market that other chains are also selling their block space on? And um, I think yeah, basically, is there gonna be one or is there going to be one market for block space across multiple Cosmos chains at the same time? Or is it going to be, be many parallel auctions running at the same time? And if you want to have win, you have to like bid correctly on both of the parallel auctions at the same time. So I think like probably, so there, there's two pieces to this. One, like if you can probably like the intersection of block space is more valuable than like the unions of it. So if you get overlapping block space, you're probably willing to, for two chains, for example, you're probably willing to pay more than two times as much for that. Um, and then there's also this question of like, well, if I'm a chain, then that's probably more revenue for me and that's good. But what token is that auction settling in and how do we decide? Like if you guys want your auctions priced in Osmo and Juno wants theirs priced in Juno, like how do we make a good user experience for participating in this auction? And then like, if we did have every chain running their own auction, how could we make a good user experience for like figuring out what to bid and participating in all of those auctions simultaneously? Um, and I don't have the answer to that question yet, so I think you're gonna see a lot of folks play with different models there. And also just like how revenue gets split, right? Like block space on Osmosis is probably way more valuable than a block space on a non-DeFi chain. How dare you? <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> Bias. Uh, no, like Mechatech will have uh, serialized execution across zones next year. Um, we'll be live sort of a single block space on Juno and Evmos and blah, blah, blah uh, by the end of the year and then we'll figure out the combinatorial auction bit and do that uh, next year. It's tricky but it's not impossible. It'll happen sooner, It'll happen sooner than you think and I think it needs to uh, to prevent a validator centralization. Cool. Um, I think we are out of time but I have so many questions left but uh, <laughs> thank you guys uh, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Been fun. We'll meet uh, back here at 2.30, just a little bit before 2.30, so we can catch the Chain for Energy um, speech. All right. Thank you.
As promised, we got Chain for Energy coming up next. The speaker is Dominic, founder of For Energy, Chain for Energy. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Dominic Scrabat, too early. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Dominic Scrabat and I'm the co-founder of Chain for Energy project. I'm sorry if it's not working. Excuse me guys, it's not working. Uh, no, yet. Okay, we have it. So, um, I'm here to tell a few words about our project, this is what we want to do. But at the beginning, I would like to show you a short movie that we have prepared specially for you, especially for this event. Oh, unfortunately, there is no voice. So what we want to achieve, we want to solve one big problem that is related to produce energy. Currently, as you can see, the, the energy production creates huge amount of pollution and basically destroy our environment. To do so, we have to change the existing status quo because we will face this kind of situation like here. This is what happened in Texas last year during the winter in February. 10 million people without electricity, heat, light. The costs are estimated to $195 billion only two days. The other example is India in 2012. So. That was really no joke because it was 620 million people for two days out of electricity. This is 9% of global population. Why it happens? Okay, basically, 
the energy demand is growing every year, 3% yearly. Now we have like 28,700 terawatt hours. So if demand is growing, supply is growing too. But unnecessary between supply and demand, we have very old, outdated, underfunded network that it's basically burning. This causes also additional issue. It's not only a technical issue. At the end of the day, it creates that this kind of network has to be changed. This architecture, architecture has to be invested. So it increases the cost of energy, create energy poverty. Even now, it's quite big. It's 11% for developed countries. And so what we can do? We have to support energy communities. We have to regionalize supply and demand. We have to minimize the cost of trading the energy. That's why we are doing web free zero marketplace for energy. That means that energy has to be supplied in the centralized way, managed in the centralized way. The supply and demand have to be re regionalized and supply have to be based on renewable energy sources. This is the only way how we can achieve net zero goal. So, that's why we start our project. This is what I'm trying to show you here. It's uh, this what was already done. Like, there is two ways of doing projects. It's like Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. So basically you are dreaming, writing a white paper, spending a lot of money for the marketing, finding investors and you're starting to do something. But this is the other way. I'm saying that Vincent van Gogh, because he has a dream, he woke up in the morning and draw it. This is how we done our project. We had a dream, we found our friends, we, have, we found the business partners from energy market and we create the product. We are, this is the stage that we have working product commercially with subscribers on it. We have mainnet that was launched. We create proof of concept to tokenize energy. And what is, what my guy said, what is the most important in this uh, slide that we are doing with Green Job for Atom Stakers campaign and uh, Alpha League is that the snapshot is going to be done tomorrow during Atom 2.0 reveal. What's next? This is our status. So we basically create a product, we found a business. We are right now building a security and we want to scale. So what, what we want to do to scale? First, we have to, of course, send a green drop. This is what we promise, fulfill our commitment and do IBC integration. This is the reason why we have chosen this super technology like Cosmos SDK. This is great. And we have a security. This we are building a security, as I mentioned in my mainnet. And when we achieve it, we are starting a staking rewards. The other rewards that we have it in our tokenomy is rewarding producers of the green energy. We have a specific pool that we're gonna reward all suppliers of energy that is based on the green energy, renewable energy sources. We are going to create energy wallet. This project is started and of course energy exchange for this is the base of the whole solution. Now I'm talking about tokens and I would like to tell a few words about token utility. What well, is quite important. Why to use Web Free Zero for for energy market? I'm just hearing this question quite often. There is a value. The value is diff different for different actors from the perspective of, of the market. There is a business, we create a solution for them. This is like a, 
uh, members of the energy sector based on the part of them are becoming our validators so they are buying tokens and based on uh, they can pay for usage platform with uh, with staking rewards and the same as with energy trading so they can trade energy via platform and uh, and pay for this if this is not tokenized energy with c4e tokens the other thing is prosumer search energy communities i mentioned about it that uh, the supply and demand have to be regionalized so this is the answer to have enough members that are able to create and consume the energy and some specific localization. That's why we are giving them a tool to support whole life cycle, starting from investment and finishing on uh, settlement and billing aspects and trading upside of energy for free. We're giving production rewards and we have energy tokenization. Be thanks to energy tokenization, we can imagine to swap energy token and go to energy supplier and basically use this, ask for energy that this token represents. And it can be done by swap, I don't know, via fr from atom to one kilowatt, uh, one kilowatt hour. <laughs> and we have crypto investor. There's some basic stuff like staking, LP farming, governance, and exposition to energy market so we are inviting you all of you to join our forces to become one of the member of our crew to join green energy forces this is our warriors that basically join us we are very happy to have it and we are counting for everyone that is going to do it Thank you very much. That was a very nice opportunity. Welcome to the Monastery exclusive community. Members will get access to Monastery Festival in Cartagena. Eligibility to own a part of Monastery. Elevate your networking at the Monastery Convention in Medellin and receive unique clothes from this collection, both physical and for the metaverse. How to enter? The key will be the Gyatso NFT collection from Monastery and RMA, an NFT based on the Ethereum blockchain technology. See you in Cartagena and inside the Monasteryverse. Go to MonasteryNFT.com now. Hello. Okay, so maybe something that you don't know is that actually in my profession, I'm a lawyer and I work for human rights because I really believe that this world can use some help, you know? Um, and then I started to see and I became much more passionate about 
crypto and Web3 in general because I saw that this technology can solve a lot of things in the world. And I'm very excited to see projects like the one that we just saw. And I'm happy to introduce now our next speaker, Gregory from Region Network. Welcome. <laughs> Hey Cosmoverse, I am so grateful to be here, yeah, yeah, all right, um, let's see, what should I talk about today, oh, I'm just kidding, um, all right, so I'm going to take everybody on a quick tour of Region Network, um, I'll start by telling everybody a little bit about who we are, um, talk a little bit about our role in the bigger regenerative, emerging regenerative finance movement, but also specifically here at Cosmos Phi, collaborative finance, what's the role of Regen in this emerging interchain economy? Um, and I want to take everybody on a quick tour of why regenerative finance, and of course, the big question that everybody's asking, when in CT, <laughs> when refi? And I want to speak a little bit about some of the road bumps that we've been experiencing, because I think it's, uh, it's you know, learning in public, building in public, it's important. And uh, then we'll take a quick tour around the marketplace. So that's what we're going to be up to this afternoon. Um, I may even be able to make a little bit of space for a couple questions at the end. Okay, so um, Regen, in terms of like, who are we? There's really two big pillars. Um, I mean, in addition to the passion that our community feels about planetary regeneration and the role of ecological assets in an emerging economy, we have a badass engineering team they're the technical leads of the Cosmos SDK. They build a lot of software that the whole ecosystem uh, ends up using. Um, and we also have engineering teams that work to build infrastructure for the United States Department of Agriculture uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture in Ecuador and in collaboration with research institutions around the world. So there's a set of problems that are both institutional and what I would say sort of core to the new institutions that we're building here in the Cosmos ecosystem, right? And those are the technical challenges of being able to anchor who is saying what about where, using what data and what methodology, ensuring that there aren't conflicting claims about carbon or biodiversity. Um, these are common technological challenges that we support a, a variety of different institutions and groups to help solve using the Cosmos SDK, which is kind of a cool sort of um, the future of the Cosmos SDK as this modular deployable state machine that is both crypto native and can be used in different con contexts. So, um, and then the, the other piece of our engineering team is, uh, or sorry, our, our team, our community is really science. Like we have an amazing science team. We build new methodologies for monitoring and measuring soil carbon or forest biodiversity. And increasingly, our science team is building out the ability to um, help other people develop methodologies, to do internal and peer review, to assure that the assets that are coming onto Regen Network are of high quality. So I really wanted to just give everybody a quick overview of, you know, like, who, who are we? Who's, who, who is the core team of Regen and what are we working on? Okay, so a little bit about Regen Network from a top level. We are the origination system for ecological assets. Right? So we're not necessarily building fancy DeFi derivative systems or high performance marketplaces. That's for the rest of the ecosystem to work on. What we're doing is building an application specific Cosmos zone for originating ecological assets. Right? And why is it important to have a sovereign and neutral space for originating ecological assets? Because there's a complex dance of science, technology, and social legitimacy that is perfectly suited to an app chain. 
where we're governing state as a proof of stake network, where we can create flexible governance councils around methodologies, quality control, minting standards, and, and then create these composable green money Legos that the whole world is hungry for. So there's basically three different elements of what Region Network is building. Uh, number one is eco-credits, right? Just the concept of a unit. Sorry, I've been speaking a little bit um, far away there. That sounds a lot better. Eco-credits are the concept of a, of a unit of account that represents ecological health outcomes or stewardship outcomes. So being developed, there's more than 40 different types of eco-credits being developed by a broad global community around the world. And those span the gamut of soil carbon, jaguar biodiversity, um, hopefully plastics credits. There, you know, there's this whole world of opportunity where real value, the value that is really intrinsic to our economy, can be expressed and internalized into the flow. Um, so eco-credits. Marketplace. How do people bring that into the market in a disintermediated, direct, peer-to-peer -peer marketplace where there aren't you know, a bunch of broker dealers who are taking large cuts? Currently, the, the markets for carbon credits you're really lucky as a project developer if you're getting 30% of the uh, value that's being exchanged because there's so many different e intermediaries. Imagine, you know, when we launch the marketplace in a couple of weeks, there's no need for intermediaries because project developers, land stewards can list directly into a marketplace. They can choose their sell price. They can manage that whole process themselves. And then finally, standards governance. Now this is sort of the boring part, but really it's the exciting part. This is, the, this is why I'm excited about the Cosmos SDK. This is why I'm excited about Cosmos. Being able to bring tools to communities that need to govern something that they all find is important. In our case, that's governing quality assurance standards for issuing carbon credits and biodiversity credits and plastic credits and uh, marine protection credits. Okay, so I want to just take a moment, sorry for all the text, but <clears throat> I was, I was reflecting on what I wanted to talk with everybody about, and I was thinking, oh, you know, a year ago, we were in Lisbon together, and I was talking about some of the same things. So I wanted to give everybody a quick sort of tour through time. So we've been, we've been working on buying and selling and originating carbon assets over the counter off chain over the last year because we haven't had the marketplace built. Because... Um, we really believe in this, I think, sort of core cosmos ethos of safety over liveness. Let's take the time to deploy technology in a way that is durable and resilient, and we're not just, you know, going to move fast and break things. Why? Because we really need to generate a core of legitimacy and, and process for these sorts of assets to have long-term value. So. What we've been doing is learning by participating in over-the-market carbon, over-the-counter over carbon markets, um, originating, I mean, you know, the first several vintages of native region carbon credits have all been just bought over-the-counter, right? So they're not even making it into the market. We're just about edging up to phase two. So in October, we're launching the marketplace. This is, this is a big... Big deal. <clears throat> and shortly after we launch the marketplace, we'll be working with the osmosis community and many of the protocols and blockchains to start to build on-chain liquidity of the nature carbon ton. And we'll get into that a little bit. Phase three is really where this gets exciting. Really where the future of regenerative finance can be found is, is when we start to be able to automate purchases right, automate issuance, have clear mechanisms for price discovery, all built on a solid foundation of auditable, transparent, and community-governed credits. And what happens then? Well, we get the opportunity to then start responsibly financializing these ecological assets. And re regenerative finance can really be born in full because we can start to do things like collateralizing IST, 
with eco credits. We can start to build out financial instruments that make it possible for us as a community to be long on planetary regeneration in a completely responsible way. So we're realigning our economic interests with ecological health. So just a, you know, a quick little, a lot has been done right? A, a ton of work has been happening and moving forward, these really big exciting milestones were just on the precipice. Marketplace launch, NCT liquidity pool, forward contracts, these are all the really big features that are going to start transforming and making regenerative finance in the Cosmos world and really the interchain world possible. Okay, so the nature carbon ton. Um, we worked with some part, our partners at Toucan and Moss to develop an interchain carbon standard called the Nature Carbon Ton, which allows a set of high quality um, e legacy carbon credits that have been tokenized through an existing sort of one-way bridge system that Toucan launched to create a fungible asset. So the first liquidity that we're supporting being built in the ecosystem is going to rely on these assets that were one-way bridged. And then over time, we're going to be starting to bring online the native region eco credits so that we can sort of manage supply. Now, we, we sort of expected there to be some issues, right? And some of those issues are uh, currently NCT is acting a little bit like STE did, where because it's a one-way asset, it's possible for it to sort of de-peg. So the Nature Carbon Ton, because it was a one-way bridge process that Toucan ran, is not reflecting the price of off-chain carbon markets, right? So in this latest bear market, it also took a dip. What's cool is that native region credits aren't going to have that issue because they'll be getting purchased by institutions and crypto markets and they'll be that sort of full market efficiency. What's also cool is by us building a bridge and moving those assets over, we're unstranding them. We're creating more efficient market for the nature carbon ton to, to sort of like regain equilibrium as an appropriately priced asset. So the key to solving that issue is really you know, bridges and making sure that there's a connected marketplace. So, um, the unexpected problem, I mean, I think the NCT thing, most of us who are paying attention saw that coming. The unexpected, unexpected problem is that all of the native region credits that are coming online seem to be getting purchased before they are even going to make it on chain. Well, this is great because it shows institutional adoption and it proves out this thesis that native, native region registered credits, credits that are produced in a blockchain native environment have institutional adoption. So that's like a very, pro it's a, like it's a quality problem, right? But on the other hand, it means that, you know, there's not as much liquidity as we might want for our blockchain community to access those credits, right? So the solution is really part of what's driving the future features of Region Ledger, which is forward contracts and ex-ante credits, right? So this allows people who, who have a forecast of crediting demand to be getting into contracts directly with project developers with, without inter any intermediaries to ensure that there's liquidity coming into the marketplace. Very ex exciting. All right, so we have more than 5 million carbon tons natively being produced in region ledger f over the coming eight months or so. There's a couple examples here, carbon plus grasslands, a suite of amazing agroforestry projects led by Terragenesis International, the Dow Ocean Project, and many others. Um, so there's sort of like this slow build of high quality credits that are coming into the marketplace. You know, sort of piece by piece, we're building these foundations for a robust and um, high quality marketplace for carbon and other ecological assets. And I think this points to one of the very interesting things. We're constantly getting asked, because, you know, I don't know if anybody's been paying attention, but did people notice that regenerative finance sort of became a thing? A little bit. 
it's a big thing. There, I think Flow Carbon raised $70 million on a $600 million valuation or something. Toucan raised $25 million. There's been all of these, you know, big hype and process. Meanwhile, little old Regen Network just keeps cranking along, but maybe not so little after all. Where's everybody going to get their credits from? Well, we're turning all of the potential competitors into powerful partners, right? When you have an infrastructure for people to be able to run quality assurance governance processes, when you have an infrastructure that allows people to tokenize and bring credits directly into the marketplace, when you have an infrastructure to basket those credits and turn them into liquid assets that's all already up and running, all of a sudden, partnerships and collaboration become pretty easy, right? Because actually all of these other projects, we can either bring their assets into our marketplace and give exposure to the amazing Cosmos community, or we can originate assets and flow them across bridges into the larger crypto ecosystem. So it's a really exciting moment in which the, the meme out collaborate the competition is really coming true. It's very exciting. So um, now I get to speak just a little bit about the marketplace. If you want to just have a look at this, you can go to app.region.network. We're finishing up the last little bit. We had hoped to give everybody a live demo and uh, buy and retire some credits for the conference. Uh, but that'll happen in a couple weeks. We're finishing up a little last little bit so that everybody can use their ledgers last little amino signing challenges so that we make sure everybody's interacting in the most secure way. So um, coming soon, TM, <laughs> but really uh, we're about two weeks out from unveiling the marketplace, which is going to allow people to buy, sell, retire, and trade carbon credits, which is very exciting. Um, and one of the things that that's going to enable us to do is really start um, accelerating the carbon zero process. Who here is familiar with the Cosmos Carbon Zero program? How many of you are already offsetting your protocols with Cosmos Zero? There's a few. Osmosis, yeah, Stargaze, Ixo. I think that there's a Checked. I think that there's been governance proposals uh, socialized in Evmos and Juno. Um, hopefully Omniflix is going to join. So what Carbon Zero enables us to do is as an ecosystem to really hammer home against the FUD that as an ecosystem we are carbon neutral or even carbon negative. It also allows us to to give birth to a new interchain asset. So I want to go back here just for a moment to NCT. So imagine a world in which you are estimating your carbon footprint as a protocol or a validator. You're pre-purchasing that carbon for the next maybe five years, and then you're able to put the excess carbon that you purchased into a yield-earning liquidity pool on osmosis, then making it possible to automatically offset your footprint as a protocol or a validator that entire time while earning yields, while supporting an ecosystem to bootstrap liquidity, generate price discovery, and realign economic interests with ecological health. That sounds like a huge omni win to me. That sounds like a pretty exciting opportunity to, um, yeah, be part of a revolution and make it a wog me moment. We're all going to make it. So um, I wanted to leave everybody with just a little hint of this is really beyond carbon and some of the most exciting assets in my mind, are things like Jaguar credits that can, can, can get bundled into Stargaze NFTs, things like um, direct land stewardship protection credits, things like the plastic credits that our friends at Empower are, are building. There's an entire universe of um, ecological assets that really 
are the foundation of a living and healthy economy, and that's what we're going to be bringing into the marketplace over the coming years. And by the way, check out the group module. You all can right now with the Cosmos 046 do non-token based governance of any feature or function that any address in the Cosmos ecosystem can handle. That is a big deal and I wanted to make sure that everybody was thinking about that. It's not a competitor with DowDow. DowDow is a, is a token based governance system. That's awesome. They're composable, they're interoperable, but there are some things you may not want to turn into a governance token. So I just wanted to shout out at the end while I had a moment, go check out the groups module. It's gonna revolutionize how we do governance in the Cosmos space. So uh, rock on, thanks for having me Cosmoverse. It's been fun. Hey guys, I have a question. Are there any secret agents in the room? Woo, okay. Well, I heard that you guys are throwing a hell of a party tonight. So I'm looking forward for that. And now I want to welcome, of course, Tor from Secret Network. Oh man, it's a lot brighter up here. How's everybody doing? How's Cosmoverse? Sorry, sorry. How is Cosmoverse? It's those mid-afternoon slots that they always give me where I'm just like the hype man. They know I drink my coffee right before. Who is at Cosmoverse Lisbon and heard my talk on privacy? Ooh, so we got a new crowd. Maybe I should have run it back. I wanted to do something new because I figured all you amazing Cosmoverse participants, maybe you were in Lisbon, you heard me talk a lot about privacy more as a human right, as a concept, less so as a technology that we've implemented in the Cosmosphere. Uh, so this is more about the history of Secret itself and the fight for Web3 privacy, what we've been doing across the whole history of the project. If you missed that talk in Lisbon, just remember that privacy has a lot more to do with things that aren't just keeping things hidden from other people. Really, it is a cornerstone for things like consent, for things like human freedom and empowerment, for things like sustainability. So keep all that in mind as we go through the history of the project, then what's happening now, what's going to happen for Secret and for the cosmos in the future. Our one mission has never changed. For the project and all of its iterations with all of its communities, we believe that decentralization to work, to truly be empowering, is going to require strong privacy guarantees for users. But if you reverse that, we also believe that strong privacy technologies are going to need to be decentralized. They're going to be needing to be in the hands of users, not gate kept by any particular organization, but they have to be in the hands of the users and operated globally to be sustainable and to be empowering. So we'll start with the then, we'll go to the now, but privacy will always be our mission and fundamentally it's because of those things that we believe, that decentralization requires privacy to succeed, but privacy will equally require decentralization to become sustainable. We're going back to 2015. People who aren't familiar with the history of Secret as a project may not know that there are these very deep roots for the ecosystem, for the research behind the ecosystem. At 2015, I was a graduate student at MIT, but not one of the smart ones. I was in the business school, which fortunately gave me a lot of exposure to ideas that were bleeding edge and probably about a half a decade ahead of their time. One of which was this paper called Decentralizing Privacy. And that was written by Guy Ziskind, who's the CEO of Secret Labs and has been building out this ecosystem as long as there's been an ecosystem to build. 
And this was foundational research. It was the first paper to really describe how privacy technologies could be combined with blockchain technology, two kind of bleeding edge areas of research, to create something that had never existed, something that was decentralized and also private. And you'll notice some things from this paper that now seem you know, extremely prescient. Unlike Bitcoin, transactions in this proposed system are not strictly financial. They could be used to carry instructions, such as storing, querying, sharing data. And we discussed possible future extensions to blockchains that could harness them into a well-rounded solution for trusted, computed problems in society. My favorite part of that sentence is where we mention society. Like, this was meant to be used for solving actual problems, not problems of speculation, not, you know, casino games, but we really believed that privacy technologies combined with decentralization could revolutionize everything and that they should. Also in 2015, this little network called Ethereum launched. And when I was doing my graduate research, I was doing digital rights management with blockchain research. And a lot of the things that I was looking into were not Ethereum. I was like, we're going to solve this with colored coins. That was for, for people who remember. And it turns out the only thing I wrote about that actually started to be used for all the things I thought was Ethereum. At the time, you know, it was revolutionary, solving for this idea of programmability on the blockchain, going beyond Bitcoin. But everything was still public by default. There was no consideration of privacy. And this was happening at the same time that this very first white paper was being written. A white paper that now has, I think, over 3,000 academic citations. So that white paper became this, became Enigma in 2017. And at the time, because Ethereum was what was live, the white paper was about combining multi-party computation with Bitcoin. But Enigma was about taking pragmatic privacy solutions to market with the Ethereum blockchain to create this private compute vision that we had written about. And this was supposed to be solving for Ethereum specifically. It was being developed as a layer two. And the main privacy technology that was being researched then for production, the only thing that was really production ready, was using secure hardware, a trusted enclave model, which was the best available technology in terms of performance, in terms of cost, generalizability, all the things that we were trying to value to create pragmatic solutions that would be used in production. But it still was clearly going to be somewhat limited relative to our very lofty vision for the future. Finally, we get some good tech. The Cosmos Hub launches, and now suddenly proof of stake is a thing. So now suddenly we're thinking differently about what's possible with blockchain beyond the proof of work model. And we get closer to this internet of blockchains reality. The idea that there will be this multi-chain future, that there will not be this one you know, chain to rule them all, but there will be many chains solving many things. And as a project that knew what we were trying to solve, we knew we were trying to solve privacy, it was essential for us to find a way to be part of a multi-chain vision. And it became clear that there were visions possible beyond Ethereum. And in this initial Cosmos vision, while there was all this power, there was still, just like Ethereum, no privacy. But suddenly all the pieces are in place for what we're describing, this idea that we need decentralization, we need privacy, and they need each other. So we have privacy by default, we have the idea of programmability, and self-sovereignty as a layer one, and interoperability, and this is the idea that added up to Secret Network. The idea of a privacy hub for all of Web3 that would solve this universal privacy problem that every blockchain shared because they were all using the same public by default model. We believe we could build a hub that could solve this problem for all chains and not just our own ecosystem. So that's why we came to the Cosmos in 2020. And again, this is, this is now starting to become recent history as much as it's ancient history. We were one of the very first chains to migrate from this Ethereum ecosystem to commit to the Cosmos ecosystem, to commit to this vision of interoperability while maintaining self-sovereignty because we knew that that was the path to reaching ultimately that big equation that I just put up, to have all of these things in one network but connecting to all others. February, we launched the mainnet. September, we got private smart contracts on mainnet, the first network to do so. And then we were also the first network to get Cosmwasm smart contracts onto the mainnet, running inside this enclave. We, I like to say we left ETH before it was cool. We do lots of things before it's cool, sometimes way too long before it's cool. But it was still a cool thing to do, and it's a cool thing to do right now. Thank you, DYDX. Meanwhile, right, this is all the tech side. 
Meanwhile, this is how it's going. What was going on during this whole time? What were we talking about while we were developing this privacy stuff? What was happening in the world? Some of these may look familiar because I did put a couple of them up during my other Cosmoverse slide. You can see data privacy was a problem not just in the Web3 world, but it was a problem in the Web2 world. It was kind of a disaster in the Web2 world. But most of the examples that I were using, you know, it still didn't seem existentially bad. It was still just like, well, my data got leaked. And, and that wasn't really tangible enough for people. It wasn't visceral enough for people. There's too much removal from the part where it's like data is being exploited or leaked to the part where I feel that pain point as a user, as a developer. So all these examples are obviously atrocious, but they weren't that immediately threatening for those of us who live in like very developed countries in the Western world. Recently, it's gotten worse. So now, in the Western world, maybe we don't have the same assumptions anymore about the importance of privacy. We have open source developers that are being jailed indefinitely with no real further details being released. We have the ability for data to be tracked, even in the United States, as this sort of political and legislative regimes shift. Will things like abortion still be legal? Will donating to Planned Parenthood become a crime that we can be prosecuted for after the fact? There's a lot of open questions around the things we took for granted. And suddenly people start thinking a little bit differently about privacy, not just in the Web 2 world, but in the Web 3 world as well. So suddenly I'm reading all these tweets, tweets that were kind of like unthinkable four or five years ago when everybody was telling us that we were crazy for having this privacy by default vision, for thinking that was the only sustainable model for decentralization and privacy coming together, that you couldn't tack on privacy after the fact as some kind of like mixer solution. You had to consider it at the base layer. We heard so many people tell us that that was very silly. And then they started tweeting about it like they were the first ones to think of it. Kind of ignoring, not just us, but all the builders in the space who had considered privacy a fundamental right and something that had to be considered in the base layer of every application and network that was being built. So, the long and the short of it is, regardless of when you decide to care about it, regardless of when you decide to tweet about it, privacy has been needed all along and it's especially needed now. Not just on paper, but in production. We need pragmatic solutions that can solve problems today, that push forward privacy for the entire Web3 space, that protect us in the Web2 world, that provide a meaningful alternative for users that they can start using and understanding and evangelizing. And especially good is if this is a solution that works with the rest of the blockchain world. It's not a silo that they have to opt into, but it's something that connects to all of the other blockchains. Every blockchain that they would care about, that they're already using, there's something connected to it that helps them understand the urgency and the importance of the privacy problem. So our focus is on pragmatism and adoption, because adoption is protection for privacy solutions. If there's an app that you have to opt into to get your privacy and not enough people opt into it, suddenly the government's gonna say, you're using Tornado Cash, that makes you a criminal. But if billions of people are using encryption by default on, a, on something like WhatsApp, you can't call a billion people a criminal. And it's really hard to take away that fundamental right to privacy from those people because that fundamental argument starts to weaken. We're no longer all criminals, we're just exercising a basic human right. But that argument gets stronger only with adoption. Every vertical matters when it comes to adoption of privacy-enabled solutions. This is, people come up to me at conferences and they're saying, tell me something that privacy is useful for solving. And I always just immediately flip it around. I say, tell me something that you would use every day if you thought you could not have any privacy now or in the future. There's very little. And that's why the blockchain space has struggled to kind of scale beyond these speculative solutions. Nobody wants to use anything more meaningful. Nobody wants to build on a public by default foundation because that's like building on sand. So every vertical matters, and we want to see adoption from developers for privacy-first applications across every single vertical, and we want to see adoption on every single one of these verticals. But at the same time, we don't want to compromise on the same things that get things adopted. So as an ecosystem, we've started to put a renewed emphasis on things like wallets, fixing viewing key and permit models, all the tooling and documentation for developers, things that will actually allow users to adopt things that are privacy-first without assuming that means I have to have a meaningfully worst time using this thing. I'm giving something up for my privacy. Privacy is a public good. You should not have to compromise something like user experience just to protect your own security or just to have the guarantees we believe every user in the world should have. 
So to look at what we've got going on today in the secret ecosystem, I don't have time to go through all the mainnet dApps, all the dApps in, in, that are going to be produced that are coming across all these verticals. I'll feature a few because they're live and you can use them when you walk out of this room or while you're here. So we have a DeFi ecosystem. There's been over $3 billion in on-chain volume in secret DEXs. We've had tons of people coming into this ecosystem telling us they value privacy in their solutions. Whether that's for front-running resistance or transactional privacy, it's meaningful. So Sienna has built a whole suite of applications. They have a DEX, they have a lending product already usable on mainnet today. We also believe that privacy is essential for communications. So we have the Alter team that's built a private by default communications platform. You can message one-to-one, -one, you can join groups, you can authenticate yourself into joining private groups based on having staked something, done something, and it's all with these privacy protections that keep control in the hands of a user. It's a very Web3 native model that people may not know even exists and is building in the cosmos today. And then we have in the NFT side, platforms like Stash that are trying to extend this model of asset ownership of non-fungible assets what if those had additional privacy protections? What if they could be private by default, but you could reveal them when you wanted to prove ownership of something? What if they could have public or private metadata inside? What if you could rent access to the private metadata, have protected fields? Could you use this for things like home deeds? Could you use it for things like reputation in the real world or educational credits, anything at all? So that's already being explored on mainnet. And then what's coming is dApps for growth across every ecosystem. Because again, this is only meaningful with adoption. So how across all these verticals are we gonna get millions of users? There has to be something for people to look forward to. So Shade is already launching. Shade, some people in the room may know, they are launching an entire suite of DeFi applications directly on Secret that are all private by default. That includes uh, Silk, which is a private by default stable coin that is not US pegged, but backed by a global basket of currencies and assets. They're also launching bonds, I believe today even is when they got some of their new bonds live. There's an Atom bond that they launched. These are the first bonds in the Cosmos ecosystem and they're being built here today with privacy protections by default. They're also building a number of tools focused on stablecoin adoption, on-ramps, merchant payments. All of this is going to require privacy for consumers. We also have DAO tooling from Secret DAO. We have gaming platforms like OneNet that are going to secure private by default gaming applications with in-game assets, with true ownership, with imperfect information models. These are really exciting applications because they can lead to millions of users discovering the cosmos and discovering these privacy first solutions. And obviously I mentioned we need better onboarding if we want to get millions of users. We've gone from having a limited amount of wallet support to a dramatically large amount of wallet support in a short amount of weeks and months with projects like Fina and Leap and Starshell and Cryptic, and I could name a lot more. Uh, also with Cato, you'll hear more about that soon, but all of this is essential for bringing users into the secret ecosystem and helping them discover privacy. So now, in our last minutes, I, I promised them that I would run over so we could get back on schedule. We were early, that's nonsense. This is the end of the beginning, so what's next? We recently completed the Shockwave Delta mainnet upgrade. This was huge, why? Because we got Cosm Wasm V1 onto mainnet, got to parity with these other incredible ecosystems that have already taken this step. So now it's never been easier for developers to start using secret contracts and building cross-chain applications. It also means that all tokens on secret, our SNP20 tokens, are also transferable across IBC meaning you can bring them into osmosis and have pools for assets that started natively as tokens on top of secret. It also brings us to our privacy as a service vision, meaning you can have cross-chain private smart contracts. This is essential to the privacy hub vision. You can have interchain accounts. You can have, I'd already mentioned the secret tokens going across IBC, but you understand why when I'm saying the whole vision is to have privacy and decentralization and interoperability and self-sovereignty, this upgrade is what finally unlocked that vision for the entire secret ecosystem and for the entire cosmos. I'm gonna quickly run through a few of some of the things that this would unlock for closer cross-chain relationships on Osmo, on Juno, whatever. I could have thrown like 800 logos up here because the cosmos is growing so fast. But something like true RNG, right? this is possible today. Essentially being able to have true randomness in a decentralized setting through secret, callable by any chain. You can have things like private voting or better voting structures for Cosmos-based DAOs, whether they're native to secret or whether they're now on any 
IBC enabled chain with inner chain accounts. It's essential. I mean, the way voting works in the real world is you vote, you have aggregated numbers of votes, you understand that it was a provably correct outcome, but as soon as that's linked to your personal identity, during the voting process, now there's risks. There's a reason we don't do it that way. But maybe after the fact, you want to be able to prove your vote, reveal your vote. These are the kind of programmable structures that are now possible when you have private by default smart contracts. Also, we're looking at a lot of different wallet innovation solutions. Meaning, could we have walletless experiences for users? People who have never used a Web3 wallet, how could they use a secret contract to manage their credentials so they never even have to know they're interacting with a Web3 application at all? And how could we combine what we're already doing with technologies like MPC to do better threshold wallets with multi-sig approval for transactions? There's so much more. There's so much more. I wanted to leave time at the end to talk about what's next, but there's so many more things that are possible some of which is already in active development. But everything that I'm just putting up here is not things you can build in two years. They're things you can build now. And over the hackathons that we'll be helping to sponsor over the next months, this is what we want to see built. This is what we want to see scaled for global adoption. Ultimately, it means there's endless possibilities. We're trying to expand this design space in Web3 a thousand X because that's what privacy gets you when you have this programmably private foundation. Finally, this brings me to if this was the vision all along, then what could possibly be next? If we already got here, if we already have the programmable privacy vision, if we already have interoperability, if we already have this foundation, where are we going from here? What is Secret 2.0? I'm not ready to say everything about what Secret 2.0 is. I am ready to say what it's about. Ask yourself these questions and you'll understand our approach to Secret 2.0. Right now, we have built the very first programmably private smart contract blockchain interoperable throughout the cosmos with interchain accounts, cross-chain contract calls. So what can we do to strengthen some of these privacy guarantees? How can we go beyond this trusted hardware foundation and add technologies that strengthen guarantees for users, give developers choice, and strengthen this model? And if you're thinking of a privacy hub, is a privacy hub just a hub, or is it more like a constellation of stars than a single point of light? And how can we help secure not only the interchain ecosystem and every chain in it, but every chain beyond it? So these questions are already in active consideration. I will say there is something coming soon. This is a digital event. Don't feel like you got to fly back to Columbia, but I swear I'm going to be back here in like a month. It's beautiful. I never want to leave. I might not because there's a hurricane coming. So. We will share details about Secret Summit. It's a digital event. Please RSVP for it because we will reveal a lot more. We will have a lot more interchain speakers, dApps. It won't just be me yakking. It'll be everybody in the rapidly expanding Secret ecosystem. If you want to get involved, build with us. We have a grants program. Incubator News is coming. Become a secret agent. Thanks to the three people who yelled in the room, but I'm sure there's 30 more. And lastly, we're looking for partners always now that we have cross-chain contracts. We have cross-chain relationships. Those matter more than ever because we want privacy on every chain. Take a picture of this if you want to get in touch. That's my Twitter, not my Telegram. My Telegram is actually this is Tor. It's not a secret, but I hate putting my Telegram on slides because I have 8,000 unread messages. Secret Network, SCRT.network is the website. Our Discord is the chat below. That's the Twitter for the entire network at large, not me personally, but they do respond to their DMs. Thank you for listening to me about privacy. Please prioritize privacy in your own solutions. Please reach out to us if you want to build with Secret and bring privacy to the whole interchain ecosystem. And thank you to Cosmoverse. Thank you very much, Tor. I always enjoy listening to Tor. He's, he does a really, really good job. How many of you guys actually have uh, NFTs on Secret Network? Okay, awesome. Same here. I, I love those uh, NFTs on Secret Network. Up next, we got um, Adrian Brink with Anoma. Welcome to the stage. Cool. 
Hello, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I even is that the timer? Great. Um, the timer is even running. Uh, yes, so today I'd like to talk to you about Anoma, uh, one architecture for full stack decentralization. Um, and I'd like to start with a brief historic recap of where we started and uh, how we got to where we are today. And so I really, I would consider, I mean, we started with the first evolution of protocols, which was scriptable settlement. And this started with Bitcoin, and there was a long tail of Bitcoin-like forks, whether this was Litecoin or even something like Zcash. It's always in the scriptable settlement model. Um, and people tried to build applications on scriptable settlement. They tried to build things like colored coins or name coin or even the global Bitcoin stock exchange. Who here in the room has ever used the global Bitcoin stock exchange? Okay, never mind. Uh, it was a completely unregistered securities exchange back in the early days of Bitcoin. It was interesting. Um, but the important thing to remember is that a lot of these applications worked, but they were incredibly clunky. And sort of, for example, for Namecoin, you needed to run a forked Bitcoin client in order to make this work in practice. Then with Ethereum in 2015, we went to generation two. We went towards programmable settlement. And all of a sudden, instead of having colored coins, we got ERC20s. Instead of having Namecoin, we got ENS. But we also got a ton more things that no one really thought about when Ethereum was being developed, like DAOs, like NFTs, like Solvon tokens. So we got a lot of novel applications that no one really imagined building when we were still in the scriptable settlement model. Um, and so nowadays you can build things like DEXs, AMMs, NFT marketplaces. Um, but again, they work, but they're clunky for different reasons. They're very composable at the settlement layer, but they generally speaking have at least one centralized web two component right now as well. Um, because what is the general pattern and you, is this a pointer? Ah, oh, you see this on the slide in the bottom. Uh, what's the current design pattern for modern dApps? It's a user doesn't have a transaction. Users have messages, users have intents, users have partial state transitions and they sign these things and then they send them to a central server, right? This is how OpenSea works right now. A user doesn't submit a transaction directly to Ethereum, no, they sign a specific message, send it to the central OpenSea server that then aggregates a bunch of these messages, does some compute and then ends up settling this on chain. And this is a pattern that you see over and over again, whether this is for OpenSea or for Optimism, um, or for any rollup, or even for like things like Gitcoin, it's always this pattern where people don't have transactions that are directly executable on chain. They rather have intents that need some amount of counterparty discovery to make work. So, I'd like to also talk, of course, about sort of programmable settlement plus plus everything that has happened since 2015. But to me, this is still very much the same architecture. This is still very much the same generation of programmable settlement. Like, yes, we had a bunch of advances from proof of work to proof of stake. I mean, like Cosmos led the way there with Cosmos proof of stake, right? Um, we had advances in scaling, we had advances in privacy, uh, we had advances in consensus actually with regards to tenement consensus, for example. Uh, but it's still fundamentally the same model. It's just programmable settlement. It does very, it's like, it's what the Ethereum trialed and sort of got to market in 2015 in a slightly different color and a slightly different flavor, but it's fundamentally the same thing. Um, but the really important insight here is that settlement is not sufficient. Um, settlement is sufficient if parties already know who they are and what they want. So like settlement is only um, sufficient if you want to do a simple transfer. Like if I want to send 10 USDC, to someone else, then settlement is sufficient. But for anything more complex, you need something more than settlement. Um, when you actually look at most applications, most applications need counterparty discovery. They need to help people to discover others with whom they can settle. Uh, I mean, good examples here are DEXs and marketplaces, right? Like in a DEX or a marketplace, I don't have a fully fledged transaction. I have a partial thing. Like I have the one, the intent that I have currently some ETH and I would like to hold a crypto kitty. Or maybe I have the inverse that I hold a crypto kitty and would like some ETH in exchange for this. But this is not something that I can execute on chain. You have the same thing with quadratic public goods funding where you have project donors and funders. You have even the same thing with DAOs and optimistic and ZK rollups. And I'll sort of go more in depth on how these applications actually look like right now. Um, so let's switch to what are the current approaches to counterparty discovery. And really there are three general approaches to this. 
Number one is you do it on the blockchain. Uh, this is sort of what Uniswap, what Osmosis does. You just dump it, you do, it on, you do the counterpart discovery in consensus. Um, AMMs are the most gas efficient way to do this, but when you really think about this, this is kind of silly because, and really expensive because you're, ha you're paying to establish a global total order over every single trade, even though the, there's absolutely no reason to establish a total global order for all these trades. Um, but this is at least very decentralized. Um, then you have sort of option two, you dump it all, you centralize the entire thing, right? How do you fix a problem? You just build a new centralized component and you call it a single operated, operator database. This is what OpenSea does, this is what Xerox does, this is what Flashbots does, this is what rollup sequencers do, what rollup provers do. The problem here is this always becomes a main trusted party. Um, and we've gotten pretty good at at least trying to prevent these trusted parties from being able to steal funds. But at the very least, they can indefinitely censor you. Um, and again, why are we building decentralized technology if the major component that makes these applications work end up being a single operator database run by a private company in New York in the case of OpenSea? And then you sort of have the third approach, an app-specific sovereign chain. And DYDX is trying on this right now, but the problem is this kind of comes back to point one, which is now we just dump everything in consensus. And yes, if you do this as an app-specific sovereign chain, you can hide over this fact because you aren't competing for execution time or for gas with other applications, but eventually also reaching like fundamental scaling limits by dumping everything in consensus. The other really important point to note here is that programmable settlement gave us composability at the settlement layer, right? Like a, co a contract can call another contract. But in the current model, in where we have intents, we're losing this composability, and we're also losing this composability in the third model, because fundamentally, I can't build a new application that reasons through the intents that get sent to the OpenSea server, or the intents that get sent to the Optimism rollup. Um, yeah, so I think really the single biggest trade-off is that we lose a lot of comp composability at the application la layer if we always think about this model as transaction-centric. Um, so. With this sort of brief introduction, I'd like to briefly talk about um, Anoma and what I'd consider the third generation of protocols, um, an architecture for full-stack decentralized applications. Um, and so I'll give you the entire tagline, which is, Anoma is an intent-centric, privacy-preserving protocol for decentralized counterparty discovery, distributed solving, and atomic multi-chain settlement. Um, and I'll go into some of these components a little bit later throughout this talk, but this is sort of the high-level tagline. Um, Fundamentally, Anoma is intent-centric. Users, generally speaking, don't have transactions. Users have intents, they have partial state transitions, they have partial transactions. They don't have something that's settleable on-chain. They have something that needs some sort of counterparty discovery mechanism in order to become settleable in the future. Um, the architecture also provides composable privacy because I think this is another important thing that not everything should be public, but also not everything needs to be fully private. There is a very big difference between sort of transparent, shielded, as well as private state. Um, and application developers need to be able to choose whatever they think is the right model. Um, and by the way, here the difference between shielded and private is whether you have a shared private state or not. So shielded um, state is about single state, uh, single private state, and private state is about shared private state. Um, yeah, you have an architecture that provides decentralized counterparty kind of discovery, distributed solving, as well as multi-chain atomic settlement. And if anyone here knows about Tendermint, you'll really like the stuff about multi-chain atomic settlement. So it's a radically new design where intents are binding programmatic, programmatic commitments to preferences. Rather than expressing and signing over a specific execution trace, which is what happens in all the current virtual machines, right? Like when I sign over a transaction in, let's say, the Ethereum model in the EVM, I sign over a specific execution trace worth of opcodes where every opcode can sort of arbitrarily change my state. So I have to audit and understand what every opcode in this execution trace does. But with an intent-centric design, users sign over future, state, uh, future states that they're willing to accept. For example, a user may hold a Bitcoin right now and they sign over the fact that in the future they're fine to hold zero Bitcoin if and only if they hold 100 ETH, right? So users express future states that they're willing to accept. This leads to a ton of advantages. For one, all of these intents are now composable because I can take an intent that goes from state A to B, for example, 
and someone else sends me an intent that goes from state B to C, and I can generate a new intent that goes from A to C, because all of these are just like you net out the state changes effectively. This is also how you can build on-demand rollups with this kind of architecture. And this is necessary for decentralized counterpart discovery um, and leads to an interesting paradigm that we call declarative paradigms, which I think is much closer to how actual users think about their interactions with decentralized systems. Right? Like when my parents sign a transaction, they don't think that they're authorizing this specific execution trace within a specific VM. They think about the fact that they're authorizing that their state changes. Right? Like they are fine with holding maybe one less ETH if they're buying something in exchange. They're not thinking, am I okay with all these contracts being called in the middle? Um, yeah, and this means that you can design very nice declarative black box architectures where users don't have to care about the thing that happens in the middle because users only sign intents on of what future state changes they're willing to accept. And then the underlying system can figure out exactly how to satisfy those intents and those state changes. And maybe this means that if I want to trade one Bitcoin against 100 ETH, there could be one counterparty, there could be 100 counterparties. I, as a user, don't care because it doesn't matter to me. I just care that my state preference that I signed over my intent get, is adhered to in the future. So in the future, I just have to check whether uh, the update, my state was updated correctly. So a little bit of what's in the black box, because this black box matters. Um, I won't go through the entire thing in depth. But sort of on the left, you see we start with counterparty discovery. And here we really have intents, intent gossip nodes, solvers, as well as zero knowledge proofs, recursive proofs, and eventually fully homomorphic encryptions. Uh, fully homomorphic encryption. So users um, can either authentic, like, um, author transparent, shielded, or private intents. Uh, some of these will involve multiple zero knowledge proofs. Some of them will involve some advanced ciphertext. They then submit these intents to an intent gossip network where that can contain 100 million of these intents because they're not consensus critical. We can have sort of infinite amounts of them. Um, and then solvers can look at the soup of intents and see which ones are composable, right? Because maybe I have BTC against ETH, someone else has ETH against uh, Adam, and someone else has Adam against BTC. These three intents live by themselves in the intent gossip network, and a solver can look at this and go, oh, I can take these three things and submit them as a settleable transaction on chain. Um, here, the nice thing is solvers use the protocol that we developed called Fairview for front-running protection, where solvers, or where anyone any transaction is encrypted against the shared public key of the validator set, which means that the transaction mempool actually only sees encrypted byte strings. And then in Tendermint, the validators only put encrypted byte strings into blocks and finalize those blocks. And in block n plus 1, the validator set jointly decrypts those uh, transactions. But no individual validator or no in individual observer can actually try and front run these transactions because by the time they're finalized, the ordering is fully established and you can't front, bank run, or sandwich them anymore. Um, yeah, so now we have the validators and we get to the finalized block. Um, here, this comes now to the execution verification and our unified execution environment, which is called Tiger, which can handle transparent shield as well as private state. Um, here, one of the nice things, once you think more about intents and less about transactions, you can also parallelize a bunch of the execution at the settlement layer because Intents or transactions with intents that touch different parts of the state can be applied in parallel because we know they're not conflicting. Um, oh, I have six minutes. Okay. Um, one of the important things to remember is that Anoma is an architecture. Anoma can be deployed in many different ways. Anoma can be, can, can be deployed as a global L1, can be deployed as a L1.5 to decentralize a specific application that needs decentralized counterparty discovery and distributed solving, or can even be deployed as an L2. Remember, this is fundamentally about giving users the choice in what security model they want to accept. And this is, I think, very much comes from this interchain thesis that like different people can pick different security models. We will probably want to have homogeneous architectures, but we want to have heterogeneous security models. Uh, right, here are some novel primitives that dApps get. So intents effectively lend themselves towards being can be seen as incentivized data availability. Um, you also get programmable threshold decryption via Fairview at the application layer. So applications can define what kind of a batch they want to have encrypted and at what point that gets decrypted. Um, okay, I will skip over this for the sake of time. 
I think one of the important things to remember is that when Ethereum came out in 2015, we really couldn't imagine all the applications that it would enable. And I think this is also the same with an architecture like Anoma, because I fundamentally believe that this, there will be many Anoma-like architectures in the future that will be deployed, in the same sense that there were many programmable settlement architectures being deployed since 2015. Um, right, so what kind of contemporary applications could we be building? You can be building Xerox, CowSwap, Uniswap, so of any of the decentralized exchanges and marketplaces. You can build full stack decentralized rollups, or you can build decentralized public goods funding. Um, yeah. But, and I won't go through all of these in depth, I, I'll pick out two, which are novel things that you can't build anywhere else. You can build runtime rollups, because effectively intents are just rollups by default, because as I said, if I have an intent from A to B and someone else has an intent from B to C, a third person can just roll this up into an intent from A to C. Um, and you can also build private auctions, so sealed price, second price auction, sealed bid, second price auctions, where the bids are all kept private using Fairview for threshold decryption, and then are decrypted once all the bids are in and the bidding period is over. Um, yes, coming to homogeneous architecture, heterogeneous security. Um, Protocols can generally be benevolent monopolies. Um, for example, we all benefit from just agreeing on IBC. There is no extra value capture that IBC as a protocol can uh, sort of take on. We all just agree that we all have the same interoperability standards so we can talk to each other. Security domains, on the other hand, can't, like shouldn't be in monopolies because they're non-local, they can extract rent, they can confiscate assets, and different people have different preferences, right? I think my parents will have a preference that to them, the best security model is that their local village secures their financial system. Um, to some people in Africa, maybe they care that like, they are in global ETH2 security. Like, we don't know, and we should give users the choice to pick the security models that they care about, but give them the same underlying architectures so that they don't have to reason through a new architecture all the time. Uh, this leads to very nice privacy preserving and censorship resistance from the bottom up. Um, right, fractal scaling. Um, one of the super nice features, if we agree on the same protocols, is that things like our phones work everywhere, right? Like, I bought a phone in Switzerland and my phone works here as well. Uh, this is a very convenient feature of the fact that everyone agrees on the same standard for the cellular backbone. And this really should be the same for applications in the blockchain space as well, where I may want to roam between uh, something like osmosis and secret with the same application because I now roam across different security domains, but my application fundamentally still works in the same way. Um, and now I'd like to take the last couple of minutes to talk about Typhon, um, which if you're aware of Tendermint, is, um, it, it's, it's, an, it's a new way to think about consensus. So it's a combination of heterogeneous narwhal and heterogeneous Paxos. And Fundamentally, what it gives you is the ability to have on-demand sharding. So if you have two blockchains that use Typhon, if there's a large enough overlap in the validator set, those two blockchains can decide to commit to an atomic block in between. So what's the use case here? The use case is, let's say you're the London Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange, and you want to clear, I don't know, $100 million trade between these two block exchanges, right? You want to make this atomic. And so if you use something like Typhon, you can then most of the time, these chains run by themselves, but when you want to have an atomic transaction across both, you can create an on-demand virtual shard, or we call them chimera chains, um, to be this atomic thing that's atomic across both chains. This also helps in the more practical example of, let's say, I want to book a flight, a hotel, and a concert ticket, um, but they all live on three different blockchains. Um, Using Typhon, I can have atomic commits across these three different blockchains so that I get my concert ticket only if and, if and only I also get my flight and my hotel. Uh, there's talks and specs uh, you can find online. Um, yeah, I think this really leads me to this, which is that we want to have homogeneous architectures and heterogeneous security models so that individual, like that, for example, the Swiss central bank can deploy its own blockchain secured by its own consensus to issue a digital CHF. Um, but we want to be, have the capability to move those assets using IBC into a global settlement layer. Uh, yeah, so Anoma is not only be built by me, Awa, and Chris. Um, it's built by a relatively large team right now at Heliax. Um, if you want to find out more, feel free to come find us and talk to us more. 
Thank you very much. This is Anoma, one architecture for full stack decentralization. Now we have our next panel, which is about bridging Cosm Wasm. And I'm super happy because the moderator of this panel is also Latino. He's great. Matt Crypto, welcome. Welcome everyone to the bridging Cosm Wasm panel. Uh, this is gonna be really fun. We're gonna focus a little bit more on bridging Cosm Wasm to other ecosystems. And we have a great uh, ro roaster for the speakers. We have Luis Quispe, head of security from uh, Helborn. Uh, we have Ethan Frey from uh, co-founder of Confio. We have Carol Kubat from CTO from Composable Finance. And Susumu Tor Toriumu, Tor Torimu from Data Chain. Welcome, guys. Uh, so, I'm gonna get started, get the head rolling, and uh, I wanted to ask Ethan, first of all, uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges of uh, bridging Cosm Wasm to other ecosystems? Hello, well, thank, first of all, thank you for having me here, and thank you, first Procito, for organizing this amazing event. Um, yeah, big thanks for Procito, first of all. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> So yeah, I think the biggest challenge right now is actually more developers. So it's been amazing adoption. Last year we've gone from like three or four mainnets to over 20 mainnets. I can't count them anymore. I have no idea. I keep hearing people saying, oh, this chain is doing Cosm Awesome. I have no idea anymore. So I think the adoption on Cosmos has picked up heavily and it's really the number of devs. So we're actually launching today, um, if you didn't hear, the Cosmos awesome Academy. We just launched that to train devs and that will be teaching new Cosmos on contracts to run all these chains. To run on things like June and Osmosis, but also on Secret Network is different, on Composable Finance, on every other chain coming out there that wants to run Cosmos Awesome. So I think it's one way we can do that. And we'll be adding more stuff about IBC classes, how to do IBC contracts. So I really think it's education is a key. So check out the Academy and other education coming out from us. Amazing. I definitely agree with that. Education is key. Uh, Carol, I wanted to ask you about Composable. Uh, I'm also a really good, uh, know full about the Polkadot ecosystem, and I know you guys are working there, but wanted to know uh, what is the, how, how is Composable bridging Cosm Wasm to Substrate, and what's the potential benefits for both ecosystems? Yeah, so we're first and foremost a Polkadot pair chain, uh, which means that our chain works on a totally different SDK, Substrate. We run our chain code inside WebAssembly itself, which means that we had to do a lot of re-architecting of the Cosmos VM, basically rebuilding it from scratch to work within Substrate. So uh, I guess we've done the uh, second full implementation, which is kind of fun because we did find some bugs in the official implementation as well. So it led to being very valuable overall. Um, Cosmosm itself works really well in Polkadot uh, 2 because the model is very similar, right? Many chains communicating with each other. So you want an actor model for your smart contract and uh, it's a Rust-based ecosystem. So there's a large developer overlap too. Uh, and the second component is bringing IBC to the Polkadot ecosystem, uh, which is a slightly larger challenge to be honest. We've been working on that as well for over a year now and hopefully launching that within about three months. Um, that is a lot of work with the IBC core team, writing light clients, etc. But hopefully in about a year time we'll get to the space where Polkadot parachains are to Cosmos chains exactly the same. Just opaque sovereign chains that you can communicate with over IBC that may host Cosmos and smart contracts and uh, are to be honest part of the same supercluster. Amazing. Excited to see that. 
Uh, Susumu, uh, how is that the chain applying IBC to the EVM based chains? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, just a small introduction of the data chain. Uh, so, data chain is a firm believer of IBC, and we are main contributor to IBC Solidity, which is a Solidity implementation of I IBC. And we are currently working on bringing IBC to EVM based chain through uh, our product called LCP, uh, which is a light client proxy. So uh, IBC is arguably the most secure and trust-minimized way of interoperability, but the on-chain verification incurs a lot of gas and the consumes a large portion of uh, block size. So we mitigate these problems in a practical way. So we introduce the uh, security-enhanced hardware, a trusted execution environment uh, called LCP node, to substitute the part of the on-chain verification uh, to achieve the ultra-gas ultra efficient uh, verification, yet uh, without sacrificing the uh, trust minimization thanks to the remote attestation technology. So um, we will use this uh, technology to uh, build an IBC bridge between Ethereum POS to other EVM-based chains. And soon after that, uh, I will uh, we will expand to other ecosystem, Cosmosm and Polkadot. And uh, at the launch time, I introduced LCP to Ethan, and uh, that we can uh, enable interchain contract call within these uh, other ecosystems. And he's kind, kind enough to say that it, this is signif significant. So I uh, hand it over to Ethan that why this is so significant. Yeah, I think the interesting point here was just talking about um, bringing actually IBC to Ethereum, EVM. And the way that Cosmosm brings it to Cosmos Decay, the contracts are actually speaking the protocol themselves. So a contract can define its own new protocol, not just speak existing ones, but develop new protocols that handles the contract callbacks, the handshakes, the packet processing. The same way they will expose the IBC Solidity, the uh, Solidity contract can say, okay, uh, on connection init, on connection uh, accept, on packet receive, on packet acknowledge, it will actually build any protocol it wants. So you can develop a new protocol that never existed before. On a Cosmosm contract on one side and a Ethereum contract on the other side and actually develop new cross-chain technology. I think that's actually very, very significant because you're not just building upon bridges but actually new protocols. Uh, the same way that I thought is very, very significant that you can speak Cosmosm to Cosmosm. So I'll speak more on that later. But Amazing. I think it's basically the same idea that you'll be able to in the future when that's fully, fully realized. I think an open whole ecosystem. Yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, if you guys are using hardware at the station, don't you introduce a trust component on Intel, for example? And um, that being a US company, not perhaps being the wisest thing for trustless infra? Yeah, that, that's the that, that, that little uh, additional trust assumption. Uh, we need to rely on the Intel or data center uh, to attest that the hardware uh, works fine, and the running binary is sound. So that is the additional part. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Luis, what would you say are the main security risks with bridging? Oh, bridges. I really love this technology. I really love. But let's recap some of the recent hacks that happened to the bridging technology. So January 2000, uh, this year, 2022, what happened? Qubit was hacked. Qubit bridge was hacked. It was 80 million of dollar worth loss. But maybe 80 million is not b uh, big enough. Let's go, let's set the bar higher. February, the next month, Warhol was hacked. Warhol bridge was hacked. The amount? 300 millions of dollars. But guys, that's not enough. March, the next month, running what hacked. More than 600 million was lost. Uh, I think, if I not wrong, uh, it's the largest uh, hack in the DeFi world. If we do a summary of all the hacks that happened just in bridge technology in the last two years, it's around two billions of dollars just in bridge. So does it mean that bridge is bad? Not anyway, but we need to consider where are the main uh, vulnerabilities that could impact the bridge technology. So 
For example, let's, take, let's talk about uh, the false deposit events. Uh, I, I am sure that many of you already know how bridge work uh, uh, behind the scenes, but for the, those folks who don't, just let's recap a little. We have contracts in one chain and contracts in another chain. So we lock tokens in one, co in one chain and we mine uh, rapid co uh, tokens in another chain. So in order to this to happen, uh, we have uh, something, a technology that monitors the events that one contract in the first chain uh, emits. So if a, if a contract emits an event and this, this bot is monitoring that, this relayer is monitoring that, what happens? If I'm able to create a false event, it means that the other chain is going to accept as a true uh, transfer, for example. So that's what happened, uh, for example, in Qubit. They were, uh, the attacker was able to, fall, uh, to create a false event and they were able to, to steal 80 million of dollars. Uh, okay, that's regarding events. La now let's talk about fake deposit. Is it possible? Of course. For example, in Warhol, attackers were able to forge a signature, a, a validation signature of one of the nodes. Uh, of the nodes. What happened? They create a false deposit. So they don't deposit, but they made the contract believe that they deposit. At the end, what happened? Three million dollars loss. Uh, and also we have something that is very, uh, is very particular to the centralized world. It means if, if we create or we work with a decentralized uh, consensus algorithm, we need to believe that the, um, the providers, data providers are decentralized or not. Let's, let's see what happened to Ronin. Ronin had nine validators. Four of them were in hand of one company, SkyMapes. So an attacker compromised SkyMapes. What happened? All the keys were compromised. At the end, you have four of, out of nine. They only had to hang one, one uh, more validator that was hacked uh, in an ERPC node, and they had five out of nine. That's all, game over. So they were able to hack uh, and, and made a uh, valid transaction. So what is the conclusion of all of this? There are some vulnerabilities that are common to this kind of technology. So as far and as long as developers are aware of this kind of vulnerabilities, they can prevent them to happen. And believe me, guys, if this happens, if there is one line of code that is wrong, it's many millions that are in game. So let's be aware. So uh, talking about that, uh, it seems like many errors are because of communication. So I wanted to go with you, Ethan, uh, talking about the status of the contract to contract IBC calls. Uh, how do you expect this functionality to evolve when other ecosystems beyond Cosmos start uh, adopting Cosmos? Thank you. Um, before I go into that, I want to talk about contract to contract calls in Cosmos, okay. Cosmos Decay first. Um, so if you don't know, basically if IBC isn't just moving tokens, it's not just interchange accounts, it's basically an arbitrary bridge to move packets back and forth. You can think of it as an, a very provable asynchronous messaging protocol. On top of that, we build other protocols. So a lot of these hacks that you mentioned are actually base layer hacks. They were forging the relayers, tricking that something happened that never happened. What IBC does is a whole lot of technology written in Go by the IBC Go team, over three years now, refined, tested, it's basically the whole bottom layer guaranteeing this chain actually did this, this chain actually said this. That has been now tested and tested and refined, and we can take it for granted, we can build on top of it. So that's like 80, 90% of the security attack vectors, which is basically guaranteed you inherit it. You don't build your own bridge. It's too hard. It's too much to do. Like, you can go on so many places, so let's, like, let's use IBC. Everyone should use IBC. Um, and I think the two of you are bringing this new ecosystem because of that, because once you have that, you start building protocols very quick, because you don't have to worry about the huge bridge, you just worry about application level security, which is much, much easier to worry about. It's still a problem though. So at this point, you basically have, I have protocol here and protocol here talking to each other. And I don't have to worry that this one might not have actually said that, or this might not have said this, or it might not show up, or guarantees, I have guarantees. But on top of that, I have to make sure that 
um, I don't have an ARM protocol, but it's just like any contract. If I call an AMM and it lets me suddenly withdraw three times as I should draw when I'm withdrawing my LP shares, or if I able to do a swap and get more money out than I should get out because they don't calculate the spot price properly, or they do spot price instead of the actual uh, curve price, the slippage, then I can abuse it. The same idea. So these interchain protocols in Cosmosm are basically like, they need a little more reasoning, I think, but basically the same attack vector is doing a contract to contract call in the same chain. That's at least in Cosmos because you can reason about a lot of that same stuff. You have the IBC guarantees and you say, okay, IBC works, I trust that. A lot of uh, smart people are working on that. I can just worry with application. So if I have my AMM calling my liquidity, uh, my lending protocol, there's lots of places of error there. You want to audit it. And if I have my AMM calling liquidity protocol another protocol, another chain, I need to verify that too. But it's not that much more space for error. Amazing. And uh, 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 Susumu, I wanted to ask you about uh, IBC use in traditional enterprise. Okay. So uh, I'm not sure that this is an exciting topic to cosmonauts, but uh, uh, we are discussing with traditional financial institutions about how they can leverage IBC, uh, trustless interoperability, to their platforms, uh, private enterprise blockchains, uh, managing the private assets like securities, bonds, and real estates. So uh, hopefully, uh, if we can build trustless IBC bridge between them, we can bring the real world asset to Cosmos, and at the same time, we can leverage the Cosmosm asset, uh, DeFi assets to, to the real world asset. And uh, uh, what we are dreaming is that uh, uh, every platform, uh, whether it's private or enterprise, uh, public, uh, whether permissionless or permission, we would like to connect them through IBC. And uh, personally, I believe that uh, LCP can be a part of that goal, and uh, we can contribute to Cosmos ecosystem. Great. And Luis, uh, what, what do you think are the solutions for bridging and interchain communication? Because you talked about many risks now. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> Very interesting question. The thing is, um, if we have a decentralized environment, so attacks that surface of attack is going to be reduced. So this is the basic idea. For example, let's, let's recap running attack. The, the attackers got five or nine validators. So they, they compromised the protocol. At the end, they were able to, to, <coughs> to steal all, uh, more than 600 million of dollars. But for example, let's talk about the interchain, Cosmos interchain security. But for me, it's a very cool technology. You can, you can bring the power of all the validators in the Cosmos Hub to an, any other of the chains. So, for example, if in a chain they had little validators and came a whale that has a lot of tokens to, to stake, it may create a, a, a transaction that is a, a bad for the community. But what happens if you bring all the power of Cosmos Hub to all the chains in Cosmos? That's, that would be great. Uh, so the centralization um, uh, and to, to be able to have many validators that, that could prevent those kind of attack to, to happen, that's a, a very good uh, first measure. Then there is something very particular um, with these transactions. And it's whenever we rely in an input of a user, we are playing with a protocol. So we have to reduce as much as possible what is the input that the user can uh, enter to the transaction? The input uh, to reduce what can do with that input. Because if there is no input or, or there is reduced input, for example, it's complicated in other bridges, technologies, for example, to, fa to create fake uh, deposit, to create false events. It's not possible. And there is something very particular that applies very well to Web3 and also to other, other technologies that for sure you already know. I'm talking about social engineering. So the technology could be the better, the best one in the world. 
but if the developers, for example, uh, click a link that is malicious, the computer is compromised, the keys are stolen. So here it's a, an advice that applies for all technologies and especially now in Web3. Awareness of the team, uh, the developer team. So as far as they are educated in security, that is very important. So uh, it's going to, to allow that that this kind of attack doesn't happen uh, anymore, or if they happen, they can be reduced in reduced impact. So that would be the idea uh, behind the education of, of security for, for all, the, all the teams. Great. Uh, Carol, uh, how are custom wasm contracts on SDK uh, compared to custom wasms on South Street? Is, what's the difference? What are similarities? So what we're trying to achieve is that it's actually a one-to-one -one parity. Um, currently, that's not fully possible because technically, I think the Golang implementation is currently encoding some stuff in a different encoding with sub-messages, um, and we don't do that yet. Um, so right now, if you were to take the compiled Marsh protocol, you can't yet run them on RVM. We added to fork them to uh, change some slight features. Uh, those are major issues overall. What's really different mainly is that substrate chains are usually app chains too. So you have a lot more custom messages that you can access. So I do think that opens up uh, more features for smart contract developers that want to go into the parachain ecosystem, uh, especially uh, since uh, a lot of the uh, parachains there do uh, a lot of XCM too. So while uh, with mainly because of Muslim contracts, you might be doing IBC, IBC, IBC hops, but opening up in the Polkadot is the ability to go through Cosmosm to XCM and then actually call into parachains that don't have Cosmosm at all, that aren't even IBC connected, but that are still trustedly connected over XCM. And that way you get access to Kala, Hydra DX, uh, basically the entire Polkadot network and Kusama network. Uh, I think that's a pretty cool feature. Um, we're trying to achieve this too with NIR. So having an IBC bridge to NIR itself and then being able to go through shards without actually needing to use IBC. So we'll definitely see a lot more tooling for Cosmosm contracts to actually support these new types of message passings. But to be honest, Cosmosm is designed pretty well. So we don't need to add too much stuff. It's mainly more custom message types. Well, I was going to ask you about custom message types and how you add them. So you have... Um, yeah, all the app protocols, you have a DEX on there, you can add a custom message for the DEX, but you have custom messages also for XCM. Yeah, so basically, um, for our chain, we generate one giant enum, which is every single transaction type that we can then obviously encode and decode to JSON. So for us, it's very easy to actually support literally every operation that our chain supports without needing to do a lot of code gen or uh, incrementally supporting new pellets. Um, for us, the XCM palette itself is also one of those transaction types. So we basically get XCM support in Cosmosm for free by simply adding that custom message type for our entire chain. Nice, nice. We think called Stargate queries or Stargate messages does that, and, mm -hmm. but better typed enums are better than, than any. <laughs> Yeah, that's one advantage of doing uh, substrates. Like there is easier integration between Cosmosm and substrate parachains because you remain in the Rust space. So you get all the expressivity of the Rust type system. Uh, so so far, it's been a good experience. Do, do you see any risks in the in Cosmosm expanding to other ecosystem, or is only benefit? Is there? I, I think there's only a benefit, to be honest. Um, I'm a big believer in WebAssembly as a, a low-level target for smart contracts. Obviously, you can use the Cosmosm SDK to write your contracts, but uh, technically, all that we do is expose low-level host functions, so people could even write entirely different SDKs on top. Um, what I'm bearish about is uh, actually the expansion of Solidity and the EVM across chains. That's something I dislike seeing because I think it's much more difficult to actually verify Solidity programs for correctness. Well, with Rust, you have way more tooling, static analysis. So for me, I find it really important to push third-party developers to uh, doing the most secure thing. And to get them to do that, the easiest thing needs to be the most secure. The default needs to be the most secure. Awesome. Yeah, well said. <laughs> so I'm going to add one more thing about these um, contract contract calls. So I think right now a lot of the design of like IBC has been the actor is a user or it's a governance vote or something like that. And so you have, oh, I want, I as a user want to move my tokens from here to here, right? I as a user want to stake my tokens, over, I as an ex-gov module, as a governance vote want to stake my tokens over here, right? Um, and I think what really 
is going to expand with these custom messages, especially when Cosmos and Mosm communicate not just other Cosmos chains, but then with, uh, yeah, with Polkadot chains. Um, it's interesting is you actually say, okay, we're going to actually talk to, compose with different protocols, right? So I'm going to connect my custom thing. I'm going to connect, let's say, Akala over XDM, over IBC to my other decks over here and somehow have them balance liquidity between them. If they happen to have the same pairs. So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens in this space. And I think that DAOs actually are one of the key points to make this sit here. Because at the end of the day, all these protocols are owned by something. And all of these hops. So when you're building these custom protocols, who's actually holding this, these relays? Who's holding these things? And I think the security of DAOs and security of better governance technology is actually essential to build out these large ecosystems. Now when you have a protocol over three different chains, uh, like you're trusting obviously the three chains themselves, but you shouldn't have any more trust vectors. So can you actually use a chain the governance as a DAO, basically? Can you have your other multi-chain DAOs? I think this whole idea of like, as we are extending the capacity of DeFi and the reach of it uh, and the surface area, we think the governance of these protocols too. So these are very, very other surface area. A lot of people, if you have a multi-sig of three core devs as your thing, this closest tax vector is social engineering. If you can hack the devs of three core devs and they actually have admin right to modify some configuration in your protocol, then you hacked all the chains that are connected through this. So I think actually the governance of those protocols is going to be very important. And, and talking about what uh, scared you a little bit, Carol, uh, the expansion of uh, Solidity, uh, maybe we wanted to discuss a little bit about Cosm Wasm to EVM communication. Yeah, so a difficulty there, for example, is that Solidity isn't really as expressive in the type system itself. And Cosm Wasm messages are a Rust enum. So it's already going to be a bit of a pain to actually do that communication. Low level enough, you could definitely do so, and the EVM bytecode itself will fully support this. But Solidity itself isn't really designed to handle messages in this way. So just the way you structure your code, the tutorials itself, it will be a bit more unfamiliar for Solidity developers. Actually, as a fun thing, Hussein, uh, one of our lead devs, wrote a DAL to EVM bytecode compiler just so that he could get enum support in uh, EVM code. But uh, I, I do think at some point that uh, we might actually see Solidity gain less market traction. I'm really bullish on uh, FA, which is a basically Rust-inspired language that compiles down to EVM bytecodes, which I think could really nicely integrate with Cosmos and Smart Context. And that is basically this perfect marriage between the EVM and all these other chains. And Susumu, uh, I wanted to ask part of a, a question from the crowd. How is the community, the Cosm Wasm community in Japan. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, actually, I'm very new, newbie to Cosmo Wasm okay. comparing to other folks <laughs> in here. And uh, well, uh, I'd like to encourage and promote people in Japan, but uh, currently it's not <laughs> that much. All right. Hopefully see expanding. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything else. Any alpha you want to share with the audience? <laughs> if you like DAOs, if you like IBC, Wind DAO just launched. It's a project of mine. Check it wyndDAO.com. We launched today. It's an interchain DAO based on Juno, based on DAO technology. It's going to rock. Amazing. Well, thank you guys. <laughs>
Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Make some noise if you love NFTs. Let's make some noise. All right. Louder, louder. Let's go. Make some noise. That's what I like to hear. Our next speaker is co-founder of Stargaze, Shane. Welcome, Shane, to the stage. Give it up. Hey guys, how's it going? Awesome to see all the super fans here. Wow, there's so many people in the audience. That's my joke for tonight. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm um, keeping up with the theme and we're gonna talk about Stargaze 2.0. All right, so Stargaze is gonna be one year old uh, in a month from now. So I'm gonna do a little recap. So uh, Mainnet launched uh, in October of last year. Um, we did a liquidity bootstrapping pool on Osmosis where we got a loan of Osmo uh, to kickstart uh, the LVP. Um, this was a first of its kind DAO to DAO loan and um, Axlar is launching using the, uh, pretty much the same way uh, later this week. Um, in March, we launched the Launchpad and in May, we launched the Marketplace. Um, let's go over some of the numbers. Uh, there's been over 600 uh, uh, NFT collections launched on Stargaze. That's over 700,000 NFTs and 68 million stars, uh, 7 million USD uh, in primary sales has been uh, paid out to the creator so far. And also 6 million stars in secondary sales and royalties. Um, half Stargaze users are coming from Kepler Mobile. Um, if you guys haven't used it yet, give it a shot. It's really um, a first-class um, marketplace minting experience on Kepler. So Stargaze really wouldn't be what it is without its creators. So uh, let's give them a bit of a spotlight. Um, Andromeda, they uh, launched Stargaze Punks and a bunch of other collections. I'm sure so some of you here have some of the Punks. Um, they're also working on a play-to-own game and uh, also launching their own blockchain. So shout out to, And to Andromeda. <laughs> uh, PS Labs, they're a team from Terra and um, they built this kind of dolly like um, AI art service. So um, they use Stargaze NFTs as access tokens and then you can go to the website and you can uh, mint really interesting uh, AI generated art. Um, Space Ape Society, they're another project that came over from Terra. Um, they launched these uh, pretty funky apes and uh, you can um, also mint this mutant serum and you can burn the serum and send the ape to a vault and then it mints this pretty rad uh, mutant ape. And uh, there's a bunch of projects in Stargaze that have kind of done this uh, burn uh, to mint kind of thing. All right, so let's do a little uh, recap of the tokenomics and fees of Stargaze. Uh, as you guys may know, it's an app chain. Uh, it kind of uses the osmosis uh, tokenomics model. Uh, inflation is third, is uh, reduced by a third every year. There's a max supply of four billion stars and Stargaze has zero gas. Um, one thing that's different though, it, uh, it, um, it does have fees for certain things like minting and trading but these are really uh, kind of minimal fees. Uh, Stargaze is designed to be minimally extractive. Uh, we don't try to gouge uh, creators for money at all. Um, Stargaze is built as a public good. Um, the way uh, the fit fee mechanic works is that 50% of it is burned and 50% goes back to stakers. So the more Stargaze is used, the more um, supply is burned and staked. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the updates. Uh, so uh, Launchpad V2 is launching very soon. Um, well, one of the main features of it is random minting. Um, so um, now uh, it's kind of um, it's easy to snipe because you can know uh, what, what the next token ID is and you can get the data from IPFS. But we found a way to do random minting in real time. 
Um, in a lot of other chains, you would mint and then come two days later and see what you got. But in Stargaze, you can do it in real time. Um, we're also working with uh, this new chain that's launching called Noise Network, where you can get randomness over IBC and make this even stronger. Uh, another interesting thing about Launchpad is, uh, is community-owned contracts. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I think we're not on the latest version of my slides, unfortunately, but uh, I'll still go through this. Um, the interesting thing about this is that governance can vote on um, every parameter um, on the contracts. And there, we're also launching verification of collections. So now governance can vote on collections, and there'll be like a little badge in the marketplace. Uh, Marketplace v1, uh, the update to it, one of the main updates to it is uh, auctions and bidding. So this is pretty much a no-brainer uh, for uh, marketplaces, uh, increases the, the liquidity in the marketplace. And uh, trade filtering, this is a feature I'm really excited about. Um, I've been trying to find the perfect bad kid, and I don't have one yet because I can't find the one I want. So uh, with this one, you'll be able to, you know, select the background. Uh, you can maybe, you know, if you want an astronaut, if you want a bad girl even, you can go and find the perfect one. All right. So um, Stargaze is a Cosmosm chain. Anyone can build on it. So uh, there's a bunch of projects that have built on it. So let's talk about some of them. Um, badges by uh, Larry0x. Um, is a POAP um, project with on-chain on metadata. And uh, he just released this POAP uh, to celebrate the launch of Mars V2. And um, this got launched on Stargaze in pretty much under a week. Um, uh, all he had to do is submit um, a Commonwealth post with the Cosmosm code. Um, we went over the code as a team. And then he uploaded it to governance. And then it was live on Stargaze in three days. Um, is there any way to get the new versions of my slides on? If, if possible, that would be awesome. Um, so then, um, another project that I'm very excited about, so bridging Ethereum users uh, is something that I always wanted to do, or Stargaze always wanted to do. And uh, we're, we're working with Lavana on this. And some of you may know uh, Lavana as a, a project from Terra, and now they're launching a bunch of um, uh, projects on various Cosmos chains. Um, the way it's going to work is that they're going to airdrop some ETH stars to these REC Dragon holders, uh, which is an Ethereum uh, a collection. And then uh, those users are going to bridge over ETH stars, over Gravity Bridge, to Stargaze. And uh, then they're going to be able to claim um, an airdrop of stars, and also Winter Pals NFT, which is a collection that they're working on. So this is kind of our first pilot project with Ethereum, and uh, there's going to be more after this. Uh, Pegasus is a, um, uh, uh, a swapping protocol, uh, another third-party protocol that lets you swap a basket of NFTs with another basket of NFTs. Um, Hubble Tools is a rarity tool uh, that also has a lot of um, kind of live uh, streaming where you can kind of, it's, it's really fun, it's like a block explorer, but you kind of see everything in real time what's going on in Stargates. All right, so you guys were here for some new stuff, right? You, wanna, you guys want to get some alpha. <laughs> um, OK, so I, I think this requires a little bit of a backstory. So um, kind of the origin story for Stargaze was it started in early 2020. We were building this kind of like decentralized Twitter type thing. Uh, in retrospect, I think it was kind of a bad idea. But uh, it, even, even now, it's a little too early to build something like this in Cosmos. Um, but when we were building it, um, we re realized that the native content type is NFTs, and there's no NFTs in Cosmos yet. So we had to make NFTs a thing in Cosmos first. And we did that. We made NFTs, uh, NFTs a thing in Cosmos. And um, most of the functionality for Launchpad and Marketplace, the basic functionality is now done. And now we can move on to the next phase of Stargaze, where we start um, 
building around it, building on top of it, and adding value to marketplace. So we kind of broke this up into two parts, vertical and horizontal. And uh, vertical is like, you know, the internal Stargaze ecosystem stuff, and horizontal is external IBC stuff. So vertical integration, um, one of the things we're launching is splits. We've been talking to a couple of record labels, and they really want this feature. And uh, basically, you can have various accounts. They can have different weights. And um, when they earn minting revenue and royalties, they can get distributed um, across all the accounts. And uh, looks like I am getting my new slides. <laughs> Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So, um, a lot of people have been asking, when DAOs? Um, so, um, you know, DAOs don't really make sense until you have commerce, right? They're like the business entity of um, kind of the blockchain world. And now that we have commerce, we can start, uh, start building DAOs. So, we're building these uh, NFT collection-based DAOs. It's pretty much uh, NFT collection wrapped in a DAO. Um, and you have voting power based on how many NFTs you own in that collection. So let's hypothetically say we have a bad kids DAO. Um, if you have four, you have more voting power than two. And then um, the treasury can uh, you know, manage all the funds that's coming in from uh, royalties and so forth, and the members can vote on what to do with those funds. Um, another thing we're launching is called Stargaze Daily. Um, so right now, um, the way collections launch is that they build a little hype and then they do a, a really big drop. They try to sell out as, as fast as they can. Um, and then they either continue building or they don't, right? How can we make this more sustainable, more intentional? So the way Stargaze Daily works is that um, it'll be just one NFT auction per day. And uh, the winner of this auction uh, becomes a member of the DAO and the mid proceeds go into the DAO so it's a much more kind of slow, sustainable, intentional way of, of, of uh, raising money and building a project. Horizontal integration. So uh, this is when we connect to IBC and IBC Fi everything. So obviously Marketplace uh, um, needs IBC integration. So the way this is gonna work is that there's gonna be a bunch of ways to talk to Marketplace and be able to list and bid and do all their operations on it um, through interchain accounts uh, and interchain queries. Um, and other Cosmos and chains can also talk to Marketplace um, over uh, this IBC proxy contract. So you, so you pretty much deploy this IBC proxy contract on the Cosmos and chain, and then um, you can uh, use IBC NFT transfers, uh, you can send an NFT to it, and then uh, it'll, it can go and list it on the marketplace and kind of, it, it just like wraps around all the IBC operations for you. All right, here's something new we're working on. IBC name service, right? There's been a bunch of like attempts at name services in Cosmos, but like none of them have really taken off. And um, you kind of, um, kind of need a marketplace to be able to trade names. So, um, a name service in Stargaze is something that really makes sense. Um, but there's a lot of problems with existing name services. Um, the renewal prices aren't market-based, like an ENS. And um, some of the NFT-based ones, you just buy a name and squat forever, which is unfair. So um, the way it works in Stargaze is that, let's say your name is Cito and you want to buy Cito.stars, right? Uh, you go to the name service, you buy it, and then it immediately gets listed on the marketplace. And now anyone can bid on it now, right? So let's say Zaki puts in 10 million stars to bid on Cedo.stars for some reason. Now Cedo can either accept the bid um, or he can just hold on to that name, but in one year he has to pay 
5% of the highest bid. Um, so now, um, the renewal prices are market-based. It's based on the highest bid. So this prevents like long-term squatting because you still have to pay the renewal fee, but it's a fair fee. And also there's opportunity costs, right, for Zaki, right? Because he has to put in that bid that 10 million stars is gonna you know, stay in the marketplace uh, until the bid is accepted. So we think this is a, a very fair way of building a name service. All right, IBC NFT transfers. Now this is a true kind of interchain project. There's many teams involved with this. Uh, Gravity Bridge, um, uh, Michael Scotto from uh, Stargaze was running the effort. Uh, Ziki Medley uh, did a lot of the Cosm Watson work on this. Um, also, people from Arc Protocol were involved. And we're very, very close to getting this working. Um, Any one of you are going to be at Hack Atom. We're going to be working on this. Please stop by. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to go into details on how this works. But uh, yeah, you can transfer NFTs between chains. Third-party integrations, we've been, uh, we're the second uh, chain to launch on Stride, liquid staking, working on Quicksilver as well. Uh, there's a bunch of new wallets, Cosmos Station, Leap, uh, Omni. Uh, also working with Kado and Noba um, on uh, on-chain uh, fiat on-ramps. Sorry, fiat on-ramps. All right. When NFT staking. Um, I think I first talked about this like October of last year, but we didn't build it yet because we wanted to, wanted to do it right. So kind of here's how it works right now, right? At least on like Ethereum and other chains, you would you kind of lock the NFT up for a period of time. Uh, it's not really doing anything. Um, you just and you're farming some like questionable governance token, and it's not really proof of stake, right? You're just earning um, some kind of yield, and uh, it reduces trading volume. That's the opposite of what you want from a marketplace. So um, we designed this thing called super cooled NFT staking. Um, kind of, uh, um, you know, hat tip to uh, superfluid staking. And um, the way it works is that you can charge up an NFT by adding stars to it, and then you can stake it on a validator. And uh, then when you do this, you can earn proof of stake yield on it. And also, um, Stargaze has a sizable pool for NFT incentives, and now you can start earning uh, yield on um, up to the floor price of the NFT. And as the floor price changes every day, um, you earn kind of daily um, yield on top of the staking yield. So the advantage of this is um, one of the obvious ones uh, prevents NFTs from losing their value, um, and it increases movement of the floor price because if you have a really rare NFT, you may not want to use this. You may be better off trading it in the marketplace. But if it's a floor NFT, um, you, know, you, you may want to uh, super cool stake it and uh, earn additional yield on it. So um, especially after IBC NFT transfers, this will attract more NFTs to Stargaze, and it also secures the chain at the same time. All right, folks, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, we're having a party on Friday uh, at Panorama Rooftop Bar, so come and join us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shane. Our next speakers, we got to make some serious, serious noise. 
Omniflix. We got Sisla and we got Dayakar. Welcome to the stage. Woohoo! Ula Hill, Namaste. All the cosmonauts streaming live and who are attending in real. This is Daya. And uh, I'm Sisla Abhishek. And today we are very excited to be here at Cosmoverse 2022 IRL. This is our first ever Cosmos based event where we had a physical presence. And we are very pumped. I'll tell you why. Because as some of you might already know, in 2021, we were powering the entire event, the media production, the live streams, the broadcasts, and so on and so forth. And it was primarily all remote, thanks to the Flix crew and their efforts for making it a resounding success. Taking inspiration from that, this year, in 2022, we powered the pre-event registration, the tickets, the in-event registration, the AV streams, six live broadcasts that were uninterrupted. And without getting rug pulled. <laughs> and with that, post event ops as well, where there will be NFT drops for attendees. They can go claim their NFTs on cosmoverse.omniflix.co, and sponsors have the opportunity to connect with attendees even after the event. So we are very excited. And a huge shout out to Cryptocito, Basile, Fabian, Yuri and everyone else that made this event happen today the way it is. A huge shout out to the Flix crew as well, who are back at home and here, who made sure to work, <laughs> who made sure to work in the Colombian time zone, being on the other side of the world. So thank you all, thank you all for supporting us and making sure, you know, we experience the event the way it is today. Now let's OmniFlix and chill. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 so it's, uh, let's look into Omniflix. So you might already know Omniflix, but let's see what it has been for us traveling all this while, you know, being here today. So it's been six years we've started and we've been contributing to open source since then, you know, building apps on Ethereum. And then, you know, while doing so, we kind of got, you know, uh, we kind of came across bottlenecks where while we're doing research, we found Tendermint and Cosmos SDK. So that's then we started, you know, uh, participating in testnets and, you know, various other things within the Cosmos ecosystem. And then moved on to run validators with partners in, in two different capacities. But, yep, otherwise, yep, we're moving to 2020, 20, we started participating in Game of Zones, where we went on to win Best Custom Zone by showcasing the interoperable NFTs. You know, in a, in a marketplace where backed by the custom relay between the uh, you know, on-chain broadcast and the ad exchange. Well, so I think Vishitla will be talking about, the, you know, more in detail about the test nets and the main nets and, you know, overall. Yeah, so up until 2020, we made sure to prepare for what Omniflix is today. 2021 was when we rediscovered ourselves. We were called FreeFlix Media back then. We meant free as in freedom. Everyone thought free meant, you know, free beer. <laughs> and was a, it, people were thinking that we were a free version of Netflix. You can build Netflix's, YouTube's, the Twitches of the world on top of Omniflix. But 2021 was when we rebranded ourselves to Omniflix. And as the name suggests, you know, Omni, making sure we have presence across multiple chains and Flix, a work of art. 2021 was also the year when we built our first D app. We were participating in the Agoric testnets as a validator and participated in a challenge where we developed a D app for staking and governance. In 2021, we went on to launch in sync our staking and governance interface for six different networks. Most popularly, you know, this was one of the first staking interfaces on Juno, bootstrapped the entire Chihuahua community on Comdex and other networks. In 2022, we went on to launch in sync for 11 different networks. And we've seen this being forked by multiple other networks. This was our first DApp with a huge success. Moving on, but we continue to build on and prepare for what Omniflix is today, you know, the Omniflix hub. 2021 was all about testnets, you know, we launched multiple testnets, got participation in, and in 2022, we launched the Omniflix hub. 
on 22nd February 2022. Seven days later, on March 1st, 2022, we launched what is the first D app, Omniflix Studio, where creators and communities can mint, manage, and distribute their NFTs so they could create NFTs using no code at all. And we also launched the marketplace right with Omniflix Studio. So on March 1st, you had both apps, Omniflix Studio and Marketplace, go live with support for multiple tokens. We had support for four tokens up until now, Atom, Osmo, Juno, and Huawa. Each community came together to mint NFTs, participate in collecting NFTs across the Omniflix hub, as well as participate from multiple communities. Now, we had these four D apps on Omniflix hub. We have worked with, since then, 97 creators. There were multiple collaborations, because of which we have over 100, 100 collections, 106 to be precise, and with over 142K NFTs with four supported tokens. Oh, by the way, we also have support for STARS, AKT, DVPN, and Axler-based tokens coming soon. And we did not launch the Flix token. We are well aware of the question, when Flix? <laughs> soon, soon is the answer. So <laughs> moving on from OmniFlix so far, we have some content stats that I will be able to share. Yeah, well, so we, we, we've been able to you know, uh, do 350 million plus minutes streamed across on YouTube and various other platforms. We kind of manage 8,000 plus assets. Uh, at the same time, we got eight grants during the, you know, our journey from various networks for contributing in our you know, various capacities. Well, uh, we've been able to do three test nets, um, you know, bridging gap between two worlds, both the Web 2 and Web 3, uh, with a single goal to, you know, for the creators to, and the communities to do more. Yeah. Well, so what does this mean? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so what does this mean and what, what, how, how it all works? I think Shisla will be able to take you through in a deep, you know, yeah. deep dive into all of the infrastructure behind Omniflix. So let's take a quick look at the NFT infrastructure on Omniflix. Let's go from the, from the extreme left to right. So here you have what are composed as NFTs. So we have Web2 media assets and Web3 media assets that can be composed as NFTs. What else? You have tickets, objects, access passes, 3D assets that can be composed as NFTs. You also have what are AI models, DeFi strategies. You know, IP, a marketing idea, a growth hack, that is also IP. That can be composed as an NFT. How, when, you know, the mechanism can differ, but these can all be assets that, these are all assets that can be composed as NFTs. Now, what is the first thing that people tend to do with their NFTs? Since 2017, 18, we've only seen marketplaces go on to list NFTs and people could buy or sell, rather collect. But what is possible? We have broken down what are possibilities with NFTs into two parts. These are fractionalization of NFTs. We have what are fungible fractions of NFTs as well as non-fungible fractions of NFTs. Fungible fractionalization is breaking down an NFT into, say, a vintage car exists, and 100 people own one token each of the car, and all of them have you know, similar access, shared access, shared ownership to the car itself. You know, these, can be, these tokens, these fungible tokens, can be traded across multiple DEXs, like Osmosis, and so on and so forth, to be able to better serve their community. Right? Because the barrier of entry for a single NFT is too high. Fungible tokens provide an opportunity for people to be a part of the ecosystem even without getting the whole NFT. Then moving on to what are non-fungible fractions. You have, let's take the example of a music track. You know, I compose a music track. One music track, 1,000 copies, 1,000 people editions, right, are minted as NFTs. And all 1,000 holders are part of the community of the creator, right? Instead of selling it for, say, 1,000 atom, you can sell the music track for one atom and give, you know, and because it is being sold for only one atom, you know, you don't have to give up an entire ownership to the track itself, right? So the community can participate by owning a single edition of the NFT. Then moving on to derivatives, right? The same music track can be used for club mixes, house mixes, and so on and so forth, where the original metadata or the original asset itself does change. Then 
We have what are wrapped assets where the original metadata stays the same, but you add additional dimensions of metadata. So these are what represent non-fungible fractions of NFTs, right? What else can you do? You can utilize all these assets, non-fungible fractions, original NFTs, and put them into what are pools, NFT pools. Now, most of you might be, or some of you might be familiar with an app, the app on Ethereum called Pseudoswap, where NFT pools are created, and there is an opportunity for collectors to collect NFTs and you know, be able to participate in the ecosystem. More on pools a bit later, but these pools can be used for curation, distribution, monetization, and of course, you know, community participation. Pools, let's say, for example, are like a playlist of assets, right? So you have NFTs from multiple collections that go onto a pool. Now what happens with this pool is that, let's take the example of a pool with assets. You have your Shutterstock and your Getty images where people take a subscription to license and use the images across multiple dApps. Similarly, within NFT pools, you can utilize these NFTs for maybe commercial or non-commercial utilization. So an example of that might be IRL, in real life galleries or metaverse galleries that can utilize these NFTs from multiple pools. So you don't have to talk to 10 creators, you can just subscribe to a pool. That is the advantage of collective, collective assets and you know, putting these assets into a pool. That is one example. Platforms can use AI models that can be licensed from a pool. Games can use 3D assets that can be licensed from pools. My favorite, publishing platforms. Netflix can just subscribe to five pools and then curate all the content that's being published on Netflix. It can be used in live broadcasts, right? And so on and so forth. So there are multiple utilities of NFT pools and NFT pools are not just limited to individuals, but they are. It is possible for DAOs to run pools. A DAO, a creator DAO, a curator DAO, you know, a community can end up creating multiple NFT pools and then make sure to monetize each of these assets that they're curating and you know, make the most for their curated creators, which is when you have the original creator. So all the way from distributing to a publishing platform, you, know, you have your, the creator that created derivatives, the original creator of the asset, all of them receive revenue share proportionately distributed all on chain without any data reconciliation. Right? And of course, using the top assets or like most rare assets or scarce assets or most valuable assets, you can collateralize some of them, take a loan and then you know, maybe stake and then utilize the yield and share it back to pool owners or pool contributors. So this way NFT pools and NFTs, the NFT infrastructure on OmniFix works and where are we? We are at step one where we have the NFTs composed and we are getting them to be listed on the marketplace in multiple tokens. Again, a point to note, the Flix token is not yet live. Why is this important? <laughs> it is important because we are able to demonstrate the power of IBC, the power of app chains, the power of sovereign infrastructure. So this technically means that we are not running a sovereign chain on an island in an extremely isolated manner. We are able to connect multiple chains, bring those communities together, and there is no need for them to use only Flix, but they can use their own token. You can't expect, I mean... Giving the freedom, right? Yeah, <laughs> right, so, yeah, what does that freedom look like? If you are part of the Juno community, you can't expect them to use Osmo to buy their NFTs. You expect them to use Juno to get their NFTs. If you're part of the Huawei community, you can't expect them to get any other tokens. So this way we are making sure we bring together multiple communities, whether or not they have their infrastructure for NFTs on their chains. So this, is, this summarizes the infrastructure of NFTs on OmniFlix. And I'll move on to what are apps in the OmniFlix ecosystem? Over to you there. Well, so after you know, having been run through the infrastructure, I believe you, know, you might have doubts like how far did we come you know, till here with the marketplace and all. So starting from 2018, we've been focused on Studio, which kind of lets you mint, manage, and you know, uh, distribute the content. But you know, how do you monetize them? So there comes the marketplace where you could license, sell, and you know, do a lot of monetization activities using your NFTs. Then comes what 
how do you promote how do you you know take it to the next level so we built tv where you could you know promote yourself your collections and you know do a lot of activity that makes sure you kind of you know are taking nfts to wider audience moving on we realized that you know there is a lot of potential for creators and communities to come together in sync using the tool where they could run their staking I mean, staking governance and you know things like these to do more so well uh, moving on we'll, we are you know currently working on these apps that that are going to you know release in the near future omniflix me a social media uh, kind of you know social profile or social media kind of thing where you can follow or you know do a lot of things you know between creators and you know users uh, moving on, now we have Net, uh, Nucleus, which is our distribution platform, where which is open source. You could you know customize your mobile app, web, and you know things like these, and take you know a, a step forward to you know enable your own creators with your customized app. After you know which we thought you know definitely there is a lot of potential you know while doing all of these apps, we realized that you know there is a lot of financial activity that goes in between creators and consumers. So we built StreamPray to demonstrate programmable payments between creators, communities, and you know a lot of use cases that might you know come later. So well, I think that sums up the apps scenario or the apps ecosystem on OmniFlix. Uh, I'll let Sisla take on. And let you you know see how and what other things we're doing with partners and you know things like these. By the way, we bootstrapped Omniflix entirely by running our validator operations. So we are a validator first and then a network later. So this is the power of the Cosmos ecosystem where you can get involved. You can get involved in multiple aspects. We are doing whatever we can do. We, we did contribute to the Cosmos core base at other capacities, but not as Omniflix. But you know, we are running validators on 13 different networks. We work with studios, second labels, game development companies that are forking our chain to be able to build their own internal infrastructure. We have multiple dApps that are running on Omniflix, and of course, dApps on other six uh, ecosystems with apps like InSync. Moving on, I'll let Daya take over and explain the future of Omniflix when it comes to licensing and IP management. So well, um, I mean, having been worked in media for almost a decade, myself and Sisla, we've, we've kind of you know digitized a lot of content from you know its its physical stage to digitization at the same time distribution. We've seen a lot of problems, right? So we work with media houses for almost a decade where we kind of distribute it to Netflix, Apple, Amazon Prime, and you know you tell us, you know we, we kind of put content everywhere. But the thing is, uh, creators don't get the whole royal, I mean whole revenue as much as the distributor gets. So we realized that this is not fair and this this is not the way moving forward uh, then that's when we, we kind of quit because our major focus was enabling creators with more tools to let them do more by how enabling through licensing and you know uh, various other ways so let's look at licensing so what we're doing is we're enabling permissionless web3 uh, infrastructure for IP management along with you know for the uh, along with for the buy button we're building infra for the licensing button what does that mean like Bitcoin solve double spending problem for uh, store of value, we're solving double spending problem for IP management. So as you are all aware of how it works, like you know, you might be doubting. I mean, you might have questions like what, what, and how it might work. So uh, it works the way you know uh, you gotta stake your assets, and you know probably you kind of use extensibility and transferability, which are kind of available right now on OmniFlix. These, these were, you know, planned way ahead. Like, you know, we, we had these minds since 2016 and, you know, 15. Because our core was like, you know, to enable more. So these two, extensibility and transferability in combination, will give you a lot of scope to issue both exclusive and non-exclusive, you know, licenses for the assets. So what does this mean? Like Sisla said, right, we, we have pools and things like this. When you fractionalize rights and, you know, make sure you use them in different pools or, you know, or, you know different ways to take it forward, but thereby enabling, you know, additional monetization that flows back, you know, at the same time gives splits and royalties, likewise, as you do the settings. Yeah. So moving on, right, that was future of IP management on OmniFlix. Now, what is the future of social coordination on OmniFlix? These are the pools that we talked about earlier. We are looking at pools to be able to utilize them or utilize pools for curation, distribution, repurposing, licensing, and sub-licensing, right? And yeah, pools can be used for collecting NFTs, collaboration and distribution, collaborative licensing, and a lot more. 
creator guilds and DAOs will be able to utilize pools and create, curate, collaborate effectively. We are working on what is the infrastructure, not for user-generated content, which is a Web2 model, where the platforms benefited. We are working on what is community-generated content, which we believe is the future of social coordination when it comes to creation. That's the first step. Social coordination in terms of distribution is powered by pools. And of course, social coordination in terms of monetization is powered by the blockchain itself, where you do not have to you know, reconcile data, you know, attribute revenue, and so on and so forth. All of this is done permissionlessly on the blockchain. Right? So this is the future of Omniflix, the Omniflix hub, and in terms of both IP management and NFT pools. I know we are almost running out of time, but we have a few announcements to make, precisely. 10 announcements to make, right? So <laughs> the first one being, we will have auctions go live on Omniflix in October. We have had creators try this out on the FlixNet 4. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we have had creators try this out on Omniflix FlixNet 4, and we've received an immense, of course, feedback as well as a great response. Creators love the ease of access, ease of making sure auctions, auctions are configured and the way they go live. Moving on, we have what is an interact to claim module. So there are two types of interactions, but let me talk about one. You can burn an NFT to claim a fungible token. What is the first fungible token that'll be claimed? It'll be the Flix Ooh. token. So you can, thank you. You can burn what are your OG collector NFTs. You can burn what are your Flix drop NFTs and you can burn a lot more NFTs to be able to claim fungible tokens. Eventually, we'll have multiple combinations where if the first is an NFT to FT combination, you'll have what are NFT to NFT combinations where you can swap an NFT for another NFT in the pool and so on and so forth. You know, these are very important primitive, these are very important, I'll say features for the blockchain itself to be able to facilitate the creators and their communities to be able to interact and engage in better ways. Moving on. Cosm Wasm is coming soon to Omniflix. We have made sure, <laughs> thank you. We've, we've been observing and very closely following the development of Cosm Wasm right since day one. And we've started working on our contracts. And the first contract that we have worked on, you know, at least on the DevNet, is the Flix name service, where you will have the name service on the Omniflix blockchain itself. We see a lot of possibilities for that to happen and for creators that might, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, for, for communities that might not want to deploy a name service on their chain, they can definitely utilize this. Of course, we'll be interoperable with other networks like Stargaze that will also launch NFTs, name services, and so on and so forth, and be interoperable with them. That's three. Moving on to four, we have what is StreamPay for programmable payments. So StreamPay, like in one sentence, works like this. I can stream a set of tokens, fungible tokens, to any account block by block, right? What does that mean? The power is in being able to have, you know, curves, an incline curve or a decline curve, to be able to increase the total number of tokens streamed per block to reward loyalty. Or if I want to get work done faster by a freelancer, I can use a decline curve where I reduce the total number of tokens being streamed block by block. So this way, it facilitates a lot of trustless interactions in a live streaming context context. So if I am a creator, celebrity, right, and if there are audience that are watching, they can keep streaming tokens to me, my account. If I am being sponsored by, say, Coke, you know, Coke can stream back tokens to our audience. So this way, stream pay is a very integral part when it comes to infrastructure for programmable payments on Omniflix. Of course, of course. Other chains, other tokens can utilize this infrastructure, not only in the context of, say, streaming content, but also in other ways that they see fit. That's four. Moving on to five. There has been a snapshot, the fourth snapshot, for the Flix drop, which was taken on September 1st. Right? So people have been waiting for the Flix drop for quite a while. We received, you know, when Flix drop, when Flix token, and so on and so forth. But to be able to incentivize the people that trusted us, that supported us, that delegated with us, we made sure to get the, get the fourth snapshot in place, but this time it wasn't mentioned in advance or announced in advance. We made sure to take, take the snapshot first and then later announce. 
we were taking you know four snapshots to avoid spammers or airdrop chasers because it's like this, right? People just take and you know probably when they get dropped, they like unstake and move away. So we took time, unfortunately or unfortunately, because of my bad markets and various things, Flix didn't go public. But otherwise, I think you no, know, honestly, we'll have a great set that who stuck to us since inception. I believe there are a lot of cosmonauts who believe in us, and yep, that's what you know we're looking at. Yeah. So one quick point: without the Flix token, we've been able to bootstrap a lot on OmniFlix. Right? This proves that we are tailor-made for adoption. We are focused on the problem of adoption. We are not using cool tech, like blockchain tech, Web3 tech, to be able to, just for the sake of using that tech, we are utilizing that to solve a problem, to empower creators and our communities. And we proved that by working on multiple D apps with the fee grant module. So my account can pay fees or gas of your account. And what happens there is we were able to bootstrap all operations without the Flix token being present in a single account. Hey, not only NFT minting and collection, but we also made sure to relay packets. So all of our relayers use the fee grant module. So there's no Flix token, but IBC runs pretty seamless on OmniFlix, thanks to no. multiple supporters like Strangelove, multiple supporters like Notional, Crypto Crew validators, and everyone that has made this possible. Thank you to everyone. Again, that's number five. Moving on to number six. In October, OmniFlix will go permissionless. Up until now, we were making sure we give the fee grant access to creators that qualified some of our requirements, you know, passed our benchmark tests and so on and so forth, and made, we made sure to optimize for quality. But in the month of October, we'll go permissionless. Any community, any creator will be able to mint a collection and their NFTs on OmniFlix. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Number seven. Number seven. We will be working with Axlar to be able to power their academy. So maybe an academy dot Axlar network, you know, a learn dot Axlar network will be powered by Omniflix to be able to publish their content. This demonstrates sovereign publishing for communities. So every community here, every blockchain network here has more than technical development has a responsibility towards educating their communities. For that, we believe media is essential, and it is important for the community themselves to have control on their publishing. So when we talked about community-generated content, we were serious. What does that mean? So within these publishing platforms, people will be able to contribute content, contribute information, contribute resources, and then get published, get of course, recognition, and even, even more so than that, get grants and paid for their work. So we are first working with Axler, and we aim to work with multiple other communities to be able to power their sovereign publishing infrastructure for their educational or marketing, marketing uh, content. Number eight. We are this is big on... alpha, I believe. <laughs> right, so we are working on what is the interchain media DAO. Okay, quick context. Yes, developers are important. Developers need to have their own groups. Yes, developers need to coordinate. Yes, yes, yes. What about the non-technical folks? I don't quote myself. So we are building a DAO for community managers, business development folks, and people that evangelize a network. Bringing them together, we believe the interchain ecosystem will not only benefit from accurate information that distributes, but also they get to learn from each other. And this is very important because, yes, as some of you or all of you might know, you know, Cosmos is extremely underrated. Why is it underrated? Aren't we able to build? Do, do we not have the tech? Isn't Ethereum moving to POS? But, but, but. It is in the packaging and presenting, you know, thanks to multiple people like Crypto CETO, Friends Validator, Confident in Crypto, of course, Crypto Rich, and so many others that are on Twitter, making sure information is spread very well. We believe there needs to be additional coordination, and we're doing this on a credibly neutral blockchain, like Juno, where the interchain media DAO will, will exist, and as well, bring on board other people, like, you know, as you can see, Friends Validator, Crypto CETO, of course, OmniFlix, and so many others. 
We haven't yet completed our conversations with the others, like Confident in Crypto or Liam and others. So we did not have their names in place, but we have verbal agreements with them. So yeah, this has been extremely interesting for us. This has been an idea that we've been thinking of for a long time. Of course, we could do it on Omniflix, but we want to do it on Juno. <sighs> this is number eight. <clears throat> Moving on. We have a creator partnership that we'd like to announce. So, Chetan, it'll be great if you can play the video. Hi, I'm Sang Sweden, a music producer, pianist, and songwriter based in Stockholm, Sweden. I've been in the music industry for over 20 years and been charting with my songs all over the world. I believe the most important thing to be successful in the music business is curiosity and always be ready to pivot and try new things. And that is what led me into NFTs, and NFTs led me into Omniflix. I'm super happy to have met this team, and I totally believe they will be a part of the future. Very soon, we will be releasing our very first NFT together, and it will be called the Omni Owl. I came up with a very unique way to create PFPs with my piano, and I believe I'm the first in the world to create those, to be honest. So I hope that you join the family and grab your edition right now. Peace and much love. <laughs> we know music NFTs exist, but NFTs can also be created with music data. So, you know, it has been an immense a pleasure working with Songs of Eden to be able to conceptualize this, and it was all him, you know, not us. We are just providing the infrastructure. We are not creative guys. We are tech guys. So we are making sure creators can take advantage of all of this infrastructure and do what they do best, that is create. Of course, with this, we come to our final announcement, and today we are, okay, okay, okay. So, <laughs> For people that, are, that have attended the Flix Fest, so how many of you attended the Flix Fest yesterday? Woo! Thank you all for making it a resounding success. We were very happy to be able to have coordinated this from the other side of the world. And it is thanks to efforts of our very dear community member, Tardigrades founder, Eli. We have, <laughs> we have what are, we have what are, Nashian Crypto, I hope I pronounced it right, but they have been very instrumental in putting the Flix Fest together. Right? A huge round of... Uh, so Alex uh, and Juan, so yes. they're kind of building in a community in Colombia, uh, content made in Espanol to educate people on crypto and you know, various other things. So huge shout out to them. Yep. <laughs> So without them, it would have been impossible for us to be able to coordinate this and put this together from the other side of the world, right? Okay. Some of you might already be aware of the announcement, but today we are extremely proud to announce that we are working with, an, with a three-time Major League Baseball champion to support a social cause. That's the one final shill. So we are working with Kurt Schilling from the Boston Red Sox team to drop NFTs supporting the ALS cause, the campaign. Hey folks. We are very excited. Uh, time World we are very excited. Champion Kurt Schilling here. Uh, I am entering the world of NFTs, uh, dipping my toe in the water, and I'm doing it with Omniflix. I'm doing it uh, to raise money for ALS. We have a special, uh, very unique uh, NFT coming out, and um, I'm using these guys to do it, and hopefully it's going to be a collaboration and a partnership that goes well into the future, but uh, stay tuned for the upcoming uh, NFT from Kurt Schilling, which will feature uh, a little baseball to it, uh, some bloody socks, some Lou Gehrig, and ALS awareness. So anyway, uh, to my new friends at Omniflix, good luck with everything tonight. Hope you guys have a successful launch and uh, looking forward to many, many successful years together. Woo! <laughs> We are very happy because we are not dropping NFTs for the sake of dropping NFTs, but we are doing that to be able to support a social cause. We'll see how this turns out, but we believe this will be a major step in increasing adoption within, to the Cosmos ecosystem. Why? 
because people that might never have heard of NFTs or the Cosmos ecosystem or even Web3 will end up interacting with this campaign. And eventually, if they get involved, yeah, that's a plus one for Cosmos. So these are our 10 announcements. We are extremely excited to be here in real life at Cosmos 2022. And it's and surreal. <laughs> yeah, it has been a surreal experience. And again, a huge shout out to Crypto CEO, Basil, Yuri, and Fabian for putting Woo! <laughs> Thank you all. Before, before we let them go, I just wanted to come up. Um, how, how can you not love these guys? Come on, let's give it up we for them. love you all. <laughs> Thank like, you. Thank that was you. probably the most passionate presentation um, in crypto history. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for the Omniflix team for the past year. Like, Cosmos Wars would not be the same without them. Like Sisla said in the beginning, the ticketing platform, the live stream, the broadcast, all the visuals, all, everything that you see, the animations in the live stream, they did that, so they're not just partners, they're like part of the team. Yeah. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think, honestly, they're one of the most underrated teams in Cosmos. Yeah. I know the Flix token is not live yet, everybody wants to trade it, chill it, speculate. <laughs> but after all, it's all about the people, it's all about the technology, and you guys are <laughs> killing it. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Cito. It does mean a lot. <laughs> <laughs> much love. <laughs> These guys trusted us to what we do, and even when we were remote, even when we were not here, in, phys in person, last year was all virtual. We were this forward year, and we are here today. <laughs> this year, yeah. wherever Cosmoverse would be, we would have come down. Even on Mars. <laughs> yeah, like, right. also with the time zones, like, they just take calls at 3 a.m. in the morning. Like, I don't know if they ever sleep, <laughs> but um, anyways, uh, do you still have 10 more announcements, or was no. that it? Uh, okay. We're good, we're good. <laughs> so, <laughs> next year at Cosmoverse, 2023. We apologize you for taking uh, two hours of our time, it feels like. <laughs> but um, yeah, I hope um, you have a good time here. Welcome yep. to Colombia. Yep. And um, yeah, uh, I think we can go on with the next presentation. Yep. Thank yep. you. Yep. Thank, Thank you. All. you. Thank you all. Okay, so a couple of months ago, I jumped into a call with a team where we were talking about different stuff. One of those was how really blockchain technology can change the world. Also how blockchain technology can impact third world countries. It seems like it is created for third world countries really to solve many of our problems. And then we talk about communities and how to create a strong community. And we came to the conclusion that in order to create a strong community, you needed to actually add value to those people. After that conversation and seeing that we shared a lot of values, I decided to join this team, and I'm very proud of the Loop Finance team, and I ask you to please help me introduce Tom Nodward. Thanks guys, thank you for being here. Um, I really appreciate everyone taking the time. If you've talked as much as I have and drunk as much as I have and slept as little as I have over the last few days, then all you probably want to do is go and sleep. So I'm really happy. Thank you for, for coming here. Um, so my name's Tom from Loop Finance. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, DeFi NFTs and building Web3 communities. Uh, para los que hablan español, soy Tom de Loop Finance. Este, perdón, no te voy a hablar en español porque me cuesta mucho trabajo hablar de cripto en inglés, así que me cuesta mucho más en español. Así que bueno, perdón. Anyway, I would like to also thank our team. Without our incredible team, definitely we wouldn't even be here. A lot of you guys have traveled from all over the world, so thank you so much. And the amazing organized, organizing team as well, uh, thank you so much. So. <laughs> Before I go into um, to our presentation, I'm actually going to start off with a little story. Um, it's kind of the story of the last five years of, of my life. 
But it's also the story of the last five years of crypto because pretty much all I've done for the last five years is like look at my computer screen <laughs> and, um, and just, and crypto Twitter and TradingView and you know obviously the Loop platform and Telegram and Discord and all the other millions of wonderful things uh, that occupy most of our lives. Um, so this story starts in back in 2017. We actually, the first blockchain, um, I guess the application that we built was called Tribe. Uh, we built that on the EOS blockchain. Uh, for those of you who had anything to do with EOS, you'll know it was turned out to be a terrible blockchain, the worst user experience you've probably ever had in your life. <laughs> uh, block one at the time were making all these amazing videos about, you know, like they had like Brendan and Dan in this like slick skyscraper in Hong Kong. You know, I guess I bought into the, drank the Kool-Aid and bought into the FOMO and thought EOS would be the next, next best thing. Uh, so we decided to, to build an EOS. We ended up building a tokenized content community which was targeted at education. So obviously education in crypto is a big problem. Um, so we were incentivizing people to create educational content that earned tokens. Um, and it was, in some ways it was awesome. We built an incredible community, probably like 20 or 30,000 people. We had like 50 or 60,000 articles and pieces of content, educational content written, uh, which was really cool. Uh, but in the end, it was, it was a failure. Like I, I consider it a failure on some levels because um, I know kind of revenue is a bit of a dirty word in crypto. You know, people don't like to talk about revenue. Uh, but without revenue, you can't survive. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you're not making money, then your, your token's going to go to zero, your community's going to disappear, um, and you don't have enough money to pay your team, and there's only so long that they're going to work for free. Uh, so, you know, it's really hard to, to, to make revenue from, from content. Um, so, you know, around about this time, I kind of started to get really interested in, in DeFi because uh, DeFi, it kind of has the promise or it, it still has the promise really of, of being a way to, for, to, generate, to generate revenue, you know, as opposed to just, you know, transaction fees or gas fees from the chain. Um, and so that's when I started sort of looking into other chains. Obviously, I was a bit disillusioned with EOS by then. And, um, <laughs> made the amazing choice uh, to move to, guess which chain? <laughs> Terra. <laughs> Turned out to be an even worse decision than, than EOS. <laughs> so obviously I have a real knack at picking terrible blockchains. So um, no, that has all changed now though. Now we're part of, uh, moved to Juno, part of the amazing Juno community and the amazing Cosmos community. <laughs> Our curse has been lifted, hopefully. Our blockchain curse has been lifted. Um, and yeah, we're super happy to be, to be on Juno. Um, and you know, we've built an amazing DeFi protocol. We have, we have our DEX uh, and we have our DeFi NFT marketplace. Um, now, DeFi is awesome. You know, we, us DGENs fucking love DeFi. But you know, normal people are never gonna put their money into a volatile token and stick it into a liquidity pool and to lock it up in a farming or a staking contract so they can earn like 5,000% APY. Like that's just not something that most people like to do, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, most people don't like numbers that much. Um, and so, you know, as cool as DeFi is, it's just not something which is ever going to really probably get to the world or the rest of the world in its current form. Um, so this kind of realization, I guess, um, led us back, kind of back to the beginning, back to, back to community building, back to, to communities and, and NFTs, and how amazing NFTs can be at, at actually building communities and, and reaching normal people, I guess, normal people. Who's normal, but anyway. Um, and you know, we can see the success of some, some sort of um, things like NBA Top Shots, for example, which have reached you know, thousands, if not you know, hundreds of thousands of people who probably wouldn't have been involved in crypto before. Um, and you know, the, the ability of an NFT um, project to, to, to generate a really strong community and build a strong community. And we're humans, we love communities. You know, we love feeling like, we love feeling belonging. We love feeling a sense of belonging, being part of something, you know, identifying with other people who are in our group. Like, look at all of us here. We love being part of Cosmos. We love being part of Cosmoverse. You know, it's, it makes us feel special, it makes us feel part of something, but kind of unique at the same time. Um, so yeah, humans love, love communities and NFTs are perfect for building communities. 
Uh, but unfortunately, communities can't survive without revenue. At the end of the day, even a nomadic tribe is going to need you know, food and water and shelter. Otherwise, you know, they're not going to last, they're not going to last that long. Um, and kind of the same for, for, for NFT communities. You know, if NFT communities can't, at the end of the day, provide enough value to their users in one way or another, it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be money, but you know, often it is and that's nice. Um, so yeah, we kind of, I guess, realized um, that you know, NFTs are awesome, but at the same time, they're, they're a bit limited, maybe, in, in, in what, what they can do and what they can provide. And you know, if we look at the history of, of communities on the web, um, I mean, the traditional way of, especially in Web 2, of, of kind of monetizing a community has been through advertising, right? Like we've got Facebook, obviously Meta, sorry, not Facebook anymore. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, he's fucking loving this. He's like, this is awesome. You know, I'm, he's raking in $50 billion a year. And, but at the end of the day, you know, and all of, like, I mean, any successful platform is doing the same thing, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what is wrong with it is that all of that money that's being generated is just going to one company or two companies. It's not going back to all of the people who are actually generating the value, right? Actually in creating the engaging content or spending hours in front of their camera, like trying to create some educational video or doing a funny little dance or, you know, chatting to their friends or whatever people like doing. And I guess, you know, that's what we love about Web3, right? It's that, that promise of being able to create a more fair and more equitable distribution of, of revenue and value and to be able to drive revenue back and value back to the people who are actually creating, creating that revenue. Um, and so it's kind of led us, I guess, you know, going, going full circle here. I guess, you know, this is where we see that we can bring together the, the kind of the yield or the revenue generating abilities of, of DeFi and put them together with the, the, the community building and like super engaging aspects of NFTs and create kind of like this, this great hybrid where you can have a community of people which is also, you know, generating enough revenue at the end of the day uh, to sustain itself. And so that's what we're building. We're building software which enables that um, and which allows projects to, to be able to, to monetize their audiences or their communities, but at the same time, it allows them to be able to, to give, give back and create value for those communities. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what we're up to. We're also building software which allows people to do more with NFTs, like create gated communities, create exclusive content, you know, offer more to their, to their community than just, you know, just a profile pic or, or just a, a Discord channel. Um, so, yeah, moving on, I'll start with our presentation, but that's it, that's the story. <laughs> um, so, first thing we're doing, I kind of went through where we've come from, um, and we're really looking at ways to, you know, how to, how to bring more utility uh, to NFTs. And the first, first one we've done is we've created NFTs which are stakeable for tokens. So, any fungible tokens can be added to these NFTs, uh, the NFTs can be minted, they can be airdropped, you can do whatever you like with them. Um, and, you know, you can have multiple tiers of, of NFTs, as you can see down here. Each tier can have, you know, different numbers of tokens attached to them, just like different rarities of, of regular NFTs. We also have attributes, like regular attributes as well. Um, and, you know, we've kind of identified a whole bunch of use cases for these NFTs. First one is airdrop NFTs. You know, a lot of us in the cosmos, we're used to airdrops, but at the end of the day, you know, you know what happens with airdrops. Everyone gets super excited about the airdrop, everyone gets their airdrop, and they often just dump the tokens. And that doesn't really drive or bring value for the, for the protocol. Um, so with our airdrop NFTs, you can actually airdrop them a, an NFT, which has a bunch of tokens attached, but they have to stake the token and they have to claim the rewards over a period of time. And that means that they have to constantly come back to the platform in order to claim, be claiming their rewards, which means that obviously, you know, they're coming back, they're at least engaging with your platform, you know, for months, if not years, if you want to do it out, spread out over years. And so that kind of, you know, creates a little bit more value. Uh, we also have fundraising NFTs. I went through the kind of the minting process before where we have different 
uh, different mints. So you can use, you know, a protocol can launch an NFT collection, attach their tokens, raise some funds, and then distribute their tokens through the, the, staking, the staking contract. Uh, we have collaboration NFTs, where you, know, you can have multiple protocols collaborating with an NFT, multiple tokens in the NFT, and the, you, know, you can kind of have this cross-pollination between the communities. Uh, investor NFTs, very similar to the fundraising ones. And then we've got our liquid liquidity incentive NFTs. This is another big problem for a lot of protocols. How to get liquidity. And you know, most of the time, we use liquidity mining or farming, and that's awesome. You know, there's high APYs and people make money for a bit, but as soon as that dries up or as soon as the pool gets too big, people just, you know, they, they pull out, they pull their liquidity out and they dump all their tokens that they've farmed. So again, it's kind of like an airdrop, like it's a, it's a short term, like boost, but at the end of the day, it's not really long term, really long term sustainable for the protocol. Um, and then poll NFTs, protocol owned liquidity NFTs. This is kind of like the next stage you know, where instead of just incentivizing like short-term mercenary capital or farmers, protocols can actually start to accumulate their own liquidity and then at the end of the day they don't even need people to provide liquidity. They've got enough liquidity in their pools and they can even generate extra revenue or income from the, the transaction fees. And apart from that we're exploring a whole lot of other use cases as well. Uh, I'll move along to the next one. So yeah, airdrop NFTs, I talked about this a little bit stops people from dumping their tokens, promotes long-term engagement. Um, but, you know, it can also be used, for, like we're also working on kind of task-based NFT, you know, task-based airdrops where people have to complete a certain number of tasks before they get their NFT. That's also kind of great for engagement and incentivizes. And we're actually about to do a really cool collaboration with Kajira. Some of you probably know, most of you probably know Kajira, where we're going to have a bunch of tasks that people need to perform, maybe like put some loop on Kajira's marketplace and you know put some kooji on loop stacks or whatever and then you know after they've completed the task they'll get an nft which has both loop and kooji tokens attached um, now these nfts i mean they're tradable assets as well right so if you don't want to stake it and wait six months to claim all your tokens you can actually sell it and that's not too bad for the protocol either because at the end of the day the protocol can get revenue from every single secondary marketplace sale they can have a commission on those NFTs, which enables them to generate revenue. Um, next one, fundraising investor NFTs. This is a great way for protocols to distribute their tokens. With most IDOs, you know, there's kind of like, often there's a bit of a whale situation going on where the same people are always getting the large allocation of tokens. Because our NFTs, the, our, our launch pad is randomized, everyone pays the same price. Some lucky people get a ton of tokens. <laughs> and others don't get many. So, you know, they, they'll get at least the value that they paid, possibly, but, you know, it, it's a great way of kind of randomizing distribution to the community. Um, and again, you know, if people don't want to hold on to their position, like, you know, if you invest in IDO and you've got, vest, you know, t tokens vesting over a period of time, you have to wait until that's finished, even if you don't like the protocol anymore. Even if they post something stupid on Twitter and you get pissed off with them and you're like, I hate these guys, you still have to collect their tokens, but of course you're just going to collect them and dump them. So this enables the, the IDO investors to be able to sell those NFTs and again, it generates another source of revenue for the protocol. Um, I know you guys are getting tired, so I'm almost done. Uh, we have liquidity incentive NFTs, as I mentioned before. Protocols can get people to provide liquidity to, their, to their, one of their pools and then lock up their LP tokens into a, an NFT which has extra rewards on top of it and has a fixed amount of rewards. So unlike a normal farming pool where based on the amount of liquidity it goes up and down, you know, this is like a fixed number of tokens over a certain period of time, but the protocol benefits because they know that they've got that amount of liquidity locked up for at least sort of a three or a six or a 12 month period until the pool is big enough to actually start generating enough volume that it ends up being you know, profitable or worthwhile for people to provide liquidity to it without too many extra incentives. Um, and of course, at the end of the period, the liquidity providers can unstake their, their liquidity, unstake their NFTs and, and withdraw their liquidity as well. Or if they want to exit their position, they can, they can sell the NFT. Uh, and the last one, poll NFTs, again, as I mentioned, protocols who want to own their own liquidity can offer people to mint an NFT with their LP tokens and then 
they, the, the liquidity gets transferred to the protocol, goes into the treasury of the protocol, protocol own, earns revenue on that, on that liquidity, on that pool, and then the new F NFT owner gets to harvest like a large number of tokens. Now this creates obviously a bit of short-term sell pressure, but at the end of the day, the protocol no longer, they can stop incentivizing liquidity after a certain period of time. And collaboration NFTs, I kind of went, went a bit through this one before, so I'll skip over that. And conclusion, we're always looking for new and cool things to do with NFTs. So if you have any great ideas, come chat to us. Or if you'd like to use any of our NFTs in your protocol, come and chat to us. Um, and we're always looking, as I said, to kind of you know, add even more functionality, not only on the DeFi side, but also on the community side. So creating a community platform which allows NFT projects to you know, create gated content or gated chats or something like that you know, to give more value back. Because obviously the more utility we can give to NFTs, the better off, the better, the better place the world is going to be. Um, and in conclusion, final use case for NFTs. If you guys have not downloaded our app, we have a party tonight and the ticket is an NFT. <laughs> so just download our super cool app. <laughs> We know it's still a little bit buggy. Literally, we've been working on it up until the last minute, which, as many of you know, you know, was released at like 2 p.m. today. There's still a few bugs. We're aware of those. It's still just a test version. Uh, sorry if you've had trouble. The Wi-Fi here sucks as well, so that hasn't helped. But um, each of these NFTs, they're five bucks. They come with a drink token, so you stake it and you collect a token. Someone just won a bottle, actually. One of the five bottles got, just, got, just got won, so someone paid five bucks for a bottle, which was nice. Um, you might win a bottle, there's only four left. Uh, and yeah, you'll scan those at the door. Um, this is a wallet created by the amazing Obi crew. I don't know if these guys are here, are they? Evan and Pete, are you guys in the room? A lot of you guys might know Evan and Pete from Terabytes. These guys are fucking champions. Sorry, excuse my language. They've built this awesome wallet, which um, for normies is a no-brainer. You just download the wallet, and when you create um, your wallet, it doesn't just create a single wallet like most wallets do. It actually creates a multi-sig contract, which you own all the keys to, except one. One you can have owned by a friend, or you can have it owned by Obi, like a third party who you trust. The other keys are owned one by your device, one by your biometrics, one by your phone number, and one by your email address. No, a secret word. And so it means that even if you lose your device, you can actually restore it because it's a, like a two or four or two or five multi-sig. Uh, you can restore it. You don't need to write down a seed phrase. How cool is that? As you, most of you guys know, for us, writing down seed phrases is part of everyday life. I've got like 500 seed phrases at home. But for normal people, they're going to be like, what's this seed phrase? They're not going to want to sit there you know, at a cafe and write down a 24-word seed phrase just to pay for their coffee or to pay for a ticket. Um, so, yeah, really awesome app. Definitely recommend downloading it when you can get access to Wi-Fi. And thank you so much to the OB team for creating it. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful night. And Oh, the party is going to be insane. It's at a, an amazing venue. We've hired, like, literally probably the best production company in Medellin, and we've got some amazing local, like, very popular DJs. And the venue is sick. So, yeah, come and party. Thank you. I'll see you over there, Tom, at the Cosmic Five Loop party. Up next, we got Ricardo, tech lead at Desmo. Desmos, did Desmos. I say it right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Ricardo. I'm the tech lead of Desmos. And today, I'm going to talk about the past, present, and future of 
uh, the project that I work at. So first of all, before beginning, a little introduction to Desmos, to what it is, for all of you that don't know. Desmos, it's a protocol made for developers that want to create social enabled applications in a decentralized way. So we have built all the foundations for developers to create decentralized socially enabled applications in the last three years, pretty much. And now we're going to see what we have done, where we are now, and what we are going to do in the future. So first of all, last year we were at the first Cosmoverse conference in November 2021. And at that time, we talked about the current problems with social networks, like centralized social networks, how Desmos aims at solving them, so the mission of Desmos. We announced the release of the first feature of Desmos, so the Desmos profile, which is this unique identity that you can get in order to access all the social networks built on top of Desmos. And we also launched the Desmos uh, DSM Fairdrop for all the stakers of 11 different chains. So how did things go since then? What happened uh, until uh, since last year? So a couple of weeks later uh, that we announced the, um, the Desmos um, we, a, a Fairdrop, we started it. So two weeks later than the Cosmoverse, the Fairdrop started. And we can say that we got quite a huge reaction from the community, but not the ones that we expected. We can see that there were a lot of comments about it because what we require users to do is we require them to connect external accounts to their Desmos profile, but to do this, we ask them to input their mnemonic phrase into our applications. And the community was quite loud to tell us that, yeah, that wasn't the way to go. So we immediately fixed that, and a couple of hours later, we actually released different applications that allow you to claim the, your airdrop without having to input your mnemonic phrase. So first of all, we got Forbolex, our wallet that allowed you to claim it using the ledger. Then we got GoFindMe, which allowed you to claim it using Kepler. And finally, the Cosmos Station team helped us by implementing the ability to claim the airdrop within the mobile uh, wallet themselves. So. All of this happened in November 2021. The next month, we were focused on coding while all our friends were out there on the snow, like skiing, having fun. We sat down and start coding, kept building, because we knew that the next month, on January 2022, we had to list on Osmosis. So we listed, we created the two pools, DSM Atom, DSM Osmo, as usual, and we were fine with that. Next month, February 2022, the airdrop ended. So this allowed us to onboard more than 29,000 Desmos profile associated to more than 43,000 recipients of the airdrop for an overall amount of more than 60,000 connected external chains to those Desmos profiles and more than 6.3 million DSM claims. So after this airdrop, we got quite a huge amount of users that could use the Desmos protocol from that time onward. So the DSM Ferro was a very, very good way to onboard users into our uh, protocol. On March 2022, we announced the Desmos grant program. This is a grant program that is still ongoing and allows, application, allows users and developers that want to contribute to the Desmos community to request a grant in order to either like develop tools, applications, do marketing, community stuff, or design stuff to help us grow either the community or build products on top of Desmos. In April till June 2022, we pretty much got all fucked right? Because the bear market came. So Luna crash, Bitcoin crash, everyone got fucked. And what we did is we sat down and thought, all right, so most of our money is gone. What are we going to do now? So we decided to simply put back our McDonald's hat and start building again. So during that time, what we did is we completed all the modules that we had in our roadmap. And these are the modules that I was talking about in the beginning, which allow developers to build socially enabled applications on top of Desmos. So we have the profiles module, which represents, again, the unique identity among all Desmos applications. We have the subspaces module, which allows developers to create their own subspace within Desmos where to post content. We have the post module, which allows to create those content, the reactions to react, and the reports to report bad content. 
Aside from this, we also added full support for Cosmosm to our chain. So we created custom bindings so that developers can create applications even easier in, on top of our protocol. We released the stable version of DevJS, which is our TypeScript library that allows Web 2.0 developers, so they don't need to have access or knowledge about the blockchain and all those kind of things, to create on top of Desmond. So if you are a Web 2.0 developer and want to get started into the Web 3.0 world, what you can do is you can simply use DevJS to build application on top of Desmos without knowing how those transactions need to be signed, broadcasted, et cetera, because DevJS will take care for you uh, for, of that. And finally, we also released the stable version of our GraphQL endpoints because we know that Web 2.0 developers are not used to interacting with the chain and querying the chain data directly. So what we did is we built a middle layer that uh, developers can use to get those data more easily and in a way that's more familiar to them. So all of this um, helped us build something that developers could use, but users that were onboarding during the airdrop started asking, all right, like, this is great, uh, we have the DSM, we could use them, but there is no platform where to use it, right? So Desmos is good, but when social network? And this was actually one question that we got a lot at our booth during these two days, like, when are we going to be able to use something that is built on top of Desmos? And the answer actually is soon, but it's very soon, because the first one it's being developed right now is Scripta, and this is a decentralized publishing platform, very similar to Medium, that allows users to earn through the reward system that they have built in. And this platform, unlike Medium that requires you a Google login, simply relies on the Desmos profile to work, so it's completely anonymous, and you can start using Scripta from now going on the website scripta.network, and you can also follow them on Twitter at scripta.network. So if you're a content creator and you would like to create content in a decentralized way, in an anonymous way, to prevent, to protect your privacy and make sure that your content gets never deleted due to censorship or whatever, you can do this right now going on scripta.network. A second application that has been built on top, of net, on top of Desmos and it's currently being developed is Alexandria. This is a decentralized and permissionless encyclopedia, so it's pretty much Wikipedia but built on top of Desmos that stores all the text on IPFS, so in a completely censorship resistance way, and the directory of that content is instead stored on Desmos. This means that if you are a content creator and you want to provide someone with some knowledge, making sure that that knowledge never gets deleted, you can do it right now. You will be able to do it on Alexandria once it gets released. One thing that is very interesting to this platform is that in order to perform all the operations, so uploading or editing content, it will require you DSM, and this is going to be a way to incentivize people to behave correctly. They have also implemented a slashing for bad behavior in a way that users that want to post like bad content, maybe fake news or wrong information within Alexandria, are going to get slashed, or they're going to get punished, and no like information wars will be ever um, can exist inside Alexandria, unlike it is right now in Wikipedia, in which we have different communities that try to edit the same Wikipedia page to make one reality prevail over the other one. And Alexandria is currently being developed, and the beta is coming in Q1 2023. So in a couple of months, you will also be able to use Alexandria as well. So these two projects were funded thanks to the Desmos Grant Program that I talked about before. But actually, as um, Forbo, we decided that, yeah, it's good to have someone that develops outside of it, but we need to make something. And Butter is the, uh, the reply to that need of doing something by ourselves. So Butter is a very, very easy to use mobile application that all users will be able to use to get into the world of decentralized social networks. And it allows you to write content and obtain engagement of the content. 
the problem that we wanted to solve with Butter is to make sure that all users, even the ones that do not know anything about a mnemonic phrase, a transaction, uh, crypto, and all those kind of things, can get into the Web 3.0 world without having those like problem of understanding and learning all those kind of things before getting into it. So what we have tried to do is we have to try to simplify as much as possible, making sure that users still have control over, those, over their account, but do not have to confirm everything and go through the process of learning a lot of things before using it. So Butter will also allow you to have access to some Web 3.0 features so that users can easily get used to them. One of them is going to be the ability to mint NFTs from content and then use those NFTs to access features of the application within the application itself. So maybe you're a content creator, some of your posts reach a lot of users, they get a lot of reactions, they get a lot of comments. What you can do is you can mint an NFT out of that content and then burn that content or maybe sell to someone that is willing to buy it. We have seen people buying Twitter, like the first tweet on Twitter for like millions. Maybe you can do the same thing with your content. Another thing that Butter will allow you to do is it will allow you to create your own decentralized community so that if you're a content creator, you can make the users of those community more active, maybe like organizing events or providing them with some content that they cannot access from anywhere else. Butter is currently set to be released in Q1 2023 as well, and you can follow the development of it at Twitter at Butter the app. So all of this is coming in the next months. All these applications are being developed in the next months. But what we are focused as uh, Desmos is not only providing support for these applications, but also much, much more. One thing that we will be doing is we'll be integrating new Cosmos features into the Desmos core. One of them is going to be the interchain account, the support for interchain accounts, so that if you have a Desmos profile and maybe you have a Cosmos account or an Osmosis account or an Akash or whatever, you can link those accounts together thanks to the use of interchain accounts. This will make it easier for users to create a Desmos profile that has multiple verification sources and so makes sure that those profile represents a single person instead of another one in order to reduce fake accounts and impersonators and whatever. Also, we want to add the ability for the apps to have their own custom tokenomics, so maybe have their own custom tokens or provide ways for users of those platforms to earn some money through the usage of them. Another thing that we want to do, of course, is to support developers that want to build on top of Desmos. And the best way to do it right now is joining our Discord. So if you are a developer that maybe, like even a Web 2.0 developer that doesn't know anything about transaction and all those kind of things, you can reach out to us and we will provide you with support in order to realize your vision on top of Desmos. The final thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that everyone can access and start using Web 3.0 social networks. And this is going to be done by integrating Desmos feature into existing platforms and existing applications that users already use. One usage is probably going to be on-chain governance proposal discussion. So if you're currently um, a, a staker of any chain, you know how much, are, like how hard it is to discuss a non-chain governance proposal. Usually, for example, on the Cosmos Hub, proposals go on discussion on the Cosmos Forum, then they get discussed when they are proposed on chain, but then when they are on chain, discussion happen maybe in Discord or Twitter or whatever else. And what we want to do is we want to merge all those things together to make sure that stakers and delegators can discuss those proposals without having to move on another platform or multiple applications. And so we want to create the ability to give the users the ability to discuss those on-chain governance proposals directly into explorers such as MinScan, Big Deeper, or Ping.pub, or, or any other kind of explorer that users are used to use. So 
in general, what we want to do is we want to get users into the world of decentralized social networks very, very easily. And to do this, we're going to help any developer that wants to develop something on top of Desmos. So if you have any idea that you want to develop on top of Desmos, make sure you come and stop by our booth in the next days so that we can talk about it, see how we can help you with that and how you can get started. Finally, if you want to connect and stay in touch with us, you can do so following those links, like the Desmos website, Desmos.network, is the best place to find all the links, all the information that you need. You can follow us on Twitter at Desmos Network. You can join our Discord at Discord.Desmos.Network. If you are a developer, you will get a lot of support from that. And finally, if you want to check out your code and see how you can build on top of it and integrate with it, you can do so following our GitHub repo at Desmos Lab. So thank you very much, and I cannot wait to see you at the booth if you have any idea and you want to work with us. All right, before we wrap it up for day two, we have a gaming slash NFT panel, and your moderator will be Shidam with CNN Turkey. So everybody, let's welcome Shidam. <laughs> Uh, today we will be uh, with experienced profes professionals uh, in the NFT gaming space. Uh, the NFT gaming space is uh, attracting a significant amount of attention. There are 2 billion potential NFT game players uh, and over 600 million crypto investors. Play-to-earn games appear to be uh, aspiring to join these interests and the people within them. Our amazing panelists here today include uh, Lucas Untarsus, co-founder of Calipar, claims to create real-world value with a captivating gaming experience on the blockchain. Welcome, yeah. yeah. Lucas. <laughs> and Carlos Guzman. Researcher and analyst at the block. Uh, he is writing enterprise facing reports for the block. Hi. At the request uh, for enterprise clients. Great to be here. Uh, Blaise Cavalli, uh, head of DeFi and lead in the Cosmon project. Cosmon. <laughs> Hi, Blaise. Hello, everyone. Uh, Cosmon is a new generation and first of its kind NFT play to earn game based uh, on the Cosmos ecosystem. Welcome all to uh, the Cosmos stage. Uh, let's start with the first question. Uh, the, um, this question actually like, is for all panelists. Um, NFTs and blockchains are exciting technologies with huge monetization potential for the gaming space. On monetization of NFT games, what are the biggest pain points you feel in the process of the monetizing? Lucas. Okay, um, so sorry for my voice. Medellin has been very good to me, so <laughs> I'm a little bit uh, sore in my throat. Um, I think the main problem, uh, the main point point is that a lot of games, they don't really um, use the full potential of NFTs in, in gaming. Um, so when we have all those NFT games, what generally happens is people buy the NFT and then they can enter the game and start playing. 
And when that happens, another player enters or buys the NFT of the secondary sale compared to what it is in Web2, you actually lose one sale because in Web2, every single sale, the revenues goes directly to the company. That's the way they monetize the game. And to solve that problem, we need to use the potential of NFTs to capture value um, that Web2 couldn't capture. So a good example of this would be, for example, um, in, in an RPG game, a character in level 1 is obviously less valuable than a character in level 100. So if you buy the character on level 1, level it up and you can sell it more expensive later on, that will also lead to increased revenues for the company because the royalty fees that they hold on that NFT gets higher. So like that we can counteract the problem that um, we lose sales when a sale happens on the secondary marketplace. Uh, before the, your hands for Carlos, uh, I want to introduce uh, our another uh, panelist, Luis Londona Noreno. Welcome on the stage, Luis. Uh, Luis is manager of Web3 Developments at Monastery. Um, um, I was asked the, our first question. Uh, I would you like to repeat for you. And, uh, on monetization of NFT games, I mean, what are the biggest pain points you feel in the process of monetizing? monetizing. Okay, the, the first thing I, 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 I notice is that there are crypto games that they want to monetize NFTs. But the thing is that uh, we need to start between the games to monetize NFTs. I think that the, the first step, it need to be uh, in the other way. Not from the, the crypto people trying to do a game, and trying to, to develop something that, that they think it would be useful. So they, they need to join both parts. A uh, very crypto, crypto team, an excellent crypto team, and an already uh, gaming a studio that has been successful. Yeah. Carlos? Cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of frictions um, or pain points, I think right now, just crypto and blockchain games, um, the crypto functionality, unfortunately, just provides a huge point of friction for gamers. So it's not very friendly for kind of mainstream users who are not crypto native. They don't want to kind of have to go to an exchange, buy some tokens, then go to an NFT marketplace, buy some NFTs, uh, you know, download the wallets, download everything that you need to play a crypto game. And after just like a lot of time of effort, actually get to the meat of the gameplay. I think currently that turns off a lot of m most um, game users. So those are like kind of huge pay points. Uh, as long as the blockchain functionality is kind of so front and center and provides those frictions, I think crypto gaming might have a tough time reaching a wider market. Um, so um, whatever kind of infrastructure providers, game mm -hmm. developers can do to simplify the experience, streamline it, uh, maybe kind of hide the blockchain functionality in the back end a little bit, uh, that's maybe what, when we're going to see crypto gaming uh, reach the mainstream. Right. Blaze? Yes, from my side, I think it's really important if you want to integrate NFT within a blockchain game to provide a strong fundamental value to your NFT. If you want to monetize it, you need to create a usage value, a financial value behind it for people who buy it to really possess something. It's not only about gaming items that everyone would like to have, but if you have only a small communities, your items need to still have a strong value and a stable one. So I think it's something very important to not being categorized as a Ponzi scheme or like if your community is decreasing, how you keep providing a real and concrete value to your user, to your players, and that's something really hard to find and which hasn't been really seen in the existing blockchain game, I think. Right. Thank you, guys. And uh, this question for uh, Lucas, Luis, and Carlos. A common view is, the, is that play to uh, earn models are massively flawed and may never excite gamers. Uh, what approaches are you all talking at, like Calipar? Uh, is, is that correct, pronounce it? Yes. Calipar. Calipar or monastery, considering uh, this perceived flaw? And how can we use the tech in a way that benefits the players and will get them excited? Yeah, so I think one of the main points why we fail to attract gamer is, as before was said perfectly well, the user experience. So we have to work a lot on that. 
But then the second one is also that the whole play to earn concept is pretty flawed because it's just an economic reality that not everyone can earn and games cannot print money. So we, if someone wants to earn money, someone else has to spend money. And um, that's why I don't even like the play to earn name at all. I prefer to talk about blockchain gaming or NFT gaming. Um, and then we're talking about a model where we used NFT technology um, to capture value that was lost in Web2 and provide users with new possibility um, to capture the value, make it tradable. So we had the example before that I said with the leveling up heroes. You can do the same like with user-generated content. Um, when we talk about shooter games or racing games, there is like user-generated skins. Um, there is possibilities to use all season passes for special tournaments. There's all kinds of ways how you can use NFTs and to, to increase the value over time that um, the player can get from them. And create kind of like they spend the time to get those NFTs and make it tradable. You create that player to player um, economy or player to player trading mm -hmm. system that um, gets some players the possibility to provide a service by let's say leveling up a hero, let's say creating a skin, and another player pays for that service because he doesn't want to spend the time on it. But in the end, it's like literally to create a system where everyone kind of wins with it. The player that doesn't want to spend the time, he will spend time on it. He doesn't mind spending the, t uh, spending the money on it. He doesn't mm -hmm. mind to do that because he loves to play the game. And on the other hand, you have the player that maybe likes, likes another aspect of the game and can monetize that. And for him, it's a play to earn. For the other one, it's a play for fun. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's the point. Carlos? Yeah, no, I, I think Lucas covered it exactly yeah. right. Um, <laughs> I, I think the issue and like why player and games haven't been sustainable so far is because they really haven't been fun. Uh, like the only reason people have been trying to play them Absolutely. is to try to make money off of them. Uh, and as Lucas was saying, the money has to come from someone. Uh, <laughs> so uh, eventually kind of like the, the house of cards falls down um, once like money isn't, number isn't going up, uh, people start playing. And that's what we've seen in the, in the data. Uh, once the uh, kind of bull run that we saw was over, uh, lots of like kind of user numbers really plummeted for a lot of these games. Mm -hmm. So I think um, blockchain games uh, have to actually add the element of fun, uh, kind of have a community of gamers that actually want to be there because they see value in the game. They want to invest in the game uh, to draw value from it, contribute value uh, to other players. And you can use all of these uh, crypto economic mechanisms to uh, allow kind of players, users, stakeholders to contribute value to the game uh, in different ways uh, and kind of co-create that experience uh, in ways that we really haven't seen before. As, as Lucas was mentioned, mentioning um, kind of user-owned and created content uh, through governance, all sorts of like kind of really mm -hmm. new interesting mechanisms that we can add. Uh, but I think the fundamentals have to be there in terms of uh, fun uh, kind of gameplay for the game. Uh, Luis, uh, by the way, is, uh, can you explain uh, the uh, monastery? Because y your project is one of the first NFT project in Colombia, right? Yes, yes. Uh, so monastery uh, is the first luxury brand in Colombia. And this year we're selling $20 million uh, in just three years. So this is our first NFT drop. And the idea is to create a community around it. So in gaming, what I, what I see is that, for example, I was a Call of Duty player. Uh, I entered more Warfare 2. I would love to see my skins, things that I can use in real life to use it in my, in, my, in my gaming, in my PC, in my PS4, PS5. So it would be so cool to, to start seeing what I bought uh, at the store with my, with my avatar. So th those type of things on, on with the gaming can be done with the NFTs. I think NFTs uh, is the next step. I think NFTs, uh, since they were conceived as, as Vitalik, uh, when he was nerfed, he soared in WoW. Um, that's the that's the go the go to play. We're go everything is go is being gamified, applications, mm -hmm. uh, everything process. You enter a, a web page, and the user experience. You always try to look at gamified. So uh, NFTs will be a, an excellent uh, add-on. To, to every every single business you do, every single process you're gonna do. Thank you. Uh, the question uh, is for Blaze. Um, 
Cosmon, Cosmon, uh, your project is like is described uh, as a gamified investment product. First of all, uh, can you define that more for the audience? Yes, maybe it's important just to give a little bit of context. So Cosmon is launched by the Key Foundation. Uh, Key Foundation is managing the key chain where we are building our own regulated DeFi product which are distributed in, in our own decentralized investment community called Club. So investment spirit is in our blood and when we wanted to launch our own play to earn game, it was natural to infuse the investment spirit in it. So basically we are mixing two things. So Cosmo is first a play to earn game, a deck building a digital card game where you can uh, acquire uh, past historical leaders in form of NFT. Uh, so I am uh, this guy in uh, Napoleon. There is my colleagues uh, in Julius Caesar and Cleopatra, which are, uh, who are some of our historical leaders. Then we invite our players to build uh, a deck of three Cosmon leaders and engage in fight between each other. So it's an automated fighting experience uh, where uh, players need to optimize the affinities of Cosmon leaders within their decks and then have the most powerful deck. So that, that's the basis of the, of, the, of the game. But on the other side, when you buy a Cosmon NFT, you also acquire a share of a DeFi treasury. So we use all the NFT sales proceeds to fuel a DeFi treasury allocated to the most promising asset within the Cosmos ecosystem. These assets are staked, then they generate a yield which is used to paid and to redistribute uh, the, the, the yield to NFT holders, but also to fuel a price pool which is dedicated to best performing players. Then, even if you don't play to the game, just owning an NFT is owning a share of the of a DeFi treasury and receiving a weekly yield, which is quite interesting regarding mm -hmm. the performance of the Cosmos ecosystem. And in addition to this, you can play to the game, you can engage with the gameplay and pretend to an interesting prize pool, so it's several thousand of dollars uh, for weekly championships, so it's quite interesting. And even with a, a low barrier of entry, our first, uh, the, the lowest cost, the, the, lowest, the lowest price of the of a Cosmon card is only one atom. So for three atoms, you can enter the game and pretend to a few thousand of dollars of prize pool per, per week. And then it enables you to progress within the game, to increase the value of your Cosmon card, to earn more yield, and that's how we provide a, a strong fundamental value to, mm. to our NFT, uh, NFT cards. Okay. I have one more question after this, like, uh, game items. And, uh, yeah, Lucas and Luis, uh, what's the path you see to make play-to-earn games sustainable? Um, I think the main thing that we need is getting out of the crypto community and get into the gaming community because that's as we said we get then the players in that are willing to spend money on games. We have seen that Web2 gaming communities they spend fortunes on their favorite games and that's the only way we can make it sustainable and to do that I think we need to cater and we will cater them more in the future so the user experience has to improve a lot we have been talking about that and the second thing is the game just needs to be fun like personally I'm still playing web 2 games because I haven't found a single crypto game that I actually enjoy playing enough to spend time on it and yeah I think those two things will change uh, games will get better and the user experience will also get better we get more integrated apps where it becomes no more natural for the players to uh, to, where it feels like a Web2 game basically, but it's mm -hmm. just leveraging the technology of NFTs in ways that we have been covering before to add value to them and add value to the companies that provide the games. Okay, okay. Uh, I think Lucas said uh, all, I am, I'm just going to expand some parts I like. For example, in the user experience, when you use a uh, Web2 app, uh, a 2.0 app, you upload the video and you are not thinking it's an MP4 with these megabytes, blah, blah, blah. No, you just upload it from your phone. So we need, we need that user experience in cryptocurrency. Sometimes when, you, when they launch a game, you need to buy the token, transfer to a wallet, then bridge it. Uh, I don't see the token. Oh, I need to add the RPC. <laughs> yeah, so it's all that process, it makes it difficult for the for the retailers to, to go in, in in a gaming when you want to be relaxed, when you want to be just chilling. Also, there are a lot of things to be developed. So you can be thinking about a lot of stuff. The, 
for example, Disney is doing this scavenger hunt with the NFT, so AR NFTs are going to be huge. I, I haven't seen a lot of development in that area, but I think that that's mm -hmm. the next step. We were taking this metaverse thing everywhere. Yeah. And also, Carlos, I would like to your pers love to hear your perspective. Yeah, no, the, like I fully agree with these two. Uh, and <laughs> as, as Lucas mentioned, um, kind of actually making these uh, kind of games fun and reaching out to the entirety of the of the gaming community. I think part of it uh, that would definitely be very important to like make, making them sustainable. And part of what's needed there is, I think. The traditional gaming community has been very skeptical of NFTs so far, and they've, uh, I think, um, kind of been in in the past very skeptical of uh, kind of like novel ways of monetizing, like loot loot boxes and other mechanisms uh, that they feel uh, kind of are besides the game or uh, potentially are, are not necessarily aligned uh, with kind of their interests. Uh, so they've been skeptical of, of publishers. I think as the user experience improves, as as Lucas uh, and Juan mentioned. Um, there also has to be kind of um, communication, ed education to gamers to kind of demonstrate what the value of NFTs are, what, what mm -hmm. it actually brings to the game, uh, and how it actually enhances the experience uh, and creates for a, a more, uh, yeah, just like a better experience than, than they would otherwise have. Uh, that'll be important as well to kind of get uh, crypto games mm -hmm. to the mainstream. Thank you. Uh, our time is almost finished, and like I, I know it's like it's hard to answer a short answer. But um, my last question for you, uh, Blaze, uh, NFT technology can uh, give gamers sovereign ownership of their game items. And how do you see this as a mechanism uh, for strengthening the economics uh, within uh, play to earn games? So from, from our side, it was really important to mix the interest of our investors and our players. So that's why we defined Cosmon as an ETF index on the Cosmos ecosystem, just to provide a strong investment performance to our investors. And this DeFi treasury is also fueling the incentive to the players. Then it enables us to have an interesting game to at attract more and more players. And these players, they are providing more and more value to the key asset, which is the native asset of the kitchen. And as we use the key asset, to distribute the yield to the NFT order holders and to the best performing players, then it's create quite a virtuous synergies between the investment aspect and the gaming aspect where everyone is winning of this hybrid complex. So it's, it was quite a, a complex thing to design, but I think it's quite successful. And we just launched the training mode uh, of our game uh, yesterday. And in just one day, we had more than 5,000 uh, fights that have uh, occurred uh, with several hundreds of uh, players engaged in the game. And we are already managing hundreds of thousands of dollars in value in our DeFi treasury. So I think there is really something interesting in this hybrid model between investment and gaming. Thank you. Uh, my last question, all the panelists. Uh, what will be your top recommendation uh, to new startups who want to publish games in like NFT game, NFT space? Like do this or don't start with that? Um, I would go back to something that Carlos said earlier, and that's just like focusing on building a good game. Um, don't worry too much about the economic models and NFTs at first. Just get a concept for a game that you know gamers would be excited about and develop that. And then in a second step, think how you can implement NFTs in a way that it speaks to gamer and it adds value to them. And I think that's how you can create a loyal community of players that love your game. And at that point, it doesn't matter if the incentives aren't there anymore. They will play because they love the game. And so, yeah, if, if your game is not fun, it doesn't matter. Anything else that you do doesn't matter. At some point, you'll crumble. So that's the one thing that you really, really need to get right. And that's like create a game that's fucking fun to play. Yeah, exactly. Um, kind of following off on that, also thinking about whether really considering whether your game needs a blockchain or a crypto component to it. Uh, but because oftentimes, uh, when it's just like a novel way that uh, kind of developers want to leverage to try to monetize, um, and it doesn't make sense for the game, uh, it just doesn't become sustainable. So really thinking about uh, what the tokenomics brings to the game, uh, how it enhances the experience. Um, yeah, I think only kind of a few different kinds of games will actually be 
uh, kind of a good fit for blockchain technology and kind of discovering that from the from the get-go I think will be really important. Yeah. Luis? Okay. Um, I think there's uh, there should be unstoppable action because I think NFTs will be will be the next step. So uh, what they were saying, uh, for example, they're not they're just not be to play to earn NFTs. We can have NFTs for anything. For I want to give an example of me as a gamer. Uh, since I played more Warfare 10 years ago, uh, I, I thought I was one of the best. I, I don't know if you remember how to do nukes. So we compete with our friends. How many nukes did you, ha did, you did? You need to kill like 25 players in a row without dying. It was pretty hard. But there wasn't a way to demonstrate that you did it. Just standing in your school, hey, I did a nuke. So it would be so cool to have this NFT uh, in my account since 10 years ago. Hey, this guy in Marvel for 2, 10 years ago, he was a king. He did 111 nukes, two in one game, blah, 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 blah. All those accolades, missions, like you did this, the, the more hardcore stuff, and it's demonstrable, you know? Mm -hmm. So NFTs can be applied in any part of the game, not just play, play to earn. So go do it and start applying because ideas are not conceived in the first in the first meeting sometimes you pivot sometimes you discover a new partner sometimes somebody uh, take your your technology and you you do something new with that That's correct please nothing to add <laughs> uh, thank you very much everyone uh, for coming to listen to our fantastic panelists i want to thank you also like also, Lucas, uh, Carlos, Luis, and Blaise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you so, so much. much. All right, that wraps it up for our second day of Cosmoverse. Tomorrow, third and final day, there's going to be mad alpha, mad announcements dropped, so do not miss out. Everybody have a good night. Stay safe out there and have fun. <laughs>